The Biographical Introduction to the Poetical Works of Thomas Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Poetical Works of Thomas Hood by Thomas Hood. The Biographical Introduction by William Michael Rossetti, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by M.C. Johnny G. January 24th. 2017 com. There were scarcely any events in the life of Thomas Hood. One condition there was of too potent determining importance, lifelong ill health, and one circumstance of moment, a commercial failure and consequent expatriation. Beyond this, little presents itself for record in the outward facts of this upright and beneficial career. Bright with genius and coruscating with wit, dark with the lengthening and deepening shadow of death. The father of Thomas Hood was engaged in business as a publisher and bookseller in the poultry in the city of London. A member of the firm of Werner Hood and Sharp, he was a Scotchman and had come up to the capital city early in life to make his way. His interest in books was not solely confined to their saleable quality. He reprinted various old works with success, published Bloomfield's poems, and dealt handsomely with him, and was himself the author of two novels, which are stated to have had some success in their day. For the sake of the son rather than the father, one would like to see some account, with adequate specimens, of these long-forgotten tales. For the queries which Thomas Hood asks concerning the piteous woman of his Bridge of Sighs interest us all concerning a man of genius, and interest us moreover with regard to the question of intellectual as well as natural affinity. Who was his father? Who was his mother? Had he a sister? Had he a brother? Another line of work in which the Elder Hood is recorded to have been active was the opening of the English book trade with America. He married a sister of the engraver Mr. Sands and had by her a large family. Two sons and four daughters survived the period of childhood. The elder brother James, who died early of consumption, drew well, as did also one or two of the sisters. It would seem, therefore, when we recall Thomas Hood's aptitudes and frequent miscellaneous practice in the same line, that a certain tendency towards fine art as well as towards literature ran in the family. The consumption which killed James appears to have been inherited from his mother. She and two of her daughters died of the same disease, and a pulmonary affection of a somewhat different kind became, as we shall see, one of the poet's most inveterate persecutors. The death of the father, which was sudden and unexpected, preceded that of the mother, but not of James, and left the survivors in rather straitened circumstances. Thomas, the second of the two sons, was born in the poultry on or about the 23rd of May, 1799. He is stated to have been a retired child with much quiet humor, chuckling, we may guess, over his own quaint imaginings, which must have come in crowds, and of all conceivable or inconceivable sorts, to judge from the products of his after years, keeping most of these fancies and surprises to himself but every now and then letting some of them out, and giving homely or stolid bystanders an inkling of insight into the many peopled crannies of his boyish brain. He received his education at Dr. Wannerstrock's school at Clapham. It is not very clear how far this education extended. I should infer that it was just about enough, and not more than enough, to enable Hood to shift for himself in the career of authorship without serious disadvantage from inadequate early training, and also without much aid thence derived, without, at any rate, any such rousing and refining of the literary sense as would warrant us in attributing to educational influences either the inclination to become an author or the manipulative power over language and style which Hood displayed in his serious poems, not to speak of those of a lighter kind. We seem to see him sliding, as it were, into the profession of letters, simply through capacity and liking in the course of events, not because he had resolutely made up his mind to be an author, nor because his natural faculty had been steadily or studiously cultivated. As to details, it may be remarked that his schooling included some amount, perhaps a fair average amount, of Latin. We find it stated that he had a Latin prize at school, but was not apt at the language in later years. He had, however, one kind of aptitude at it, being addicted to the use of familiar Latin quotations or phrases, cited with humorous verbal perversions. 
In all the relations of family life and the forms of family affection, Hood was simply exemplary. The deaths of his elder brother and of his father left him the principal reliance of his mother, herself destined soon to follow them to the tomb. He was an excellent and devoted son. His affection for one of his sisters, Anne, who also died shortly afterwards, is attested in the beautiful lines named The Deathbed. We watched her breathing through the night. At a later date, the loves of a husband and a father seem to have absorbed by far the greater part of his nature and his thoughts. His letters to friends are steeped and drenched in Jane, Fanny, and Tom Jr. These letters are mostly divided between perpetual family details and perennial jocularity. A succession of witticisms, or at lowest of puns and whimsicalities, mounts up like so many squibs and crackers, fizzling through, sparkling amid, or ultimately extinguished by, the inevitable shower, the steady rush and downpour of the home affections. It may easily be inferred from this account that there are letters which one is inclined to read more thoroughly, and in greater number consecutively, than Hood's. The vocation first selected for Hood, towards the age of 15, was one which he did not follow up for long, that of an engraver. He was apprenticed to his uncle Mr. Sands, and afterwards to one of the Le Creux family. The occupation was ill-suited to his constantly ailing health, and this eventually conduced to his abandoning it. He then went to Scotland to recruit remaining there among his relatives about five years. According to a statement made by himself, he was in a merchant's office within this interval. It is uncertain, however, whether this assertion is to be accepted as genuine or is made for some purpose of fun. His first published writing appeared in the Dundee Advertiser in 1814. His age being then, at the utmost, fifteen and a half, this was succeeded by some contribution to a local magazine. But as yet, he had no idea of authorship as a profession. Towards the middle of the year 1820, Hood was resettled in London, improved in health, and just come of age. At first, he continued practicing as an engraver, but in 1821, he began to act as a sort of sub-editor for the London magazine after the death of the editor, Mr. Scott, in a duel. He concocted fictitious and humorous answers to correspondence, a humble yet appropriate introduction to the insatiable habit and faculty for out-of-the-way verbal jocosity which marked off his after-career from that of all other excellent poets. His first regular contribution to the magazine in July 1821 was a little poem, To Hope. Even before this, as early at any rate as 1815, he was in the frequent practice of writing correctly and at some length in verse, as witnessed by selections, now in print, from what he had composed for the amusement of his relatives. Soon afterwards, a private literary society was the recipient of other verses of the same order. The lines, To Hope, were followed in the London Magazine by the Ode to Dr. Kitchener and some further poems, including the important work, Lycus the Centaur after the publication of which there could not be much doubt of the genuine and uncommon powers of the new writer. The last contribution of Hood to this magazine was The Lines to a Cold Beauty, another early work of his and one which, like the verses to the moon, affords marked evidence of the impression which he had received from Keats' poetry, is the unfinished drama, or, as he termed it, Romance, of Lamia. I do not find its precise date recorded. Its verse is lax and its tone somewhat immature, yet it shows a great deal of sparkling and diversified talent. Hood certainly takes a rather more rational view than Keats did of his subject as a moral invention or a myth having some sort of meaning at its root. A serpent transformed into a woman who beguiles a youth of the highest hopes into amorous languid self-abandonment is clearly not, in morals, the sort of person that ought to be left uncontrolled to her own devices. Keats ostentatiously resents the action of the unimpassioned philosopher Apollonius in revealing the true nature of the woman serpent and dissolving her spell. An elderly pedant to interfere with the pretty whims of a viper when she wears the outer semblance of a fine woman. Intolerable. Such is the sentiment of Keats, but such plainly is not altogether the conviction of Hood, although his story remains but partially developed. By this time, it may have become pretty clear to himself and others that his proper vocation and destined profession was literature. 
Through the London Magazine, he got to know John Hamilton Reynolds, author of The Garden of Florence, and other poems, and a contributor to this serial under the pseudonym of Edward Herbert, Charles Lamb, Alan Cunningham, De Quincey, and other writers of reputation. To Hood, the most directly important of all these acquaintances was Mr. Reynolds, this gentleman having a sister, Jane, to whom Hood was introduced. An attachment ensued and shortly terminated in marriage, the wedding taking place on the 5th of May, 1824. The father of Miss Reynolds was the head writing master at Christ Hospital. She is stated to have had good manners, a cultivated mind, and literary tastes, though a high educational standard is not always traceable in her letters. At any rate, the marriage was a happy one, Mrs. Hood being a tender and attentive wife, unwearied in the cares which her husband's precarious health demanded, and he being, as I have said, a mirror of marital constancy and devotion, distinguishable from a lover rather by his intense delight in all domestic relations and details than by any cooling down in his fondness. It would appear that, in the later years of Hood's life, he was not on entirely good terms with some members of his wife's family, including his old friend, John Hamilton Reynolds. What may have caused this I do not find specified. All that we know of the character of Hood justifies us in thinking that he was little or not all to blame, for he appears throughout a man of just, honorable, and loving nature, and free besides from that sort of self-assertion which invites a collision. Everyone, however, has his blemishes, and we may perhaps discern in Hood a certain over-readiness to think himself imposed upon, and the fellow creatures with whom he had immediately to do a generation of vipers, a state of feeling not characteristic of a mind exalted and magnanimous by habit or gentle in the older and more significant meaning of the term. The time was now come for Hood to venture a volume upon the world. Conjointly with Reynolds, he wrote and published in 1825 his odes and addresses to great people the title page bore no author's name but the extraordinary talent and point of the work could hardly fail to be noticed even apart from its appeal to immediate popularity dealing as it did so continually with the uppermost topics of the day it had what it deserved a great success this volume was followed in eighteen twenty six by the first series of whims and oddities which also met with a good sale the second series appeared in eighteen twenty seven next came two volumes of national tales somewhat after the manner of boccaccio but how far different from his spirit may easily be surmised which are now little known the volume containing the plea of the midsummer fairies hero and leander and some other of hood's most finished and noticeable poems came out in eighteen twenty seven the midsummer fairies itself was one of the author's own favorite works and certainly deserved to be so as far as dainty elegance of motive and of execution is concerned but the conception was a little too ingeniously remote for the public to ratify the author's predilection the hero and leander will be at once recognized as modeled on the style of elizabethan narrative poems indeed marlowe treated the very same subject and his poem left uncompleted was finished by chapman hood's is a most astonishing example of revivalist poetry it is reproductive and spontaneous at the same time it resembles its models closely not servilely significantly not mechanically and has the great merit of resembling them with comparative moderation Elizabethan, here both in spirit and in letter, Hood is nevertheless a little less extreme than his prototypes. Where they loaded, he does not find it needful to overload, which is the ready and almost the inevitable resource of revivalists, all but the fewest. On the contrary, he alleviates a little, but only a little. In 1829 appeared the most famous of all his poems of a narrative character, The Dream of Eugene Aram. It was published in The Gem, an annual which the poet was then editing. Besides this amount of literary activity, Hood continued writing in periodicals, sometimes under the signature of Theodore M. His excessive and immeasurable addiction to rollicking fun, to the perpetual cracking of jokes, for it amounts to that more definitely than to anything else in the domain of the comic muse, is a somewhat curious problem, taken in connection with his remarkable genius and accomplishment as a poet, and his personal character as a solid housekeeping citizen, bent chiefly upon rearing his family in respectability, and paying his way, or, as the church catechism has neatly and unimprovably expressed it, upon doing his duty in that state of life to which it has pleased God to call him. 
his almost constant ill health and, in a minor degree, the troubles which beset him in money matters, make the problem all the more noticeable. The influence of Charles Lamb may have had something to do with it, probably not very much. Perhaps there was something in the literary atmosphere or the national tone of the time which gave comicality a turn of predominance after the subsiding of the great poetic wave which filled the last years of the 18th and the first quarter of the 19th century in our country. In Blake, Burns, Wordsworth, Scott, Coleridge, Landor, Byron, Keats, and, supreme among all, Shelley. Something of the same transition may be noticed in the art of design. The multifarious illustrator in the prior generation is Stothard, in the later, Cruikshank. At any rate, in literature, Lamb, Hood, and then Dickens in his earliest works, the sketches by Boz and Pickwick, are uncommonly characteristic and leading minds and bent with singular inveteracy upon being funny, though not funny and nothing else at all. But we should not force this consideration too far. Hood is a central figure in the group and the period and the tendency of the time may be almost as much due to him as he to the tendency. Mainly, we have to fall back upon his own idiosyncrasy. He was born with a boundlessly whimsical perception, which he trained into an inimitable sleight of hand in the twisting of notions and of words. Circumstances favored his writings for fugitive publications and skimming readers, rather than under conditions of greater permanency, and the result is as we find it in his works. His son expresses the opinion that part of Hood's success in comic writing arose from his early reading of Humphrey Clinker, Tristam Shady, Tom Jones, and other works of that period, and imbuing himself with their style, a remark, however, which applies to his prose rather than his poetical works. Certain it is that the appetite for all kinds of fun, verbal and other, was a part of Hood's nature. We see it in the practical jokes he was continually playing on his good-humored wife, such as altering into grotesque absurdity many of the words contained in her letters to friends. We see it, the mere animal love of jocularity, as it might be termed, in such a small point as is frequently addressing his friend Philip de Frank in letters by the words, Tim, says he, instead of any human appellative. Hood reminds us very much of one of Shakespeare's fools, to use the word in no invidious sense, transported into the 19th century, the fool in King Lear or Touchstone. For the occasional sallies of coarseness or ribaldry, the spirit of the time has substituted a bourgeois good humor which respects the family circle and haunts the kitchen stairs. For the biting jeer intended to make some victim uncomfortable, it gives the sarcastic or sprightly banter, not unconscious of an effort at moral amelioration. For the sententious sagacity and humorous enjoyment of the nature of man, it gives bright thoughts and a humanitarian sympathy. But, on the whole, the intellectual personality is nearly the same, seeking by natural affinity and enjoying to the uttermost whatever tends to lightness of heart and to ridicule, thus dwelling indeed in the region of the commonplace and the gross, but constantly informing it with some suggestion of poetry, some wise side meaning, or some form of sweetness and grace." These observations relate, of course, to Hood's humorous poems. Into his grave and pathetic poems he can import qualities still loftier than these, though even here it is not often that he utterly forswears quaintness and oddity. The risible, the fantastic, was his beacon light, sometimes as delicate as a dell of glowworms, sometimes as uproarious as a bonfire. Sometimes, it must be said, for he had to be perpetually writing whether the inspiration came or not, or his inspiration was too liable to come from the very platitudes and pettiness of everyday life, not much more brilliant than a rush light, and hardly more aromatic than the snuff of a tallow candle. End of Biographical Introduction Part 1 This recording is in the public domain. The Biographical Introduction Part 2 To the Poetical Works of Thomas Hood this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by M.C. Johnny G. The Poetical Works of Thomas Hood by Thomas Hood. The Biographical Introduction by William Michael Rossetti. Part 2. We must now glance again at Hood's domestic affairs. His first child had no mundane existence worth calling such, but has nevertheless lived longer than most human beings in the lines which Lamb wrote for the occasion on an infant dying as soon as born. 
a daughter followed, and in 1830 was born his son, the Tom Hood who became editor of the comic journal Fun and died in 1874. At the time of his birth, the family was living at Winchmore Hill, thence they were moved about 1832 to the lake house, Wanstead, a highly picturesque dwelling, but scanty in domestic comforts. The first of the comic annual series was brought out at Christmas 1830. In the following couple of years, Hood did some theatrical work, writing the libretto for an English opera which, it is believed, was performed at the Surrey Theatre. Its name is now unknown, but it had a good run in its day. A similar fate has befallen an entertainment which he wrote for Matthews. He also composed a pantomime for the Adelphi, and along with Reynolds, dramatized Gil Blass. This play is understood to have been acted at Drury Lane. The novel of Tilney Hall and the poem of the Epping Hunt were written at Wanstead. Born in comfortable mediocrity and early inured to narrow fortunes, Hood had no doubt entered upon the literary calling without expecting or caring to become rich. Hitherto, however, he seems to have prospered progressively and to have had no reason to regret, even in a worldly sense, his choice of a profession. But towards the end of 1834, a disaster overtook him, and thenceforth to the end of his days. He had nothing but tedious struggling and uphill work. To a man of his buoyant temperament and happy in his home, this might have been of no extreme consequence, if only sound health had blessed him. Unfortunately, the very reverse was the case. Sickly hitherto, he was soon to become miserably and hopelessly diseased. He worked on through everything bravely and uncomplainingly, but no doubt with keen throbs of discomfort and not without detriment at times to the quality of his writings. The disaster averted to was the failure of a firm with which Hood was connected, entailing severe loss upon him. With his accustomed probity, he refused to avail himself of any legal immunities and resolved to meet his engagements in full eventually, but it became requisite that he should withdraw from England." He proposed to settle down in some one of the towns on the Rhine, and circumstances fixed his choice on Koblenz. A great storm which overtook him during the passage to Rotterdam told damagingly on his already feeble health. Koblenz, which he reached in March 1835, pleased him at first, though it was not long before he found himself a good deal of an Englishman, and his surroundings vexatiously German. After a while, he came to consider a German Jew and a Jew German nearly convertible terms, and indulged at times in considerable acrimony of comment, such as a reader of cosmopolitan temper is not inclined to approve. He had, however, at least one agreeable acquaintance at Koblenz, Lieutenant Philip de Frank, an officer in the Prussian service of partly English parentage, the good fellowship which he kept up with this amiable gentleman, both in personal intercourse and by letter, was, as we have seen, even boyishly vivacious and exuberant. In the first instance, Hood lived at number 372 Kasterhof, where his family joined him in the spring of 1835. About a year later, they removed to number 752 Alton Graben. Spasms in the chest now began to be a trying and alarming symptom of his ill health, which, towards the end of 1836, took a turn for the worse. He never afterwards rallied very effectually, though the fluctuations were numerous. In November 1838, for instance, he fancied that a radical improvement had suddenly taken place. And at times the danger was imminent. The unfavorable change in question was nearly simultaneous with a visit which he made to Berlin, accompanying Lieutenant de Frank and his regiment on their transfer to Bromberg. The rate of traveling was from 15 to 20 English miles per diem for three days consecutively and then one day of rest. Hood liked the simple and extortionate Saxon folk whom he encountered on the route and contrasted them with the Koblenzers, much to the disadvantage of the latter. By the beginning of December, he was back in his Rhineland home, but finally quitted it towards May 1837. Several attacks of blood spitting occurred in the interval. At one time, Hood proposed for himself the deadly lively epitaph, Here lies one who spat more blood and made more puns than any other man. About this time, he was engaged in riding up the Rhine, performing, as was his wont, the greater part of the work during the night hours. 
The sojourn at Koblenz was succeeded by a sojourn at Ostend, in which city, besides the sea, which Hood always supremely delighted in, he found at first more comfort in the ordinary mode of living, including the general readiness at speaking or understanding English. Gradually, however, the climate, extremely damp and often cold, proved highly unsuitable to him, and when he quitted Ostend in the spring of 1840, at the close of nearly three years' residence there, it was apparent that his stay had already lasted too long. Within this period, the publication of Hood's own had occurred, and put to a severe trial even his unrivaled fertility and jest. One of his letters speaks of the difficulty of being perfectly original in the jocose vein, more especially with reference to the concurrent demands of Hood's own, and of the comic annual of the year. At the beginning of 1839, he paid a visit of about three weeks to his often regretted England, staying with one of his oldest and most intimate friends, Mr. Dilkey, then editor of the Athenaeum. Another of his best friends, one indeed who continued to the end roost unwearied and affectionate in his professional and other attentions, Dr. Elliot, now made a medical examination of Hood's condition. He pronounced the lungs to be organically sound, the chief seat of disease being the liver and the heart, which was placed lower down than usual. At a later stage of the disease, enlargement of the heart is mentioned, along with hemorrhage from the lungs, consequent on that malady, and recurring with terrible frequency. To these dropsy arising from extreme weakness was eventually superadded. Indeed, the catalogue of the illnesses of the unconquerably hilarious Hood and the details of his sufferings are painful to read. They have at least the merit of giving a touch of adventitious but intimate pathos even to some of his wildest extravagances of verbal fence, and of enhancing our sympathy and admiration for the force and beauty of his personal character, which could produce works such as this out of a torture of body and spirit such as that. During this visit to London, Hood scrutinized his publishing and other accounts and found them sufficiently encouraging. The first edition of Up the Rhine, consisting of 1,500 copies, sold off in a fortnight. Soon, however, some vexations with publishers ensued. Hood felt it requisite to take legal proceedings, and the action lingered on throughout and beyond the brief remainder of his life. Thus, his prospects were again blighted, and his means crippled when most they needed to be unembarrassed. The poet was back in England from Ostend in April 1840, and under medical advice, he determined to prolong his visit into a permanent resettlement in his native London. Here, therefore, he remained and returned no more to the continent. He took a house with his family in Camberwell, not far from the Green, removing afterwards to St. John's Wood, and finally to another house in the same district, Devonshire Lodge, Finchley Road. He wrote in the New Monthly magazine, then edited by Theodore Hook, his Rhymes for the Times. The celebrated Miss Kilman's Egg and other compositions first appeared here. Hook, dying in August 1841, Hood was invited to succeed him as editor, and closed with the offer. This gave him an annual salary of £300, besides the separate payments for any articles that he wrote. The Song of the Shirt, which it would be futile to praise or even characterize, came out, anonymously of course, in the Christmas number of Punch for 1843. It ran like wildfire, and rang like a toxin, through the land. Immediately afterwards, in January 1844, Hood's connection with the new monthly closed and he started a publication of his own, Hood's Magazine, which was a considerable success. More than half the first number was the actual handiwork of the editor. Many troubles and cross-purposes, however, beset the new periodical, difficulties with which Hood was ill-fitted by his now rapidly and fatally worsening health to cope. They pestered him when he was most in need of rest, and he was in need of rest when most he was wanted to control the enterprise. The Haunted House and various other excellent poems by Hood were published in this magazine. His last days and final agonies were a little cheered by the granting of a government pension of 100 pounds, dating from June 1844, which, with kindly but ominous foresight, was conferred upon Mrs. Hood as likely to prove the survivor. This was during the ministry of Sir Robert Peel, whose courteous communications to the poet and expressions of direct personal interest in his writings made the boon all the more acceptable. Hood, indeed, had not been directly concerned in soliciting it, 
At a somewhat earlier date, January 1841, the Literary Society had, similarly unasked, voted him a sum of 50 pounds. But this he returned, although his circumstances were such as might have made it by no means unwelcome. From Christmas 1844, he was compelled to take to his bed and was fated never to leave his room again. The ensuing spring, throughout which the poet lay seemingly almost at the last gasp day by day, was a lovely one. At times he was delirious, but mostly quite clear in mind, and full of gentleness and resignation. Dying, dying, were his last words, and shortly before, Lord say, Arise, take up thy cross, and follow me. On the 3rd of May, 1845, he lay dead. Hood's funeral took place in Kensal Green Cemetery. It was a quiet one, but many friends attended. His faithful and loving wife would not be long divided from him. Eighteen months later, she was laid beside him, dying of an illness first contracted from her constant tendance on his sickbed. In the closing period of his life, Hood could hardly bear her being out of his sight, or even right when she was away. Some years afterwards, a public subscription was got up, and a monument erected to mark the grave of the good man and true poet who sang the song of the shirt. The face of Hood is best known by two busts and an oil portrait, which have both been engraved from. It is a sort of face to which apparently a bust does more than justice, yet less than right. The features, being mostly by no means bad ones, look better when thus reduced to the mere simple and abstract contour than they probably showed in reality, for no one supposed Hood to be a fine-looking man. On the other hand, the value of the face must have been in its shifting expression, keen, playful, or subtle, and this can be but barely suggested by the sculptor. The poet's visage was pallid, his figure slight, his voice feeble. He always dressed in black, and is spoken of as presenting a generally clerical aspect. He was remarkably deficient in ear for music, not certainly for the true chime and varied resources of verse. His aptitude for the art of design was probably greater than might be inferred from the many comic woodcut drawings which he has left. These are irresistibly ludicrous. Who would not laugh over the spoiled child? What next? as the frog said when his tail fell off, and a host of others, and all the more ludicrous and effective for being drawn more childishly and less artistically than was within Hood's compass. One may occasionally see some watercolor landscape bit or the like from his hands pleasantly done, and during his final residence in England, he acted upon an idea he had long entertained and produced some little in the way of oil painting. He was also a genius in any sort of light fancy work, such, for instance, as carving the scenery for a child's theater, which formed the delight of his little son and daughter. His religious faith was, according to the writers of the memorials, deep and sincere, though his opposition to sectarian narrowness and spite of all sorts was vigorous and caused him sometimes to be regarded as anti-religious. A letter of his to a tract-giving and piously censorious lady who had troubled him, published in the same book, is absolutely fierce and indeed hardly to be reconciled with the courtesy to a woman as a mere question of sex. It would be convenient, I may observe, to know more plainly what the biographers mean by such expressions as religious faith, Christian gentlemen, and the like. They are not explained, for instance, by adding that Hood honored the Bible too much to make it a task book for his children. Religious faith covers many various serious differences of sentiment and conviction between natural theology and historical Christianity, and on hearing that a man possessed religious faith, one would like to learn which of the two extremes this faith was more nearly conversant with. In respect of political or social opinion, Hood appears to have been rather humane and philanthropic than democratic or liberal in the distinct technical sense. His favorite theory of government, as he said in a letter to Peel, was an angel from heaven and a despotism. He loved neither Whigs nor Tories, but was on the side of a national policy. War was his abhorrence, and so were the wicked corn laws, an oligarchical device which survived him, but not for long. His private generosity, not the less true or hardy for the limits which a precarious and very moderate income necessarily imposed on it, 
was in accordance with the general sentiments of kindness which he was wont to express both in public and private. If he preached, he did not forget to practice. It has been well said that the predominant characteristics of his genius are humorous fancies grafted upon melancholy impressions. Yet the term grafted seems hardly strong enough. Hood appears by natural bent and permanent habit of mind to have seen and sought for ludicrousness under all conditions. It was the first thing that struck him as a matter of intellectual perception or choice. On the other hand, his nature being poetic, his sympathies acute, and the condition of his life morbid, he very frequently wrote in a tone of deep and indeed melancholy feeling, and was a master both of his own art and of the reader's emotion. But, even in work of this sort, the intellectual execration, when it takes precedence of the general feeling, is continually fantastic, grotesque, or positively mirthful. And so again with those of his works, including rude designs along with finished or offhand writing, which are professedly comical, the funny twist of thought is the essential thing, and the most gloomy or horrible subject matter is often selected as the occasion for the horse laugh. In some of his works indeed, we might cite the poems named The Dead Robbery, The Forge, and The Supper Superstition. The horse laugh almost passes into a nightmare laugh. A ghoul might seem to have set it going and laughing hyenas to be chorusing it. A man of such a faculty and such a habit of work could scarcely in all instances keep himself within the bounds of good taste, a term which people are far too ready to introduce into serious discussions for the purpose of casting disparagement upon some work which transcends the ordinary standards of appreciation, but a term nevertheless which has its important meaning in its true place. Hood is too often like a man grinning awry or interlarding serious and beautiful discourse with a nod, a wink, or a leer, neither requisite nor convenient as auxiliaries to his speech. And to do either of these things is to fail in perfect taste. Sometimes, not very often, we are allowed to reach the close of a poem of his without having our attention jogged and called off by a single interpolation of this kind. And then we feel unalloyed, when we constantly feel also, even under the contrary conditions, how exquisite a poetic sense and how choice a cunning of hand were his. On the whole, we can pronounce Hood the finest English poet between the generation of Shelley and the generation of Tennyson. End of the Biographical Introduction, Part 2. This recording is in the public domain. To Hope by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo To Hope Oh, take, young seraph, take thy harp, And play to me so cheerily, For grief is dark and care is sharp, And life wears on so wearily. Oh, take thy harp, Oh, sing as thou wert wont to do, When, all youth sunny season long, I sat and listened to thy song, and yet twas ever, ever new, with magic in its heaven tuned string, the future bliss thy constant theme. Oh, then each little woe took wing, away like phantoms of a dream, as if each sound that fluttered round had floated over Lethe's stream. By all those bright and happy hours we spent in life's sweet eastern bowers, where thou wouldst sit and smile and show, ere buds were come where flowers would blow, and oft anticipate the rise of life's warm sun that scaled the skies. By many a story of love and glory and friendships promised oft to me, by all the faith I lent to thee, oh, take, young seraph, Take thy harp, and play to me so cheerily, For grief is dark, and care is sharp, And life wears on so warily. Oh, take thy harp. Perchance the strings will sound less clear, That long have lain neglected by, In sorrow's misty atmosphere, It near may speak as it hath spoken, Such joyous notes so brisk and high. But are its golden chords all broken? Are there not some, though weak and low, To play a lullaby to woe? But thou canst sing of love no more, For Celia showed the dream was vain, And many a fancied bliss is o'er, That comes not e'en in dreams again. 
Alas, alas, how pleasures pass, And leave thee now no subject save The peace and bliss beyond the grave. Then be thy flight among the skies, Take, then, O oh, take the skylark's wing, And leave dull earth and heavenward rise, O'er all its tearful clouds and sing, On skylark's wing. Another life spring there adorns, Another youth, without the dread, of cruel care, whose crown of thorns is here for manhood's aching head. Oh, there are realms of welcome day, a world where tears are wiped away. Then be thy flight among the skies. Take, then, oh, take the skylark's wing, and leave dull earth and heavenward rise, o'er all its tearful clouds and sing on skylark's wing. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Departure of Summer by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo The Departure of Summer Summer is gone on swallow's wings, And earth has buried all her flowers. No more the lark, the linnet sings, But silence sits in faded bowers. There is a shadow on the plain of winter air he comes again. There is in woods a solemn sound of hollow warnings whispered round, as echo in her deep recess for once had turned a prophetess. Shuddering autumn stops to list and breathes his fear in sudden sighs with clouded face and hazel eyes that quench themselves in hide and mist. Yes, summer's gone like pageant bright, its glorious days of golden light are gone, the mimic suns that quiver, then melt in time's dark flowing river. Gone the sweetly scented breeze that spoke in music to the trees, gone for damp and chilly breath, as if fresh blown o'er marble seas, or newly from the lungs of death. Gone its virgin roses blushes, warm as when aurora rushes, Freshly from the gods' embrace, with all her shame upon her face. Old time hath laid them in the mould, sure he is blind as well as old, whose hand relentless never spares young cheeks so beauty bright as theirs. Gone are the flame eyed lovers now, from where so blushing blessed they tarried, under the hawthorn's blossom bough, gone for day and night are married. All the light of love is fled. Alas, that negro breast should hide The lips that were so rosy red At morning and at eventide. Delightful summer, then adieu, Till thou shalt visit us anew. But who without regretful sigh Can say adieu and see thee fly? Not he that e'er hath felt thy power, His joy expanding like a flower, That cometh after rain and snow, Looks up at heaven and learns to glow. Not he that fled from Babel strife to the green Sabbath land of life, to dodge dull care mid clustered trees and cool his forehead in the breeze, whose spirit weary worn perchance shook from its wings a weight of grief and perched upon an aspen leaf for every breath to make it dance. Farewell, on wings of somber stain that blacken in the last blue skies, thou fliest, but thou wilt come again on the gay wings of butterflies. Spring at thy approach will sprout, who knew Corinthian beauties out, leaf-woven homes where twitter words will grow to songs and eggs to birds, ambitious buds shall swell to flowers and April smiles to sunny hours. Bright day shall be in gentle night, full of soft breath and echo lights, as if the god of sun-time kept his eyes half open while he slept. Roses shall be where roses were, not shadows, but reality, as if they never perished there, but slept in immortality. Nature shall thrill with new delight, and time's relumined river run, warm as young blood and dazzling bright, as if its source were in the sun. But say, hath winter then no charms? Is there no joy, no gladness warms, 
his aged heart no happy wiles to cheat the hoary one to smiles onward he comes the cruel north pours his furious whirlwind forth before him and we breathe the breath of famished bears that howl to death onward he comes from the rocks that blanch o'er solid streams that never flow his tears all ice his locks all snow just crept from some huge avalanche a thing half breathing and half warm as if one spark began to glow within some statue's marble form or pilgrim stiffened in the storm oh will not mirth's light arrows fail to pierce that frozen coat of mail oh will not joy but strive in vain to light up those glazed eyes again no take him in and blaze the oak and pour the wine and warm the ale his side shall shake to many a joke his tongue shall thaw on many a tale his eyes grow bright his heart be gay and even his palsy charmed away what heeds he then the boisterous shout of angry winds that scowl without like shrewish wives at tavern door what heeds he then the wild uproar of billows bursting on the shore in dashing waves and howling breeze there is a music that can charm him when safe and sheltered and at ease he hears the storm that cannot harm him but hark those shouts that sudden din of little hearts that laugh within oh take him where the youngsters play and he will grow as young as they they come they come each blue-eyed sport the twelfth night king and all his court tis mirth fresh crowned with mistletoe music with her merry fiddles joy on light fantastic toe wit with all his jest and riddles singing and dancing as they go and love young love among the rest a welcome nor unbidden guest but still for summer dost thou grieve then read our poets they shall weave a garden of green fancy still where thy wish may rove at will they have kept for after treats the essences of summer sweets and echoes of its songs that wind in endless music through the mind they have stamped invisible traces the thoughts that breathe and words that shine the flights of soul in sunny places to greet in company with thine these shall wing thee on to flowers the past or future that shall seem all the brighter in thy dream for blowing in such desert hours the summer never shines so bright as thought of in a winter's night and the sweetest loveliest rose is in the bud before it blows the dear one of the lover's heart is painted to his longing eyes in charm she ne'er can realize but when she turns again to part dream thou then and bind thy brow with reef of fancy roses now and drink of summer in the cup where the muse hath mixed it up the dance and song and sunburnt mirth with the warm nectar of the earth drink to a glow in every vein and thou shalt dream the winter through then waken to the sun again and find thy summer vision true and a poem this recording is in the public domain the sea of death by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by nemo the sea of death a fragment methought i saw life swiftly treading over endless space and at her footprint but a bygone pace the ocean passed which with increasing wave swallowed her steps like a pursuing grave sad were my thoughts that anchored silently on the dead waters of that passionless sea unstirred by any touch of living breath silence hung over it in drowsy death like a gorged seabird slept with folded wings on crowded carcasses sad passive things that wore the thin gray surface like a veil over the calmness of their features pale and there were spring-faced cherubs that did sleep like water lilies on that motionless deep how beautiful with bright unruffled hair on sleek unfretted brows 
and eyes that were buried in marble tombs a pale eclipse and smile be dimpled cheeks and pleasant lips meekly apart as if the soul intense spake out in dreams of its own innocence and so they lay in loveliness and kept the birth night of their peace that life e'en wept with very envy of their happy fronts for there were neighboring brows scarred by the brunts of strife and souring where care had set his crooked autograph and marred the jet of glassy locks with hollow eyes forlorn and lips that curled in bitterness and scorn wretched as they had breathed of this world's pain and so bequeathed it to the world again through the beholder's heart in heavy sighs so lay they garmented in torpid light under the pall of a transparent night like solemn apparitions lulled sublime to everlasting rest and with them time slept as he sleeps upon the silent face of a dark dial in a sunless place and a poem this recording is in the public domain to an absentee by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway first of december two thousand and sixteen kent over hill and dale and distant sea through all the miles that stretch between my thought must fly to rest on thee and would though worlds should intervene nay thou art now so dear methinks the farther we are forced apart affections firm elastic links but bind the closer round the heart for now we sever each from each i learned what i have lost in thee alas that nothing else could teach how great indeed my love should be Farewell, I did not know thy worth, but thou art gone and now tis prized. So angels walked unknown on earth, but when they flew were recognised. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Like us the Centaur by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Simona Russo. From an unrolled manuscript of Apollonius Curious, The Argument. Lycus, detained by Circe in her magical dominion, is beloved by water nymph, who, desiring to render him immortal, has recourse to the sorceress. Circe gives her an incantation to pronounce, which should turn Lycus into a horse, but the horrible effect of the charm causing her to break off in the midst he becomes a centaur who hath ever been lured and bound by a spell to wander foredoomed in that circle of hell where witchery works with her will like a god works more than the wonders of time at a nod at a word at a touch at a flash of the eye but each form is a cheat and each sound is a lie Things born of a wish, to endure for a thought, or last for long ages, to vanish to naught, or put on new semblance. O oh, Jove, I had given the throne of a kingdom to know if that heaven, and the earth and its streams were for Circe, or whether they keep the world's birthday, and brighten together. For I loved them in terror, and constantly dreaded that the earth where I trod, and the cave where I bedded, the face I might dote on, should leave out the lease of the charm that created and suddenly ceased. And I gave me to slumber, as if from one dream to another each horrid, and drank of the stream, like a first taste of blood, lest as water I quaffed, swift poison, and never should breathe from the drought, such drink as her own monarch husband drained up, when he pledged her, and fate clothed his eyes in the cup. 
and I plucked of the fruit with held breath and fear, that the branch would start back and scream out in my ear, for once at my suppering I plucked in the dust an apple, juice gushing and fragrant of musk, but by daylight my fingers were crisped with gore, and the half-eaten fragment was flesh at a core. And once, only once for the love of its blush, I broke a bloom bough, but there came such a gush on my hand that it faded away in weak fright, while the leaf-hidden woodpecker shrieked at the sight. And oh, such an agony thrilled in that note that my soul, startling up, beat its wings in my throat, as it longed to be free of a body whose hand was doomed to work torments a fury had planned. There I stood without stir, yet how willing to flee, as if rooted and horror turned into a tree. Oh, for innocent death, and to suddenly win it, I drank of the stream, but no poison was in it. I plunged in its waters, but ere I could sink, some invisible fate pulled me back to the brink. I sprang from the rock from its pinnacle height, but fell on the grass with a grasshopper's flight. I ran at my fears, they were fears and no more, for the bear would not mangle my limbs, nor the boar, but moaned all their brutalized flesh could not smoother. The horrible truth, we were kin to each other, they were mournfully gentle, and groped for relief, elf foes in their skin, but all friends in their grief. The leopard was there, baby mild in its feature, and the tiger black barred with the gaze of a creature that knew gentle pity. The bristle-backed boar, his innocent tusks strained with mulberry gore, and the laughing hyena, but laughing no more, and the snake, not with magical orbs to devise strange death, but with woman's attraction of eyes. The tall, ugly ape that still bore a dim shine through his hairy eclipse of a manhood divine. And the elephant stately, with more than its reason, how thoughtful in sadness, but this is no season to reckon them up for the lag-bellied toad, to the mammoth whose sobs shook his ponderous load. There were woes of all shapes, wretched forms, when I came, that hung down their heads with an human-like shame. The elephant hid in the boughs, and the bear shed over his eyes the dark veil of his hair, and the womanly soul, turning sick with disgust, tried to vomit herself from her serpentine crust, while all groaned their groans into one of their lot, as I brought them the image of what they were not. Then rose a wild sound of the human voice choking through vile, brutal organs, low tremulous croaking. Cries swallowed abruptly, deep animal tones attuned to strange passion and full uttered groans, all shuddering weakened till hushed in a pause of tongues in mute motion and wide yawning jaws. And I guessed that those horrors were meant to tell o'er the tale of their woes, but the silence told more than writhed on their tongues, and I knelt on the sod and prayed with my voice to the cloud-stirring God, for the sad congregation of supplicants there that upturned to his heaven brute faces of prayer, and I ceased, and they uttered a moaning so deep that I wept for my heart ease, but they could not weep, and gazed with red eyeballs, all wistfully dry, at the comfort of tears in a stag's human eye. Then I motioned them round, and to soothe their distress, I caressed, and they bent them to meet my caress. Their necks to my arm, and their heads to my palm, and with poor grateful eyes suffered meekly and calm those tokens of kindness, withheld by hard fate, from returns that might chill the warm pity to hate. So they passively bowed, save the serpent that leapt to my breast like a sister and pressingly crept in embrace of my neck, and with close kisses blistered my lips in rash love, then drew backward and glistered her eyes in my face, and loud hissing affright, dropped down, but swift started away from my sight. This sorrow was theirs, but thrice wretched my lot, turned brute in my soul, 
though my body was not when I fled from the sorrow of womanly faces that shrouded their woe in the shade of lone places, and dashed off bright tears till their fingers were wet, and they wiped their lids with long tresses of jet. But I fled, though they stretched out their hands, all entangled with hair and blood stained of the breasts they had mangled. Though they called, and perchance but to ask, had I seen their loves, or to tell the vile wrongs that had been. But I stayed not to hear, lest the story should hold some hell form of words, some enchantment, once told, might translate me in flesh to a brute, and I dreaded to gaze on their charms, lest my faith should be wedded with some pity, and love in that pity perchance, to a thing not all lovely, for once at glance, Methought where one sat, I descried a bright wonder that flowed like a long silver rivulet under the long fanny grass, with so lovely a breast, could it be a snake tail made the charm of the rest? So I roamed in the circle of horrors, and fear walked with me by hills and in valleys and near clustered trees for their gloom, not to shelter from heat, but lest the brute shadow should grow at my feet. And besides that full oft in the sunshine place, dark shadows would gather like clouds on its face, in the horrible likeness of demons that none could see like invisible flames in the sun, but grew to one monster that seized on the light like the dragon that strangles the moon in the night, fierce sphinxes, long serpents, and asps of the south, wild birds of huge beaks and all horrors that drove, Engenders of slime in the land of the past, vile shapes without shape, and foul bats of the west, bringing night on their wings, and the bodies wherein great Brahma imprisons the spirits of sin, many-handed that blend in one phantom of fight like a titan, and threatfully word with the light. I have heard the wild shriek that gave signal to close when they rushed on the shadowy python of foes that met with sharp beaks and wide gaping of jaws, with flappings of wings and fierce grasping of claws, and whirls of long tails. I have seen the quick flutter of fragments disappeared, and next stretched to utter long screamings of pain, the swift motion of blows, and wrestling of arms, to the flight at the close, when the dust of the earth startled upward in rings, and flew on the whirlwind that followed their wings. Thus they fled, not forgotten, but often to grow like fears in my eyes, when I walked to and fro in the shadows, and felt from some beings unseen the warm touch of kisses, but clean or unclean I knew not, nor whether the love I had won was of heaven or hell, till one day in the sun, in its very noon blaze, I could fancy a thing of beauty, but faint as the cloud mirrors fling on the gaze of the shepherd that watches the sky, half seen and half dreamt in the soul of his eye. And when in my musings I gazed on the stream, in motionless trances of thought, there would seem a face like that face looking upward through mine, with his eyes full of love and the dim drowned shine of limbs and fair garments like clouds in that blue serene there i stood for long hours but to view those fond earnest eyes that were ever uplifted towards me and winked as the water we drifted between but the fish knew that presence and plied their long curvy tails and swift darted aside there i gazed for lost time and forgot all the things that once had been wonders, the fishes with wings, and the glimmer of magnified eyes that looked up, from the glooms of the bottom like pearls in a cup, and the huge endless serpent of silvery gleam, slow winding along like a tide in the stream. Some maid of the waters, some naiad, methought, held me dear in the pearl of her eye, and I brought my wish to that fancy, and often I dashed my limbs in the water, and suddenly splashed the cool drops around me, yet clung to the brink, chilled by watery fears, how that beauty might sink with my life in her arms to her garden, and bind me with its long tangled grasses, or cruelly wind me in some eddy to hum out my life in her ear, like a spider caught bee, and in aid of that fear came the tardy remembrance, all falsest of men, why was not that beauty remembered till then, 
my love my safe love whose glad life would have run into mine like a drop that our fate might be one that now even now may be clasped in a dream that form which i gave to some jilt of the stream and gazed with fond eyes that her eyes tried to smoother on a mock of those eyes that i gave to another then i rose from the stream but the eyes of my mind still full of the tempter kept gazing behind on her crystalline face while i painfully leapt to the bank and shook off the cursed waters and wept with my brow in the reeds and the reeds to my ear bowed bent by no wind and in whispers of fear growing small with large secrets foretold me of one that loved me but oh to fly from her and shun her love like a pest though her love was as true to mine as her stream to the heavenly blue for why should i love her with love that would bring all misfortune like hate on so joyous a thing because of her rival even her whose witch face i had slighted and therefore was doomed in that place to roam and had roamed where all horrors grew rank nine days ere i wept with my bro on that bank her name be not named but her spite would not fail to our love like a blight and they told me the tale of scylla and picus in prison to speak his shrill screaming woe through a woodpecker's beak then they ceased and i heard as the voice of my star that told me the truth of my fortunes thus far i had read of my sorrow and lay in the hush of deep meditation when lo a light crush of the reeds and i turned and looked round in the night of new sunshine and saw as i sipped of the light narrow winking the realized nymph of the stream rising up from the wave with the bend and the gleam of a fountain and o'er her white arms she kept throwing bright torrents of hair that went flowing and flowing in folds to her feet and the blue waters rolled down her limbs like a garment in many a fold sun-spangled gold-broidered and fled far behind like an infinite train so she came and reclined in the reeds and i hungered to see her unseal the buds of her eyes that would ope and reveal the blue that was in them they oped and she raised two orbs of pure crystal and timidly gazed with her eyes on my eyes but their colours and shine was of that which they looked on and mostly of mine for she loved me except when she blushed and they sank shame humbled to number the stones on the bank or her play idle fingers while lisping she told me how she put on her veil and in love to behold me would wing through the sun till she fainted away like a mist and then flew to her waters and lay in love patience long hours and sore dazzled eyes in watching for mine against the midsummer skies but now they were healed oh my heart it still dances when i think of the charm of her changeable glances and my image how small when it sank in the deep of her eyes where her soul was alas now they weep and now knoweth where in what stream do her eyes shed invisible tears who beholds where her sighs flow in eddies or sees the ascent of the leaf she has plucked with her tresses who listens her grief like a far fall of waters or hears where her feet grow emphatic among the loose pebbles and beat them together ah surely her flowers float adown to the sea unaccepted and little ones drown for need of her mercy even he whose twin brother will miss him forever and the sorrowful mother imploreth in vain for his body to kiss and cling to all dripping and cold as it is because that soft pity is lost in heart pain we loved how we loved for i thought not again of the woes that were whispered like fears in that place if i gave me to beauty her face was the face far away and her eyes were the eyes that were drowned for my absence her arms were the arms that sought round and clasped me to naught for i gazed and became only true to my falsehood and had but one name for two loves and called ever on eagle 
and sweet maid of the sky-loving waters, and was not afraid of the sight of her skin, for it never could be, her beauty and love were misfortunes to me. Thus our bliss had endured for a time shortened space, like a day made of three, and the smile of her face had been with me for joy, when she told me indeed her love was self-tasked with a work that would need some short hours, for in truth twas the veriest pity our love should not last, and then sang me a ditty of one with warm lips that should love her, and love her when suns were burned dim, and long ages passed over. So she fled with her voice, and I patiently nested my limbs in the reeds, in still quiet, and rested till my thoughts grew extinct, and I sank in a sleep of dreams, but their meaning was hidden too deep to be read what their woe was. But still it was woe that was writ on all faces that swam to and fro in that river of night, and the gaze of their eyes was sad, and the bend of their brows and their cries were seen but I heard not. The warm touch of tears travelled down my cold cheeks, and I shook till my fears awaked me, and lo, I was couched in a bower, the growth of long summers reared up in an hour. Then I said, in the fear of my dream, I will fly from this magic, but could not, because that my eye grew love idle among the rich blooms, and the earth held me down with its coolness of touch, and the mirth of some bird was above me, who even in fear would startle the thrush, and methought there drew near a form as of eagle, but it was not the face hope made, and I knew the witch queen of that place, even Circe the cruel, that came like a death which I feared, and yet fled not for want of my breath. There was thought in her face, and her eyes were not raised from the grass at her foot, but I saw, as I gazed, her spite, and her countenance changed with her mind, as she planned how to thrall me with beauty, and bind my soul to her charms, and her long tresses played from shade into shine, and from shine into shade, like a day in mid-autumn, first fair, oh how fair, with long snaky locks, of the adder black hair that clung round her neck, those dark locks that I prize, for the sake of a maid that once loved me with eyes of that fathomless hue. But they changed as they rolled and brightened and suddenly blazed into gold, that she calmed into flames, and the locks that fell down turned dark as they fell. But I slighted their brown, nor loved, till I saw the light ringlets shed wild, that innocence wears when she is but a child, and her eyes, oh, I ne'er had been wished by their shine, had they been any other, my eagle, than thine. And I gave me to magic, and gazed, till I maddened, in the full of their light. But I saddened, and saddened, the deeper I looked, till I sank on the snow of her bosom, a thing made of terror and woe, and answered this throb with the shudder of fears, and hid my cold eyes from her eyes with my tears, and strained her white arms with the still languid weight of a fainting distress. There she sat like the fate that is nursed unto death, and bent over in shame to hide me from her the true eagle that came, with the words on her lips, the false which had forgiven to make me immortal, for now I was even at the portals of death, who but waited the hush of world sounds in my ears to cry welcome and rush with my soul to the banks of his black flowing river. Oh, would it had flown from my body forever, ere I listened to those words when I felt with a start the life-blood rushed back in one throb to my heart, and saw the pale lips where the rest of that spell had perished in horror, and heard the farewell of that voice that was drowned in the dash of the stream. How fain had I followed and plunged with that scream into death! But my being indignantly lagged, through the brutalized fresh that I painfully dragged behind me. O oh, Circe, O oh, mother of spite! 
speak the last of that curse and imprison me quite in the husk of a brute that no pity may name the man that i was that no kindred may claim the monster i am let me utterly be brute buried and nature's dishonour with me uninscribed but she listened my prayer that was praise to her malice with smiles and advised me to gaze on the river for a love and perchance she would make in pity a maid without eyes for my sake and she left me like scorn then i asked of the wave what monster i was and it trembled and gave the true shape of my grief and i turned with my face from all waters forever and fled through that place till with horror more strong than all magic i passed its bounds and the world was before me at last there i wandered in sorrow and shunned the abodes of men that stooped up in the likeness of gods but i saw from afar the warm shine of the sun on the cities where man was a million not one and i saw the white smoke of their altars ascending that showed where the hearts of many were blending and the wind in my face brought shrill voices that came from the trumpets that gathered whole bands in one fame as a chorus of men and they streamed from the gates like a dusky libation poured out to the fates but at times there were gentler processions of peace that i watched with my soul in my eyes till their seas there were women their men but to me a third sex i saw them all dots yet i loved them as specks and oft to assuage a sad yearning of eyes i stole near the city but stole covert wise like a wild beast of love and perchance to be smitten by some hand that i rather had wept on than bitten oh i once had a hunt near a cot where mother daily sat in the shade with her child and would smother its eyelids in kisses and then in its sleep sang dreams in its ear of its manhood while deep in a thicket of willows i gazed o'er the brooks that murmured between us and kissed them with looks but the willows unbosomed their secret and never i returned to a spot i had startled for ever though i oft longed to know but i could ask of none was the mother still fair and how big was her son for the huntress of fields they all shunned me by flight the men in their horror the women in fright none ever remained save a child once that sported among the wild bluebells and playfully courted the breeze and beside him a speckled snake lay tight strangled because it had hissed him away from the flower at his finger he rose and drew near like a son of immortals one born to no fear but with strength of black locks and with eyes azure bright to grow to large manhood of merciful might he came with his face of bold wonder to feel the hair of my side and to lift up my heel and question my face with wide eyes but when under my lids he saw tears for i wept at his wonder he stroked me and uttered such kindliness then that the once love of women the friendship of men in past sorrow no kindness e'er came like a kiss on my heart in its desolate day such as this and i yearned at his cheeks in my love and down bent and lifted him up in my arms with intent to kiss him but he cruel kindly alas held out to my lips a plucked handful of grass then i dropped him in horror but felt as i fled the stone he indignantly hurled on my head that dissevered my ear but i felt not whose fate was to meet more distress in his love than his hate thus i wandered companioned of grief and forlorn till i wished for that land where my being was born but what was that land with its love where my home was self shut against me for why should i come like an after distress to my grey-bearded father with a blight to the last of his sight let him rather lament me for dead and shed tears in the urn where i was not and still in fond memory turn to his son even such as he left him oh how could i walk with the youth once my fellows but now like gods to my humble estate 
or how bare the steeds once the pride of my eyes and the care of my hands then i turned me self banished and came into thessaly here where i met with the same as myself i have heard how they met by a stream in games and were suddenly changed by a scream that made wretches of many as she rolled her wild eyes against heaven and so vanished the gentle and wise lose their thoughts in deep studies and others their ill in the mirth of mankind where they mingle them still end of poem this recording is in the public domain the two peacocks of bedfont by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by simona russo alas that breathing vanity should go where pride is buried like its very ghost uprisen from the naked bones below in novel flesh clad in the silent boast of gaudy silk that flutters to and fro shedding its chilling superstition most on young and ignorant natures as it wont to haunt the peaceful churchyard of bedfont each sabbath morning at the hour of prayer behold two maidens up the quiet green shining far distant in the summer air that flaunts their dewy robes and breathes between their downy plumes sailing as if they were two far-off ships until they brush between the churchyard's humble walls and watch and wait on either side of the wide-opened gate and there they stand with haughty necks before god's holy house that points towards the skies frowning reluctant duty from the poor and tempting homage from unthoughtful eyes and youth looks lingering from the temple door breathing its wishes in unfruitful sighs with pouting lips forgetful of the grace of health and smiles on the hard conscience face because that wealth which has no bliss beside may wear the happiness of rich attire and those two sisters in their silly pride may change the soul's warm glances for the fire of lifeless diamonds and for health denied with art that blushes at itself inspire their languid cheeks and flourish in a glory that has no life in life nor after story the aged priest goes shaking his gray hair in meekest censuring and turns his eye earthward in grief and heavenward in prayer and sighs and clasps his hands and passes by good-hearted man what sullen soul would wear thy sorrow for a grab and constantly put on thy censure that might win the praise of one so gray in goodness and in days also the solemn clerk partakes the shame of this ungodly shine of human pride and sadly blends his reverence and blame in one grave bow and passes with a stride impatient many a red-hooded dame turns her pained head but not her glance aside from wanton dress and marvels o'er again that heaven hath no wet judgments for the vain i have a lily in the bloom at home quoth one and by the blessed sabbath day i'll pluck my lily in its pride and come and read a lesson upon vain array and when stiff silks are rustling up and some give place i'll shake it in proud eyes and say making my reverence ladies and you please king solomon's not half so fine as these then her meek partner who has nearly run his earthly course nay goody let your text grow in the garden we have only one who knows that these dim eyes may see the next summer will come again and summer sun and lilies too but i were sorely vexed to mar my garden and cut short the blow of the last lily i may leave to grow the last quoth she and though the last it were lo those two wantons 
where they stand so proud with waving plumes and jewels in their hair and painted cheeks like dragons to be bowed and curtsied to last sabbath after prayer i heard the little tomkins ask aloud if they were angels but i made him know god's bright ones better with a bitter blow so speaking they pursue the pebbly walk that leads to the white porch the sunday throng hand-coupled urchins in restrained talk and anxious pedagogue that chastens wrong and posy churchwarden with solemn stock and gold bedizened beetle flames along and gentle peasant clad in buff and green like a meek cowslip in the spring serene and blushing maiden modestly arrayed in spotless white still conscious of the glass and she the lonely widow that hath made a sable covenant with grief alas she veils her tears under the deep deep shade while the poor kindly hearted as they pass bend the unclouded childhood and caress her boy so rosy and so fatherless and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow thus as good christians ought they all draw near the fair white temple to the timely call of pleasant bells that tremble in the ear now the last frock and scarlet hood and shawl fade into dusk in the dim atmosphere of the low porch and heaven has won them all saying those two that turn aside and pass in velvet blossom where all flesh is grass and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow ah me to see their silken manners trailed in purple luxuries with restless gold flaunting the grass where widowhood has wailed in blotted black over the heapy mould painting wave wantonly they never quailed how the warm vanity abused the cold nor saw the solemn faces of the gone sadly uplooking through transparent stone and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow but swept their dwellings with unquiet light shocking the awful presence of the dead where gracious natures would their eyes be night nor wear their being with a lip too red nor move too rudely in the summer bright of sun but put staid sorrow in their tread matting it into steps with inward breath in very pity to bereaved death and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow now in the church time sobered minds resign to solemn prayer and the loud chanted hymn with glowing picturings of joys divine painting the mist light where the roof is dim but youth look upwards to the window shine warming with rose and purple and the swim of gold as if thought tinted by the stains of gorgeous light through many colored panes and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow soiling the virgin snow wherein god hath enrobed his angels and with absent eyes hearing of heaven and its directed path thoughtful of slippers and a glorious skies clouding with satin till the preacher's wrath consumes his pity and he glows and cries with a deep voice that trembles in its might and earnest eyes grow eloquent in light and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow oh that the vacant eye would learn to look on very beauty and the heart embrace true loveliness and from this holy book drink the warm breathing tenderness and grace of love indeed oh that the young soul took its virgin passion from the glorious face of fair religion and addressed its strife to win the riches of eternal life and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow doth the vain heart love glory that is none and the poor excellence of vain attire 
oh go and drown your eyes against the sun the visible ruler of the starry choir till boiling gold in giddy eddies run dazzling the brain with orbs of living fire and the faint soul down darkens into night and dies a burning martyrdom to light and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow oh go and gaze when the low winds of even breathe hymns and nature's many forests nod their gold-crowned heads and the rich blooms of heaven sun ripened give their blushes up to god and mountain rocks and cloudy steeps are riven by founts of fire as smitten by the rod of heavenly moses that your thirsty sense may quench its longings of magnificence and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow yet suns shall perish stars shall fade away day into darkness darkness into death death into silence the warm light of day the blooms of summer the rich glowing breath of even all shall wither and decay like the frail furniture of dreams beneath the touch of morn or bubbles of rich dyes that break and vanish in the aching eyes and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow they hear soul blushing and repentant shed unwholesome thoughts in wholesome tears and pour their sin to earth and with low dropping head receive the solemn blessing and implore its grace then soberly with chastened tread they meekly press towards the ghastly door with humbled eyes that go to graze upon the lowly grass like him of babylon and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow the lowly grass o oh, water constant mind fast ebbing holiness soon fading grace of serious thought as if the gushing wind through the low porch had washed it from the face forever how they lift their eyes to find all vanities pride wins the very place of meekness like a bird and flutters now with idle wings on the curl conscious brow and she the lonely widow and she the lonely widow and lo with eager looks they seek the way of all temptation and the lowly gate to feast on feathers and on vain array and painted cheeks and the rich glistening state of jewel sprinkled locks but where are they the graceless haughty ones that used to wait with lofty necks and nods and stiffened eye none challenge the old homage bending by to feast on feathers and on vain array to feast on feathers and on vain array in vain they look for the ungracious bloom of rich apparel where it glowed before for vanity has faded all to gloom and lofty pride has stiffened to the core for impious life to tremble at its doom set for a warning token evermore whereon as now the giddy and the wise shall gaze with lifted hands and wandering eyes to feast on feathers and on vain array to feast on feathers and on vain array the aged priest goes on each sabbath morn but shakes not sorrow under his grey hair the solemn clerk goes lavendered and shorn nor stoops his back to the ungodly pair and ancient lips that puckered up in scorn go smoothly breathing to the house of prayer and in the garden plot from day to day the lily blooms its long white life away to feast on feathers and on vain array to feast on feathers and on vain array and where two haughty maidens used to be in pride of bloom where plumy death had trod trailing their gorgeous velvets wantonly most unmeet pow over the holy salt there gentle stranger 
thou mayst only see two sombre peacocks age with sapient nod marking the spot still tarries to declare how they once lived and wherefore they are there end of poem this recording is in the public domain hymn to the sun by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by laurie wilson giver of glowing light though but a god of other days the kings and sages of wiser ages still live and gladden in thy genial rays king of the tuneful lyre still poets hymns to thee belong though lips are cold whereon old thy beams all turn to worshipping and song lord of the dreadful bow none triumph now for python's death but thou dost save from hungry grave the life that hangs upon a summer's breath father of rosy day no more thy clouds of incense rise but waking flowers at morning hours give out their sweets to meet thee in the skies god of the delphic fame no more thou listenest to him sublime but they will leave on winds at eve a solemn echo to the end of time end of poem this recording is in the public domain midnight by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by recording person midnight unfathomable night how dost thou sweep over the flooded earth and darkly hide the mighty city under thy full tide making a silent palace for old sleep like his own temple under the hushed deep where all the busy day he doth abide and forth at the late dark outspreadeth wide his dusky wings whence the cold waters sweep how peacefully the living millions lie lulled unto death beneath his poppy spells there is no breath no living stir no cry no tread of foot no song no music call only the sound of melancholy bells, the voice of time, survivor of them all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Sleeping Child by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo To a Sleeping Child, One Oh, Tis a touching thing to make one weep, A tender infant with its curtain die, Breathing as it would neither live nor die, With that unchanging countenance of sleep, As if its silent dream, serene and deep, Had lined its slumber with a still blue sky, So that the passive cheeks unconscious lie, With no more life than roses, Just to keep the blushes warm, in the mild, odorous breath. O oh, blossom boy, so calm is thy repose, so sweet a compromise of life and death. Tis pity those fair buds should e'er unclose, for memory to stain their inward leaf, tinging thy dreams with unacquainted grief. To a Sleeping Child, Two Thine eyelids slept so beauteously, I deemed. No eyes could wake so beautiful as they. Thy rosy cheeks in such still slumbers lay. I loved their peacefulness, nor ever dreamed of dimples, for those parted lips so seemed. I never thought a smile could sweetlier play, nor that so graceful life could chase away thy graceful death till those blue eyes up beamed now slumber lies in dimpled eddies drowned and roses bloom more rosily for joy an odorous silence ripens into sound and fingers move to sound all beauteous boy how thou dost waken into smiles and prove if not more lovely thou art more like love and a poem this recording is in the public domain
To Fancy by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Christina. Most delicate aerial, submissive thing, won by the mind's high magic to its test, invisible embassy or a secret guest, weighing the light air on a lighter wing, whether into the midnight moon to bring illuminate visions to the eye of rest or rich romances from the florid west or to the sea for mystic whispering still by thy charm allegiance to the will the fruitful wishes prosper in the brain as by the fingering of fairy skill moonlight and waters and soft music strain odors and blooms and my miranda smile making the still world an enchanted isle End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fair Innes by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. 4th of December, 2016. Kent. Oh, saw ye not, fair Innes? She's gone into the west. To dazzle when the sun is down, And rob the world of rest. She took our daylight with her, The smiles that we love best, With morning blushes on her cheek, And pearls upon her breast. O oh, turn again, fair Innes, Before the fall of night, For fear the moon should shine alone, And stars unrivalled bright. And blessed will the lover be that walks beneath their light and breathes the love against thy cheek I dare not even write. Would I have been, fair Innes, that gallant cavalier who rode so gaily by thy side and whispered thee so near? Were there no bonny dames at home or no true lovers here? that he should cross the seas to win the dearest of the dear. I saw thee, lovely Innes, descend along the shore, with bands of noble gentlemen and banners waved before, and gentle youth and maidens gay and snowy plumes they wore. It would have been a beauteous dream if it had been no more. Alas, alas, fair Innes, she went away with song, with music waiting on her steps and shoutings of the throng. But some were sad and felt no mirth, but only music's wrong, in sounds that sang farewell, farewell, to her you've loved so long. Farewell, farewell, fair Innes, that vessel never bore, so fair a lady on its deck, nor danced so light before. Alas, for pleasure on the sea and sorrow on the shore. The smile that blests one lover's heart has broken many more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a False Friend by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 1st of December 2016 Kent Our hands have met, but not our hearts. Our hands will never meet again. Friends, if we have ever been, Friends, we cannot now remain. I only know I loved you once, I only know I loved in vain. Our hands have met, but not our hearts. Our hands will never meet again. Then farewell to heart and hand. I would our hands have never met. Even the outward form of love must be resigned with some regret. Friends we still might seem to be. If I my wrong could e'er forget, our hands have joined, but not our hearts. Our would our hands had never met. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Ode, Autumn by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by a recording person Ode, Autumn I saw old autumn in the misty morn Stand shadowless like silence, listening To silence, for no lonely bird would sing Into his hollow ear from woods forlorn Nor lowly hedge nor solitary thorn Shaking his languid locks all dewy bright With tangled gossamer that fell by night Pearling his coronet of golden corn Rather the songs of summer with the sun Opening the dusky eyelids of the south Till shade and silence waken up as one And morning sings with a warm odorous mouth Where are the merry birds? Away, away On panting wings through the inclement skies Lest owls should pray Undazzled at noonday, and tear with horny beak their lustrous eyes. Where are the blooms of summer in the west, blushing their last to the last sunny hours, when the mild eve by sudden night is pressed, like tearful proserpine snatched from her flowers, to a most gloomy breast? Where is the pride of summer, the green prime, the many, many leaves all twinkling, three on the mossed elm, three on the naked lime, trembling? And one upon the old oak tree. Where is the dryad's immortality, Gone into mournful cypress and dark yew, Or wearing the long gloomy winter through, In the smooth holly's green eternity? The squirrel gloats on his accomplished hoard, The ants have brimmed their garners with ripe grain, And honey been save stored, The sweets of summer in their luscious cells. The swallows all have winged across the main, But here the autumn melancholy dwells, And sighs her tearful spells, Amongst the sunless shadows of the plain. Alone, alone, upon a mossy stone, She sits and reckons up the dead and gone, With the last leaves for a low rosary, Whilst all the withered world looks drearily, Like a dim picture of the drowned past, In the hushed minds, mysterious far away, Doubtful what ghostly thing will steal the last, Into that distance grey upon the grey. O go sit with her, and be o'ershaded, Under the languid downfall of her hair, she wears a coronal of flowers faded upon her forehead and a face of care. There is enough of withered everywhere to make her bower and enough of gloom. There is enough of sadness to invite, if only for the rose that died whose doom is beauties, she that with the living bloom of conscious cheeks most beautifies the light. There is enough of sorrowing and quite, enough of bitter fruits the earth doth bear, enough of chilly droppings from her bowl, enough of fear and shadowy despair to frame her cloudy prison for the soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet, Silence, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org, by Christina. There is a silence where hath been no sound, There is a silence where no sound may be, In a cold grave, under the deep, deep sea, or in wide deserts where no life is found, which hath been mute and still must sleep profound. No voice is hushed, no life treads silently, but clouds and cloudy shadows wander free, that never spoke over the idle ground, but in green ruins in the desolate walls of antique palaces where men have been. Though the dumb fox or wild hyena calls, and owls that flee continually between, Shriek to the echo and the low winds moan, There the true silence is, self-conscious and alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama Sonnet, written in Keats's Endymion I saw pale Diane sitting by the brink of silver falls, the overflow of fountains from cloudy steeps, and I grew sad to think Endymion's foot was silent on those mountains, and he but a hushed name that silence keeps in dear remembrance, lonely and forlorn, singing it to herself until she weeps tears that perchance still glisten in the morn, and as I mused in dull imaginings, there came a flash of garments, and I knew the awful muse by her harmonious wings charming the air to music as she flew. Anon there rose an echo through the veil, 
gave back Endymion in a dreamlike tale. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet to an Enthusiast by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org. Young, ardent soul, graced with fair nature's truth, spring warmth of heart and fervency of mind, and still a large late love of all thy kind, spite of the world's cold practice and time's tooth. For all these gifts I know not in fair sooth whether to give thee joy or bid thee blind thine eyes with tears that thou hast not resigned the passionate fire and freshness of thy youth. For as the current of thy life shall flow, gilded by shine of sun or shadow stained, through flowery valley or unwholesome fen, thrice blessed in thy joy or in thy woe, thrice cursed of thy race, thou art ordained to share beyond the lot of common men. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Cold Beauty by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. To a Cold Beauty Lady, wouldst thou erest be to winter's cold and cruel part? When he sets the rivers free, thou dost still lock up thy heart. Thou that shouldest outlast the snow, but in the whiteness of thy brow? Scorn and cold neglect are made for winter gloom and winter wind. But thou wilt wrong the summer air, breathing it to words unkind, breath which only should belong to love, to sunlight, and to song. When the little buds unclose, red and white and pied and blue, and that virgin flower, the rose, opes her heart to hold the dew, will thou lock thy bosom up with no jewel in its cup? Let not cold December sit thus in love's peculiar throne. Brooklets are not prisoned now, but crystal frosts are all agone, and that which hangs upon the spray, it is no snow, but flower of May. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet, Death, by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Christina It is not death that sometime in a sigh This eloquent breath shall take its speechless flight That sometime these bright stars that now reply In sunlight to the sun shall sit in night That warm conscious flesh shall perish quite And all life's ruddy springs forget to flow That thoughts shall seize and the immortal sprite be lapped in alien clay and laid below. It is not death to know this, but to know that pious thought which visits at new graves in tender pilgrimage will cease to go so duly and so oft, and when grass waves over the past away, there may be then no resurrection in the minds of men. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Serenade by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Serenade Ah, sweet, thou little knowest how I wake and passionate watches keep And yet, while I address thee now Methinks thou smilest in thy sleep Tis sweet enough to make me weep That tender thought of love and thee That while the world is hushed so deep Thy souls perhaps awake to me. Sleep on, sleep on, sweet bride of sleep, With golden visions of thy dower, While I this midnight vigil keep, And bless thee in thy silent bower. To me tis sweeter than the power Of sleep and fairy dreams unfurled, That I, at this still hour, In patient love, outwatch the world. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Verses in an Album by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Verses in an Album Far above the hollow, tempest and its moan, Singeth bright Apollo, 
in his golden zone. Cloud doth never shade him, nor a storm invade him on his joyous throne. So when I behold me in an orb is bright, how thy soul doth fold me in its throne of light. Sorrow never paineth, nor a care attaineth to that blessed height. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Forsaken by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 1st of December 2016 Kent The dead are in their silent graves And the dew is cold above And the living weep and sigh Over dust that once was love once I only wept the dead, but now the living cause my pain. How couldst thou steal me from my tears, to leave me to my tears again? My mother rests beneath the sod, her rest is calm and very deep. I wish that she could see our loves, but now I'm gladdened in her sleep. Last night unbound my raven locks, The morning saw them turn to grey. Once they were black and well beloved, But thou art changed and so are they. The useless lock I gave thee once, To gaze upon and think of me, Was tamed with smiles, but this was torn, In sorrow that I send to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. 1st of December 2016. Kent. The stars are with the voyager wherever he may sail. The moon is constant in her time, the sun will never fail. But follow, follow round the world, the green earth and the sea. So love is with the lover's heart, wherever he may be. Wherever he may be, the stars must daily lose their light. The moon will veil her in the shade. The sun will set at night. The sun may set, but constant love will shine when he's away. So that dull night is never night, and day is brighter day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway O lady, leave thy silken thread and flowery tapestry. There's living roses on the bush and blossoms on the tree. Stoop where thou wilt, thy careless hand, some random bud will meet. Thou canst not tread, but thou wilt find the daisy at thy feet. Tis like the birthday of the world, when earth was born in bloom. The light is made of many dyes, the air is all perfume. There's crimson buds and white and blue, the very rainbow showers have turned to blossoms where they fell, and sown the earth with flowers. There's fairy tulips in the east, the garden of the sun. The very streams reflect the hues and blossoms as they run. While morn opes like a crimson rose, still wet with pearly showers, then lady, leave the silken thread, thy twinest into flowers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Birthday Verses by Thomas Hood 
Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway, 2nd of December, 2016, Kent. Good morrow to the golden morning, good morrow to the world's delight. I've come to bless thy life's beginning, since it makes my own so bright. I have brought no roses, sweetest, I could find no flowers, dear. It was when all sweets were over, thou were born to bless the year. But I've brought three jewels, dearest, in thy bonny locks to shine. And if love shows in their glances, they have learned that look of mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Love Thee by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I love thee, I love thee, tis all that I can say. It is my vision in the night, my dreaming in the day, the very echo of my heart, the blessing when I pray. I love thee, I love thee is all that I can say. I love thee, I love thee is ever on my tongue. In all my proudest poesy that chorus still is sung. It is the verdict of my eyes amidst the gay and young. I love thee, I love thee a thousand maids among. I love thee, I love thee. Thy bright hazel glance, the mellow lute upon those lips, whose tender tones entrance. But most dear heart of hearts thy proofs, that still these words enhance i love thee i love thee whatever be thy chance in the poem this recording is in the public domain lines by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by drew conway second of december 2016 Kent Let us make a leap, my dear, in our love of many a year, and date it very far away, on a bright clear summer day, when the heart was like a sun, to itself and falsehood none, and the rosy lips a part of the very loving heart and the shining of the eye, but a sigh to know it by. When my faults were all forgiven, and my life deserved of heaven, dearest, let us reckon so, and love for all that long ago, each absence count a year complete, and keep a birthday when we meet. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. False Poets and True by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org To Wordsworth Look how the lark soars upward and is gone, Turning a spirit as he nears the sky. His voice is heard, but body there is none To fix the vague excursions of the eye. So. Poets' songs are with us, though they die obscured and hid by death's oblivious shroud, and earth inherits the rich melody like raining music from the morning cloud. Yet few there be who pipe so sweet and loud their voices reach us through the lapse of space. The noisy day is deafened by a crowd of undistinguished birds, a twittering race, but only lark and nightingale forlorn fill up the silences of night and morn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Two Swans, a fairy tale by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Simona Russo. Immortal Imogen, crowned queen above the lilies of thy sex, vouchsafe to hear a fairy dream in honor of true love, true above ills and frailty and all fear, 
perchance a shadow of his own career, whose youth was darkly prisoned and long twined by serpent sorrow, till white love drew near and sweetly sank him free, and round his mind a bright horizon threw, wherein no grief may wind. I saw a tower builded on a lake, mocked by its inverse shadow, dark and deep, that seemed a still intenser night to make, wherein the quiet waters sank to sleep, and whatsoe'er was prisoned in that keep, a monstrous snake was warden, Round and round in sable ringlets I beheld him creep, blackest amid black shadows to the ground, whilst his enormous head the topmost turret crowned. From whence he shot fierce light against the stars, making the pale moon paler with affright, and with his ruby eye out threatened Mars, that blazed in the mid heavens hot and bright nor slept nor winked but with a steadfast spite watched there one looks and tremblings in the skies and that he might not slumber in the night the curtain lids were plucked from his large eyes so he might never drowse but watch his secret prize prince or princess in dismal durance spent Victims of old enchantment's love or hate, Their lives must all in painful sighs be spent, Watching the lonely waters soon and late, And clouds that pass and leave them to their fate, Or accompany their grief with heavy tears. Meanwhile, that hope can spy no golden gate For sweet escapement, but in darksome fears They weep and pine away as if immortal ears. No gentle bird with gold upon his wing will perch upon the grate. The gentle bird is safe in leafy dell and will not bring freedom's sweet keynote and commission word learned of a fairy's lip for pity stirred, lest while he trembling sings, untimely guest. Watched by that cruel snake and darkly heard he leave a window on her lonely nest to press in silent grief the darlings of her breast. No gallant knight adventurous in his bark will seek the fruitful perils of the place to rouse with dipping oar the waters dark that bear that serpent image on their face. And love, brave love, though he attempt the base, nerved to his loyal death, he may not win his captive lady from the strict embrace of that foul serpent, clasping her within his sable folds, like Eve enthralled by the old sin. But there is none, no knight in panoply, nor love entrenched in his strong steely coat, no little speck, no sail, no helper nigh, no sign, no whispering, no plash of boat. The distant shores show dimly and remote, made of a deeper mist, serene and grey, and slow and mute the cloudy shadows float over the gloomy wave, and pass away, chased by the silver beams that on their marges play. And bright and silvery the willows sleep over the shady verge, no mad winds tease their hoary heads, but quietly they weep, their sprinkling leaves, half fountains and half trees. Their lilies be, and fairer than all these, a solitary swan her breast of snow launches against a wave that seems to freeze into a chaste reflection, still below twin shadow of herself, wherever she may go. And forth she paddles in the very noon of solemn midnight, like an elfin thing, charmed into being by the argent moon, whose silver light, for love of her fair wing, goes with her in the shade, still worshipping her dainty plumage. All around her grew a radiant circle, like a fairy ring, 
and all behind a tiny little clue of light to guide her back across the waters blue and sure she is no meaner than a fay redeemed from sleepy death for beauty's sake by old ordainment silent as she lay touched by a moonlight wand i saw her wake and cut her leafy slough and so forsake the verdant prison of her lily peers that slept amidst the stars upon the lake and breathing shape restored to human fears and new-born love and grief self-conscious of her tears and now she clasps her wings around her heart and near that lonely isle begins to glide pale as her fears and oft-times with a start turns her impatient head from side to side in universal terrors all too wide to watch and often to that marble keep upturns her pearly eyes as if she spied some foe and crouches in the shadow steep that in the gloomy wave go diving fathoms deep and well she may to spy that fearful thing all down the dusky walls in circlets wound alas for what rare prize with many a ring girding the marble casket round and round his folded tail lost in the gloom profound terribly darkens the rocky base but on the top his monstrous head is crowned with prickly spears and on his doubtful face gleam his unwearied eyes red watchers of the place alas of the hot fires that nightly fall no one will scorch him in those orbs of spite so he may never see beneath the wall that timid little creature all too bright that stretches her fair neck slender and white invoking the pale moon and vainly tries her throbbing throat as if to charm the night with song but hush it perishes in sighs and there will be no dirge that swelling though she dies she droops she sings she leans upon the lake fainting again into a lifeless flower but soon the chilly springs anoint and wake her spirit from its death and with new power she sheds her stifled sorrow in a shower of tender song timed to her falling tears that wins the shady summit of that tower and trembling all the sweeter for its fears fills with imploring moan that cruel monster's ears and lo the scaly beast is all depressed subdued like argus by the might of sound what time apollo his sweet lute addressed to magic converse with the air and bound the many monster eyes all slumber drowned so on the turret top that watchful snake pillows his giant head and lists profound as if his wrathful spite would never wake charmed into sudden sleep for love and beauty's sake his prickly crest lies prone upon his crown and thirsty lip from lip disparted flies to drink that dainty flood of music down his scaly throat is big with pent-up sighs and whilst his hollow ear entranced lies his looks for envy of the charmed sense are fain to listen till his steadfast eyes stung into pain by their own impotence distill enormous tears into the lake immense o oh, tuneful swan o oh, melancholy bird sweet was that midnight miracle of song rich with ripe sorrow needful of no word to tell of pain and love and love's deep wrong hinting a piteous tale perchance how long thy unknown tears were mingled with the lake what time disguised thy leafy maids among and no eye knew what human love and ache dwelt in those dewy leaves and heart so nigh to break 
therefore no poet will ungently touch the water lily on whose eyelids dew trembles like tears but ever hold it such as human pain may wander through and through turning the pale leaf paler in its hue wherein life dwells transfigured not entombed by magic spells alas whoever knew sorrow in all its shapes leafy and plumed or in gross husks of brutes eternally inhumed and now the winged song has scaled the height of that dark dwelling build it for despair and soon a little casement flashing bright widens self-opened into the cool air that music like a bird may enter there and soothe the captive in his stony cage for there is not of grief or painful care but plaintive song may happily engage from sense of its own ill and tenderly assuage and forth into the light small and remote a creature like the fair son of a king draws to the lattice in his jewelled coat against the silver moonlight glistening and leans upon his white hand listening to that sweet music that with tenderer tone salutes him wondering what kindly thing is come to soothe him with so tuneful moan singing beneath the walls as if for him alone and while he listens the mysterious song woven with timid particles of speech twines into passionate words that grieve along the melancholy notes and softly teach the secrets of true love that trembling reach his earnest ear and through the shadows done he missions like replies and each to each their silver voices mingle into one like blended streams that make one music as they run ah love my hope is swooning in my heart a sweet my cage is strong and hung full high alas our lips are held so far apart thy words come faint they have so far to fly if i may only shun that serpent eye ah me that serpent eye doth never sleep then nearer thee love's martyr i will die alas alas that word has made me weep for pity's sake remain safe in thy marble keep my marble keep it is my marble tomb nay sweet but thou hast there thy living breath i to expand in size for this hard doom but i will come to thee and sing beneath and nightly so beguile this serpent wrath nay i will find a path from these despairs ah needs then thou must tread the back of death making his stony ribs thy stony stairs behold his ruby eye how fearfully it glares full sudden are these words the princely youth leaps on the scaly back that slumbers still unconscious of his foot yet not for ruth but numbed to dullness by the fairy skill of that sweet music all more wild and shrill for intense fear that charmed him as he lay meanwhile the lover nerves his desperate will held some short throbs by natural dismay then down the serpent track begins his darksome way now dimly seen now toiling out of sight eclipsed and covered by the envious wall now fair and spangled in the sudden light and clinging with wide arms for fear of fall now dark and sheltered by a kindly pole of dusky shadow from his wakeful foe slowly he winds adown dimly and small watched by the gentle swan that sings below her hope increasing still the larger he doth grow 
but nine times nine the serpent folds embrace the marble walls about which he must tread before his anxious foot may touch the base long in the dreary path and must be sped but love that holds the mastery of dread braces his spirit and with constant toil he wins his way and now with arms outspread impatient plunges from the last long coil so may all gentle love ungentle malice foil the song is hushed the charm is all complete and two fair swans are swimming on the lake but scarce their tender bills have time to meet when fiercely drops adown that cruel snake his steely scales a fearful rustling make like autumn leaves that tremble and foretell the sable storm the plumy lovers quake and feel the troubled waters pant and swell heaved by the giant bulk of their pursuer fell his jaws wide yawning like the gates of death his horrible pursuit his red eyes glare the waters into blood his eager breath grows hot upon their plumes now minstrel fair she drops her ring into the waves and there it widens all around a fairy ring wrought of the silver light the fearful pair swim in the very midst and pant and cling the closer for their fears and tremble wing to wing bending their course over the pale gray lake against the pallid east where in light played in tender flushes still the baffled snakes circle them round continually and bade hoarsely and loud forbidden to invade the sanctuary ring his sable mail rolled darkly through the flood and writhed and made a shining track over the water's pale lashed into boiling foam by his enormous tail and so they sailed into the distance dim into the very distance small and white like snowy blossoms of the spring that swim over the brooklets followed by the spite of that huge serpent that with wild affright worried them on their course and sore annoy till on the grassy marge i saw them light and change anon a gentle girl and boy locked in embrace of sweet unutterable joy then came the morn and with her pearly showers wept on them like a mother in whose eyes tears are no grief and from his rosy bowers the oriental sun began to rise chasing the darksome shadows from the skies wherewith that sable serpent far away fled like a part of night delicious sights from waking blossoms purified the day and little birds were singing sweetly from each spray end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ode on a Distant Prospect of Clapham Academy by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Ah me, those old familiar bounds That classic house, those classic grounds My pensive thought recalls What tender urchins now confine what little captives now repine within yon irksome walls ay that's the very house i know its ugly windows ten a row its chimneys in the rear and there's the iron rod so high that drew the thunder from the sky and turned our table beer there i was birched there i was bred there like a little atom fed from learning's woeful tree the weary tasks i used to con the hopeless leaves i wept upon most fruitless leaves to me the summoned class the awful bow i wonder who is master now 
and wholesome anguish sheds how many ushers now employs how many maids to see the boys have nothing in their heads and mrs s does she abet like pallas in the parlor yet some favored two or three the little crichtons of the hour her muffin medals that devour and swill her prize bohe ay there's the playground there's the lime beneath whose shade in summer's prime so wildly i have read who sits there now and skims the cream of young romance and weaves a dream of love and cottage bread who struts the randall of the walk who models tiny heads in chalk who scoops the light canoe what early genius buds apace where's pointer harris bowers chase hal bayless blythe carew alack they're gone a thousand ways and some are serving in the greys and some have perished young jack harris weds his second wife hal bayless drives the wane of life and blythe carew is hung grave bowers teaches a b c to savages at owyhee poor chase is with the worms all all are gone the olden breed new crops of mushroom boys succeed and push us from our forms lo where they scramble forth and shout and leap and skip and mob about at play where we have played some hop some run some fall some twine their crony arms some in the shine and some are in the shade lo there what mixed conditions run the orphan lad the widow's son and fortune's favored care the wealthy born for whom she hath macadamized the future path the nabob's pampered heir some brightly starred some evil born for honor some and some for scorn for fair or foul renown good bad indifferent none may lack look here's a white and there's a black and there's a creole brown some laugh and sing some mope and weep and wish their frugal sires would keep their only sons at home some tease their future tense and plan the full-grown doings of the man and plant for years to come a foolish wish there's one at hoop and four at fives and five who stoop the marble taw to speed and one that curvets in and out reining his fellow cob about would i were in his steed yet he would gladly halt and drop that boyish harness off to swap with this world's heavy van to toil to tug o oh, little fool while thou canst be a horse at school to wish to be a man perchance thou deemst it were a thing to wear a crown to be a king and sleep on regal down alas thou know'st not kingly cares for happier is thy head that wears that hat without a crown and dost thou think that years acquire new added joys dost think thy sire more happy than his son that manhood's mirth oh go thy ways to drury lane when plays and see how forced our fun thy taws are brave thy tops are rare our tops are spun with coils of care our dumps are no delight the elgin marbles are but tame and tis at best a sorry game to fly the muse's kite 
our hearts are dough our heels are lead our topmost joys fall dull and dead like balls with no rebound and often with a faded eye we look behind and send a sigh towards that merry ground then be contented thou hast got the most of heaven in thy young lot there's sky blue in thy cup thou'lt find thy manhood all too fast soon come soon gone and age at last a sorry breaking up end of poem this recording is in the public domain song by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway second of december two thousand and sixteen kent there is dew for the floweret and honey for the bee and bowers for the wild bird and love for you and me there are tears for the many and pleasures for the few but let the world pass on dear there's love for me and you there is care that will not leave us and pain that will not flee but on our earth unaltered sits love tween you and me our love it never was reckoned yet good it is and true it's half the world to me, dear. It's all the world to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Water Lady by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Alas, the moon should ever beam to show what man should never see. I saw a maiden on a stream, and fair was she. I stayed a while to see her throw her tresses black, that all beset the fair horizon of her brow with clouds of jet. I stayed a little while to view her cheek, that wore in place of red the bloom of water, tender blue, daintily spread i stayed to watch a little space her parted lips if she would sing the waters closed above her face with many a ring and still i stayed a little more alas she never comes again i throw my flowers from the shore and watch in vain i know my life will fade away i know that i must vainly pine for i am made of mortal clay but she's divine in the poem this recording is in the public domain autumn by thomas hood read for librivox by recording person the autumn is old the sere leaves are flying he hath gathered up gold and now he is dying old age begins sighing the vintage is ripe the harvest is heaping but some that have sowed have no riches for reaping. Poor wretch, fall a weeping. The years in the wane, there is nothing adorning. The night has no eve, and the day has no morning. Cold winter gives warning. The rivers run chill, the red sun is sinking, and I am grown old, and life is fast drinking. Here's an hour for sad thinking. End of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Remember, I Remember by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin I remember, I remember The house where I was born The little windows where the sun came peeping in at morn he never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day, but now I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember, the roses red and white, 
the violets and the lily cups, those flowers made of light, the lilacs where the robin built, and where my brother set the laburnum on his birthday, the tree is living yet. I remember, I remember, where I was used to swing, and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirits flew in feathers then, that is so heavy now, and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember, I remember, the fir trees dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now tis little joy to know I'm farther off from heaven than when I was a boy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poet's Portion by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk What is a mine, a treasury, a dower, A magic talisman of mighty power, A poet's wide possession of the earth? He has the enjoyment of a flower's birth Before its budding, ere the first red streaks and winter cannot rob him of their cheeks. Look, if his dawn be not as other men's, Twenty bright flushes, ere another kens The first of sunlight is abroad. He sees its golden lection of the topmost trees, And opes the splendid fissures of the morn. When do his fruits delay? When doth his corn linger for harvesting? Before the leaf is commonly abroad, In his piled sheaf the flagging poppies Lose their ancient flame. No sweet there is, no pleasure I can name, But he will sip it first before the lees. Tis his to taste rich honey, Ere the bees are busy with the brooms. He may forestall June's rosy advent for his coronal, Before the expectant buds upon the bough, Twining his thoughts to bloom upon his brow. Oh, blessed to see the flower in its seed, Before its leafy presence, For indeed leaves are but wings on which the summer flies, and each thing perishable fades and dies, escaped in thought. But his rich thinkings be like overflows of immortality, so that what there is steeped shall perish never, but live and bloom and be a joy forever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to the Moon by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Ode to the Moon 1. Mother of Light, how fairly dost thou go Over those hoary crests, divinely led Art thou that huntress of the silver bow, Fabled of old, or rather dost thou tread Those cloudy summits, thence to gaze below Like the wild chamois from her alpine snow where hunter never climbed, secure from dread, how many antique fancies have I read of that mild presence, and how many wrought, wondrous and bright, upon the silver light, chasing fair figures with the artist thought. 2. What art thou like? Sometimes I see thee ride, a far bound galley on its perilous way, whilst breezy waves toss up their silvery spray. Sometimes behold thee glide, clustered by all thy family of stars, like a lone widow through the welkin wide, whose pallid cheek the midnight sorrow mars. Sometimes I watch thee on from steep to steep, timidly lighted by thy vestal torch, till in some lap main cave I see thee creep, to catch the young Endymion asleep, leaving thy splendour at the jagged porch. 3. Oh! Thou art beautiful, however it be, 
Huntress or Dian, or whatever named, And he, the various pagan that first framed, A silver idol, and ne'er worship thee. It is too late, or thou shouldst have my knee. Too late now for the old Ephesian vows, And not divine the crescent on thy brows. Yet call thee nothing but the mere mild moon Behind those chestnut boughs, Casting their dappled shadows at my feet. I will be grateful for that simple boon, In many a thoughtful verse and anthem sweet, And bless thy dainty face whenever we meet. 4. In nights far gone, a hey, far away and dead, Before care fretted with a lidless eye, I was thy wooer on my little bed, Letting the early hours of rest go by, To see thee flood the heavens with milky light, And feed thy snow-white swans before I slept. For thou wert then purveyor of my dreams, Thou wert the fairies' armourer that kept Their burnished helms and crowns and corslets bright, their spears and glittering mails, and ever thou didst spill in winding streams, sparkles and midnight gleams, for fishes to new gloss their ardent scales. 5. Why sighs, why creeping tears, why clasped hands? Is it to count the boy's expended dower, that fairies since have broke their gifted wands, that young delight, like any o'erblown flower, gave one by one its sweet leaves to the ground? Why then, fair moon, for all thou markest no hour, thou art a sadder dial to old time than ever I have found, on sunny garden plot or moss grown tower, mottled with stern and melancholy rhyme. 6. Why should I grieve for this? Oh, I must yearn, whilst time, conspirator with memory, keeps his cold ashes in an ancient urn, richly embossed with childhood's revelry. With leaves and clustered fruits and flowers etern, eternal to the world, though not to me, ay, there will those brave sports and blossoms be, the deathless wreath and undecayed festoon, when I am hearsed within, less than the pallid primrose to the moon that now she watches through a vapour thin. 7. So let it be, before I live to sigh, though wert an avon and a thousand rills. Beautiful orb, and so, whene'er I lie, Trodden thou wilt be gazing from thy hills. Blessed be thy loving light, wherever it spills, And bless thy fair face, O mother mild. Still shine the soul of rivers as they run, Still lend thy lonely lamp to lovers font, And blend their plighted shadows into one. Still smile at even on the bedded child, And close his eyelids with thy silver wand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Thomas Cloud, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Sonnet written in a volume of Shakespeare. How bravely autumn paints upon the sky the gorgeous flame of summer which is fled, hues of all flowers that in their ashes lie trophied in that fair light whereon they fed tulip and hyacinth and sweet rose red like exhalations from the leafy mould look here how honour glorifies the dead and warms their scutcheons with a glance of gold such is the memory of poets old who on parnassus's hill have bloomed elate now they are laid under their marbles cold and turned to clay whereof they were create but god apollo hath them all unrolled and blazoned on the very clouds of fate end of poem this recording is in the public domain a retrospective review by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by drew conway Oh, when I was a tiny boy, my days and nights were full of joy, my mates were blithe and kind. No wonder that I sometimes sigh, and dash the teardrop from my eye, to cast a look behind. A hoop was an eternal round of pleasure, in those days I found, a top a joyous thing. 
But now those past delights I drop, My head, alas, is all my top, And careful thoughts the string. My marbles, once my bag was stored, Now I must play with Elgin's lord, With Theseus for a tour. My playful horse has slipped his string, Forgotten all his capering, And harnessed to the law. My kite, how fast and far it flew, Whilst I a sort of Franklin drew, My pleasure from the sky. T'was papered o'er oh, with studious themes, The tasks I wrote, my present dreams, Will never soar so high. My joys are wingless, all and dead, My dumps are made of more than lead, My flights soon find a fall. My fears prevail, my fancies droop, Joy never cometh with a hoop, And seldom with a call. My football's laid upon the shelf, I am a shuttlecock myself, The world knocks to and fro, My archery's all unlearned, And grief against myself has turned, My arrows and my bow. No more in noontime sun I bask, My authorship's an endless task, My head's near out of school, My heart is pained with scorn and slight, I have too many foes to fight, And friends grown strangely cool. The very chum that shared my cake Holds out so cold a hand to shake, It makes me shrink and sigh. On this I will not dwell and hang, The changeling would not feel a pang, Though these should meet his eye. No sky so blue or so serene, As then no leaves look half so green, As clothe the playground tree. All things I love are altered so, Nor does it ease my heart to know That change resides in me. Oh, for the garb that marked the boy, The trousers made of corduroy, Well inked with black and red. The crownless hat ne'er deemed an ill, It only let the sunshine still Repose upon my head. Oh, for the ribboned round the neck, The careless dogs is apt to deck, My book and collar both. How can this formal man be styled Merely an Alexandra child, A boy of larger growth? Oh, for that small, small beer anew, And heaven's own type, that milk sky blue, That washed my sweet meals down, The master even, and that small Turk, that fagged me worse, is now my work, a fag for all the town. Oh, for the lessons learned by heart, I, though the very birch is smart, should mark those hours again. I'd kiss the rod and be resigned beneath the stroke and even find some sugar in the cane. The Arabian nights rehearsed in bed the fairy tales in school time read by stealth twixt verb and noun the angel form that always walked in all my dreams and looked and talked exactly like miss brown the omnibeni christmas come the prize of merit won for home merit the prizes then but now i write for days and days Far fame a deal of empty praise Without the silver pen. Then home, sweet home, the crowded coach, The joyous shout, the loud approach, The winding horns like rams. The meeting sweet that made me thrill, The sweet mills almost sweeter still, No satis to the jams. When that I was a tiny boy, My days and nights were full of joy, my mates were blithe and kind. No wonder that I sometimes sigh and dash the teardrop from my eye to cast a look behind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad 
by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. 2nd of December, 2016. Kent. It was not in the winter our loving lot was cast. It was the time of roses. We plucked them as we passed. That churlish season never frowned on early lovers yet. Oh no, the world was newly crowned with flowers when we first met. T'was twilight when I bade you go, but still you held me fast. It was the time of roses. We'd plucked them as we'd passed. What else could peer thy glowing cheek that tears began to stud? And when I asked the like of love, you snatched a damask bud. And oped it to the dainty core, still glowing to the last. It was the time of roses, we plucked them as we passed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Time, Hope and Memory by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. I heard a gentle maiden in the spring Set her sweet sighs to music and thus sing Fly through the world and I will follow thee Only for looks that may turn back on me only for roses that your chance may throw, though withered, twill wear them on my brow, to be a thoughtful fragrance to my brain, worn with such love that they will bloom again. Thy love before thee I must tread behind, kissing thy footprints, though to me unkind, but trust not for all her fondness, Though it seem, let thy true love should rest on a false dream. Her face is smiling and her voice is sweet, but smiles betray and music sings deceit, and words speak false, yet if they welcome prove, I'll be their echo and repeat their love. Only if wakened to sad truth at last, the bitterness to come and sweetness past. When thou art vexed, then turn again and see. Thou hast loved hope, but memory loved thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Flowers by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly I will not have the mad Clyte, whose head is turned by the sun. The tulip is a courtly queen, whom, therefore, I will shun. The cowslip is a country wench, the violet is a nun. But I will woo the dainty rose, the queen of every one. The pea is but a wanton witch, in too much haste to wed and clasps her rings on every hand, the wolfsbane I should dread. Nor will I dreary rosemary that always mourns the dead, but I will woo the dainty rose with her cheeks of tender red. The lily is all in white, like a saint, and so is no mate for me, and the daisy's cheek is tipped with a blush she is of such low degree. Jasmine is sweet and has many loves, and the brooms betrothed to the bee. But I will plight with the dainty rose, for fairest of all is she. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 2nd of December, 2016, Kent She's up and gone, that graceless girl, And robbed my failing years. My blood before was thin and cold, 
but now tis turned to tears. My shadow falls upon my grave, so near the brink I stand. She might have stayed a little yet, and led me by the hand. I call her on the barren moor, and call her on the hill. Tis nothing but the heron's cry, and plover's answer shrill. My child is flown on wilder wings than they have ever spread, and I may even walk a waste that widened when she'd fled. Full many a thankless child has been, but never one like mine. Her meat was served on plates of gold, her drink was rosy wine. But now she'll share a robin's food and sup the common rill before her feet will turn again to meet her father's will. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ruth by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly She stood breast high amid the corn, clasped by the golden light of morn, like the sweetheart of the sun who many a glowing kiss had won. On her cheek an autumn flush deeply ripened, such a blush in the midst of brown was born, like red poppies grown with corn. Round her eyes her tresses fell, which were blackest none could tell, but long lashes veiled a light that had else been all too bright. And her hat, with shady brim, made her tressy forehead dim. Thus she stood amid the stooks, praising God with sweetest looks. Sure, I said, heaven did not mean where I reap thou shouldst but glean. Lay thy sheaf adown and come, share my harvest and my home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Plea of the Midsummer Fairies, one by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. One. Twas in that mellow season of the year when the hot sun singes the yellow leaves till they be gold, and with a broader sphere the moon looks down on Ceres and her sheaves, when more abundantly the spider weaves and the cold wind breathes from a chillier clime that forth i fared on one of those still eves touched with the dewy sadness of the time to think how the bright months had spent their prime two so that whenever i addressed my way i seemed to track the melancholy feet of him that is the father of decay and spoils at once the sour weed and the sweet wherefore regretfully i made retreat to some unwasted regions of my brain charmed with the light of summer and the heat and bade that bounteous season bloom again, and sprout fresh flowers in mine own domain. 3. It was a shady and sequestered scene, like those famed gardens of Boccaccio, planted with his own laurels evergreen, and roses that for endless summer blow, and there were fountain springs to overflow their marble basins, and cool green arcades of tall o'er-arching sycamores to throw athwart the dappled path of their dancing shades with timid conies cropping the green blades. 4. And there were crystal pools peopled with fish, argent and gold, and some of Tyrian skin, some crimson barred, and ever at a wish they rose obsequious till the wave grew thin as glass upon their backs, and then dived in, quenching their ardent scales in watery gloom, whilst others with fresh hues rode forth to win my changeable regard, for so we doom things born of thought to vanish or to bloom. 5. And there were many birds of many dyes, from tree to tree still faring to and fro, and stately peacocks with their splendid eyes, and gorgeous pheasants with their golden glow, like Iris just bedabbled in her bow, besides some vocalists without a name, that oft on fairy errands come and go, with accents magical, and all were tame and peckled at my hand where'er I came. 6. 
and for my sylvan company in lieu of pampinia with her lively peers sat queen titania with her pretty crew all in their liveries quaint with elfin gears for she was gracious to my childish years and made me free of her enchanted round wherefore this dreamy scene she still endears and plants her court upon a verdant mound fenced with umbrageous woods and groves profound seven ah me she cries was ever moonlight seen so clear and tender for our midnight trips go some one forth and with a trump convene my lieges all away the goblin skips a pace or two apart and deftly strips the ruddy skin from a sweet rose's cheek then blows the shuddering leaf between his lips making it utter forth a shrill small shriek like a frayed bird in the grey owlet's beak Eight and lo upon my fixed delighted ken appeared the loyal fays some by degrees crept from the primrose buds that opened then and some from bell-shaped blossoms like the bees some from the dewy meads and rushy lees flew up like chafers when the rustics pass some from the rivers others from tall trees dropped like shed blossoms silent to the grass spirits and elfins small of every class nine perry and pixie and quaint puck the antic brought robin goodfellow that merry swain and stealthy mab queen of old realms romantic came too from distance in her tiny wain fresh dripping from a cloud some bloomy rain then circling the bright moon had washed her car and still bedewed it with a various stain lastly came ariel shooting from a star who bears all fairy embassies afar Ten but oberon that night elsewhere exiled was absent whether some distempered spleen kept him and his fair mate unreconciled or warfare with the gnome whose race had been some time obnoxious kept him from his queen and made her now peruse the starry skies prophetical with such an absent mien howbeit the tears stole often to her eyes and oft the moon was incensed with her sighs eleven which made the elves sport drearily and soon their hushing dancers languished to a stand like midnight leaves when as the zephyrs swoon all on their drooping stems they sink unfanned so into silence drooped the fairy band to see their empress dears so pale and still crowding her softly round on either hand as pale as frosty snowdrops and as chill to whom the sceptred dame reveals her ill Twelve alas quoth she ye know our fairy lives are least upon the fickle faith of men not measured out against fate's mortal knives like human gossamers we perish when we fade and are forgot in worldly kens though poesy has thus prolonged our date thanks be to the sweet bard's auspicious pen that rescued us so long howbeit of late i feel some dark misgivings of our fate Thirteen and this dull day my melancholy sleep hath been so thronged with images of woe that even now i cannot choose but weep to think this was some sad prophetic show of future horror to befall us so of mortal wreck and uttermost distress yea our poor empires fall and overthrow for this was my long vision's dreadful stress and when i waked my trouble was not less Fourteen whenever to the clouds i tried to seek such leaden weight dragged these acarian wings my faithless wand was wavering and weak and slimy toads had trespassed in our rings the birds refused to sing for me all things disowned their old allegiance to our spells the rude bees pricked me with their rebel stings and when i passed the valley lily's bells rang out methought most melancholy knells Fifteen and ever on the faint and flagging air a doleful spirit with a dreary note cried in my fearful ear prepare prepare which soon i knew came from a raven's throat perched on a cypress bough not far remote a cursed bird too crafty to be shot that alway cometh with his soot black coat to make hearts dreary for he is a blot upon the book of life as well ye wot sixteen wherefore some while i bribed him to be mute with bitter acorns stuffing his foul maw which barely i appeased when some fresh brute startled me all a heap and soon i saw the horridest shape that ever raised my awe 
a monstrous giant very huge and tall such as in elder times devoid of law with wicked might grieved the primeval ball and this was sure the deadliest of them all seventeen gaunt was he as a wolf of languedoc with bloody jaws and frost upon his crown so from his barren pole one hoary lock over his wrinkled front fell far adown well nigh to where his frosty brows did frown like jagged icicles at cottage eaves and for his coronal he wore some brown and bristled ears gathered from series sheaves entwined with certain sear and russet leaves eighteen and lo upon a mast reared far aloft he bore a very bright and crescent blade the which he waved so dreadfully and oft in meditative spite that sore dismayed i crept into an acorn cup for shade meanwhile the horrid effigy went by i trow his look was dreadful for it made the trembling birds betake them to the sky for every leaf was lifted by his sigh nineteen and ever as he sighed his foggy breath blurred out the landscape like a flight of smoke thence knew i this was either dreary death or time who leads all creatures to his stroke ah wretched me here even as she spoke the melancholy shape came gliding in and leaned his back against an antique oak folding his wings that were so fine and thin they scarce were seen against the dryad's skin Twenty then what a fear seized all the little rout look how a flock of panicked sheep will stare and huddle close and start and wheel about watching the roaming mongrel here and there so did that sudden apparition scare all closer heap those small affrighted things nor sought they now the safety of the air as if some leaden spell withheld their wings but who can fly that ancientest of kings twenty one whom now the queen with a forestalling tear and previous sigh beginneth to entreat bidding him spare for love her lieges dear alas quoth she is there no nodding wheat ripe for thy crooked weapon and more meat or withered leaves to ravish from the tree or crumbling battlements for thy defeat think but what vaunting monuments there be builded in spite and mockery of thee twenty two o oh, fret away the fabric walls of fame and grind down marble caesars with the dust make tombs inscriptionless raise each high name and waste old armours of renown with rust do all of this and thy revenge is just make such decays the trophies of thy prime and check ambition's overweening lust that dares exterminating war with time but we are guiltless of that lofty crime twenty three frail feeble spirits the children of a dream least on the sufferance of fickle men like motes dependent on the sunny beam living but in the sun's indulgent ken and when that light withdraws withdrawing then so do we flutter in the glance of youth and fervid fancy and so perish when the eye of faith grows aged in sad truth feeling thy sway o time though not thy tooth twenty four where be those old divinities forlorn that dwelt in trees or haunted in a stream alas their memories are dimmed and torn like the remainder tatters of a dream so will it fare with our poor thrones i deem for us the same dark trench oblivion delves that holds the wastes of every human scheme o oh, spare us then and these are pretty elves we soon alas shall perish of ourselves Twenty five now as she ended with a sigh to name those old olympians scattered by the whirl of fortune's giddy wheel and brought to shame methought a scornful and malignant curl showed on the lips of that malicious churl to think what noble havocs he had made so that i feared he all at once would hurl the harmless fairies into endless shade howbeit he stopped a while to whet his blade twenty six pity it was to hear the elfins wail rise up in concert from their mingled dread pity it was to see them all so pale gaze on the grass as for a dying bed but puck was seated on a spider's thread that hung between two branches of a briar and gan to swing and gamble heels o'er head like any southwark tumbler on a wire for him no present grief could long inspire twenty seven 
meanwhile the queen with many piteous drops falling like tiny sparks full fast and free bedews a pathway from her throne and stops before the foot of her arch enemy and with her little arms enfolds his knee that shows more grisly from that fair embrace but she will ne'er depart alas quoth she my painful fingers i will here enlace till i have gained your pity for our race twenty eight what have we ever done to earn this grudge and hate if not too humble for thy hating look o'er our labours and our lives and judge if there be any ills of our creating for we are very kindly creatures dating with nature's charities still sweet and bland oh think this murder worthy of debating herewith she makes a signal with her hand to beckon some one from the fairy band twenty nine anon i saw one of those elfin things clad all in white like any chorister come fluttering forth on his melodious wings that made soft music at each little stir but something louder than a bee's demur before he lights upon a bunch of broom and thus gan he with satin to confer and oh his voice was sweet touched with the gloom of that sad theme that argued of his doom thirty quoth he we make all melodies our care that no false discords may offend the sun music's great master tuning everywhere all pastoral sounds and melodies each one duly to place and season so that none may harshly interfere we rouse at morn the shrill sweet lark and when the day is done hush silent pauses for the bird forlorn that singeth with her breast against a thorn thirty one we gather in loud choirs the twittering race that make a chorus with their single note and tend on new-fledged birds in every place that duly they may get their tunes by rote and oft like echoes answering remote we hide in thickets from the feathered throng and strain in rivalship each throbbing throat singing in shrill responses all day long whilst the glad truant listens to our song thirty two wherefore great king of years as thou dost love the raining music from a morning cloud when vanished larks are carolling above to wake apollo with their pipings loud if ever thou hast heard in leafy shroud the sweet and plaintive sappho of the dell show thy sweet mercy on this little crowd and we will muffle up the sheepfold bell whene'er thou listenest to philomel thirty three then saturn thus sweet is the merry lark that carols in man's ear so clear and strong and youth must love to listen in the dark that tuneful elegy of Tereus's wrong but i have heard that ancient strain too long for sweet is sweet but when a little strange and i grow weary for some newer song for wherefore had i wings unless to range through all things mutable from change to change thirty four but wouldst thou hear the melodies of time listen when sleep and drowsy darkness roll over hushed cities and the midnight chime sounds from their hundred clocks and deep bells toll like a last knell over the dead world's soul saying time shall be final of all things whose late last voice must elegize the whole oh then i clap aloft my brave broad wings and make the wide air tremble while it rings thirty five then next a fair eve fay made meek address saying we be the handmaids of the spring in sign whereof may the quaint broideress hath wrought her samplers on our gauzy wing we tend upon buds birth and blossoming and count the leafy tributes that they owe as so much to the earth so much to fling in showers to the brook so much to go in whirlwinds to the clouds that made them grow thirty six the pastoral cowslips are our little pets and daisy stars whose firmament is green pansies and those veiled nuns meek violets sighing to that warm world from which they screen and golden daffodils plucked for may's queen and lonely harebells quaking on the heath and hyacinth long since a fair youth seen whose tuneful voice turned fragrance in his breath kissed by sad zephyr guilty of his death thirty seven the widowed primrose weeping to the moon and saffron crocus in whose chalice bright a cool libation hoarded for the noon is kept and she that purifies the light the virgin lily faithful to her white whereon eve wept in eden for her shame and the most dainty rose aurora's sprite our every godchild by whatever name spares us our lives 
for we did nurse the same. 38. Then that old mower stamped his heel, and struck his hurtful scythe against the harmless ground, saying, Ye foolish imps, when am I stuck with gaudy buds, or like a wooer crowned with flowery chaplets, save when they are found withered? Whenever have I plucked a rose, except to scatter its vain leaves around? For so all gloss of beauty I oppose, and bring decay on every flower that blows. 39. Or when I am so wroth as when I view the wanton pride of summer, how she decks the birthday world with blossoms ever new, as if time had not lived, and heaped great wrecks of years on years. Oh, then I bravely vex, and catch the gay months in their gaudy plight, and slay them with the wreaths about their necks, like foolish heifers in the holy rite, and raise great trophies to my ancient might. 40. Then saith another, We are kindly things, and like her offspring nestle with the dove, witness these hearts embroidered on our wings to show our constant patronage of love we sit at even in sweet bowers above lovers and shake rich odours on the air to mingle with their sighs and still remove the startling owl and bid the bat forbear their privacy and haunt some other where forty one and we are near the mother when she sits beside her infant in its wicker bed and we are in the fairy scene that flits across its tender brain sweet dreams we shed and whilst the tender little soul is fled away to sport with our young elves the while we touch the dimpled cheek with roses red and tickle the soft lips until they smile so that their careful parents they beguile forty two o oh, then if ever thou hast breathed a vow at love's dear portal or at pale moonrise crushed the dear curl on a regardful brow that did not frown thee from thy honey prize if ever thy sweet son sat on thy thighs and wooed thee from thy careful thoughts within to watch the harmless beauty of his eyes or glad thy fingers on his smooth soft skin for love's dear sake let us thy pity win End of the plea of the Midsummer Fairies, one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Plea of the Midsummer Fairies, two, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Forty-three. Then Saturn fiercely thus: What joy have I in tender babes that have devoured mine own? whenever to the light I heard them cry, till foolish Rhea cheated me with stone. Whereon, till now, is my great hunger shown in monstrous dint of my enormous tooth. And, but the peopled world is too full grown for hunger's edge, I would consume all youth at one great meal without delay or ruth. 44. For I am well nigh crazed and wild to hear how boastful fathers taunt me with their breed, saying, We shall not die nor disappear, but in these other selves ourselves succeed, even as ripe flowers pass into their seed, only to be renewed from prime to prime. All of which boastings I am forced to read, besides a thousand challenges to time, which bragging lovers have compiled in rhyme. 45 wherefore when they are sweetly meta nights there will i steal and with my hurried hand startle them suddenly from their delights before the next encounter hath been planned ravishing hours in little minutes spanned but when they say farewell and grieve apart then like a leaden statue i will stand meanwhile their many tears encrust my dart and with a ragged edge cut heart from heart forty six then next a merry woodsman, clad in green, step vanward from his mates, that idly stood each at his proper ease, as they had been nursed in the liberty of old Sherwood, and wore the livery of Robin Hood, who wont in forest shades to dine and sup. So came this chief right frankly, and made good his haunch against his axe, and thus spoke up, doffing his cap, which was an acorn's cup. 47 we be small foresters and gay who tend on trees and all their furniture of green training the young boughs airily to bend and show blue snatches of the sky between 
or knit more close intricacies to screen birds crafty dwellings as may hide them best but most the timid blackbirds she that seen will bear black poisonous berries to her nest lest man should cage the darlings of her breast forty eight we bend each tree in proper attitude and founting willows train in silvery falls we frame all shady roofs and arches rude and verdant aisles leading to dryads halls or deep recesses where the echo calls we shape all plumy trees against the sky and carve tall elms corinthian capitals when sometimes as our tiny hatchets ply men say the tapping woodpecker is nigh forty nine sometimes we scoop the squirrel's hollow cell and sometimes carve quaint letters on trees rind that haply some lone musing wight may spell dainty aminta gentle rosalind or chastest laura sweetly called to mind in sylvan solitudes ere he lies down and sometimes we enrich grey stems with twined and vagrant ivy or rich moss whose brown burns into gold as the warm sun goes down fifty and lastly for mirth's sake and christmas cheer we bear the seedling berries for increase to graft the druid oaks from year to year careful that mistletoe may never cease wherefore if thou dost prize the shady peace of sombre forests or to see light break through sylvan cloisters and in spring release thy spirit amongst leaves from careful ache spare us our lives for the green dryad's sake Fifty one then saturn with a frown go forth and fell oak for your coffins and thenceforth lay by your axes for the rust and bid farewell to all sweet birds and the blue peeps of sky through tangled branches for ye shall not spy the next green generation of the tree but hence with the dead leaves whene'er they fly which in the bleak air i would rather see than flights of the most tuneful birds that be fifty two for i dislike all prime and verdant pets ivy except that on the aged wall preys with its worm-like roots and daily frets the crumbled tower it seems to league withal king-like worn down by its own coronal neither in forest haunts love i to wan before the golden plumage gins to fall and leaves the brown bleak limbs with few leaves on or bare like nature in her skeleton Fifty three for then sit i amongst the crooked boughs wooing dull memory with kindred sighs and there in rustling nuptials we espouse smit by the sadness in each other's eyes but hope must have green bowers and blue skies and must be courted with the gauds of spring whilst youth leans godlike on her lap and cries what shall we always do but love and sing and time is reckoned a discarded thing fifty four here in my dream it made me fret to see how puck the antic all this dreary while had blithely jested with calamity with mistimed mirth mocking the doleful style of his sad comrades till it raised my bile to see him so reflect their grief aside turning their solemn looks to have a smile like a straight stick shown crooked in the tide but soon a novel advocate i spied fifty five quoth he we teach all natures to fulfil their four appointed crafts and instincts meet the bee's sweet alchemy the spider's skill the pismire's care to garner up his wheat and rustic masonry to swallows fleet the lapwing's cunning to preserve her nest but most that lesser pelican the sweet and shrilly ruddock with its bleeding breast in tender pity of poor babes distressed fifty six sometimes we cast our shapes and in sleek skins delve with the timid mole that aptly delves from our example so the spider spins and eke the silkworm patterned by ourselves sometimes we travel on the summer shelves of early bees and busy toils commence watched of wise men that know not we are elves but gaze and marvel at our stretch of sense and praise our human-like intelligence fifty seven wherefore by thy delight in that old tale and plaintive dirges the late robins sing what time the leaves are scattered by the gale mindful of that old forest burying 
as thou dost love to watch each tiny thing for whom our craft most curiously contrives if thou hast caught a bee upon the wing to take his honey bag spare us our lives and we will pay the ransom in full hives fifty eight now by my glass quoth time ye do offend in teaching the brown bees that careful law and frugal ants whose millions would have end but they lay up for need a timely store and travel with the seasons evermore whereas great mammoth long hath passed away and none but i can tell what hide he wore whilst purblind men the creatures of a day in riddling wonder his great bones survey fifty nine then came an elf right beauteous to behold whose coat was like a brooklet that the sun hath all embroidered with its crooked gold it was so quaintly wrought and overrun with spangled traceries most meet for one that was a warden of the pearly streams and as he stepped out of the shadows dun his jewels sparkled in the pale moon's gleams and shot into the air their pointed beams sixty quoth he we bear the gold and silver keys of bubbling springs and fountains that below course through the veiny earth which when they freeze into hard chrysolites we bid to flow creeping like subtle snakes when as they go we guide their windings to melodious falls at whose soft murmurings so sweet and low poets have tuned their smoothest madrigals to sing to ladies in their banquet halls sixty one and when the hot sun with his steadfast heat parches the river god whose dusty urn drips miserly till soon his crystal feet against his pebbly floor wax faint and burn and languid fish unpoised grow sick and yearn then scoop we hollows in some sandy nook and little channels dig wherein we turn the thread-worn rivulet that all forsook the naiad lily pining for her brook sixty two wherefore by thy delight in cool green meads with living sapphires daintily inlaid in all soft songs of waters and their reeds and all reflections in a streamlet made haply of thine own love that disarrayed kills the fair lily with a livelier white by silver trouts upspringing from green shade and winking stars reduplicate at night spare us poor ministers to such delight sixty three howbeit his pleading and his gentle looks moved not the spiteful shade quoth he your taste shoots wide of mine for i despise the brooks and slavish rivulets that run to waste in noontide sweats or like poor vassals haste to swell the vast dominion of the sea in whose great presence i am held disgraced and neighboured with a king that rivals me in ancient might and hoary majesty fifty four whereas i ruled in chaos and still keep the awful secrets of that ancient dearth before the briny fountains of the deep brimmed up the hollow cavities of earth i saw each trickling sea-god at his birth each pearly naiad with her oozy locks and infant titans of enormous girth whose huge young feet yet stumbled on the rocks stunning the early world with frequent shocks sixty five where now is titan with his cumbrous brood that scared the world by this sharp scythe they fell and half the sky was curdled with their blood so have all primal giants sighed farewell no wardens now by sedgy fountains dwell nor pearly naiads all their days are done that strove with time untimely to excel wherefore i raised their progenies and none but my great shadow intercepts the sun sixty six then saith the timid fay o mighty time well hast thou wrought the cruel titans fall for they were stained with many a bloody crime great giants work great wrongs but we are small for love goes lowly but oppression's tall and with surpassing strides goes foremost still where love indeed can hardly reach at all like a poor dwarf or burdened with good will that labours to efface the tracks of ill sixty seven man even strives with man but we eschew the guilty feud and all fierce strifes of awe nay we are gentle as the sweet heavens dew beside the red and horrid drops of war weeping the cruel hates men battle for which worldly bosoms nourish in our spite for in the gentle breast we ne'er withdraw but only when all love hath taken flight and youth's warm gracious heart is hardened quite sixty eight 
so are our gentle natures intertwined with sweet humanities and closely knit in kindly sympathy with humankind witness how we befriend with elfin wit all hopeless maids and lovers nor omit magical suckers unto hearts forlorn we charm man's life and do not perish it so judge us by the helps we showed this morn to one who held his wretched days in scorn sixty nine twas nigh sweet amwell for the queen had tasked our skill to-day amidst the silver lee where on the noontide sun had not yet basked wherefore some patient man we thought to see planted in moss-grown rushes to the knee beside the cloudy margin cold and dim howbeit no patient fisherman was he that cast his sudden shadow from the brim making us leave our toils to gaze on him seventy his face was ashy pale and leaden care had sunk the levelled arches of his brow once bridges for his joyous thoughts to fare over those melancholy springs and slow that from his piteous eyes began to flow and fell anon into the chilly stream which as his mimicked image showed below wrinkled his face with many a needless seam making grief sadder in its own esteem seventy one and lo upon the air we saw him stretch his passionate arms and in a wayward strain he gan to elegize that fellow wretch that with mute gestures answered him again saying poor slave how long wilt thou remain life's sad weak captive in a prison strong hoping with tears to rust away thy chain in bitter servitude to worldly wrong thou wearest that mortal livery too long seventy two this with more spleenful speeches and some tears when he had spent upon the imaged wave speedily i convened my elfin peers under the lily cups that we might save this woeful mortal from a wilful grave by shrewd diversions of his mind's regret seeing he was mere melancholy's slave that sank wherever a dark cloud he met and straight was tangled in her secret net seventy three therefore as still he watched the waters flow daintily we transformed and with bright fins came glancing through the gloom some from below rose like dim fancies when a dream begins snatching the light upon their purple skins then under the broad leaves made slow retire one like a golden galley bravely wins its radiant course another glows like fire making that wayward man our pranks admire seventy four and so he banished thought and quite forgot all contemplation of that wretched face and so we wiled him from that lonely spot along the river's brink till by heaven's grace he met a gentle haunter of the place full of sweet wisdom gathered from the brooks who there discussed his melancholy case with wholesome texts learned from kind nature's books meanwhile he newly trimmed his lines and hooks seventy five herewith the fairy ceased quoth ariel now let me remember how i saved a man whose fatal noose was fastened on a bough intended to abridge his sad life's span for haply i was by when he began his stern soliloquy in life dispraise and overheard his melancholy plan how he had made a vow to end his days and therefore followed him in all his ways seventy six through brake and tangled copse for much he loathed all populous haunts and roamed in forests rude to hide himself from man but i had clothed my delicate limbs with plumes and still pursued where only foxes and wild cats intrude till we were come beside an ancient tree late blasted by a storm here he renewed his loud complaints choosing that spot to be the scene of his last horrid tragedy seventy seven it was a wild and melancholy glen made gloomy by tall firs and cypress dark whose roots like any bones of buried men pushed through the rotten sod for fear's remark a hundred horrid stems jagged and stark wrestled with crooked arms in hideous fray besides sleek ashes with their dappled bark like crafty serpents climbing for a prey with many blasted oaks moss-grown and grey Seventy-eight but here upon his final desperate claws suddenly i pronounced so sweet a strain like a panged nightingale it made him pause till half the frenzy of his grief was slain the sad remainder oozing from his brain in timely ecstasies of healing tears which through his ardent eyes began to drain meanwhile the deadly fates unclosed their shears so pity me and all my fated peers seventy nine 
thus ariel ended and was some time hushed when with the hoary shape a fresh tongue pleads and red as rose the gentle fairy blushed to read the records of her own good deeds it chanced quoth she in seeking through the meads for honeyed cowslips sweetest in the morn whilst yet the buds were hung with dewy beads and echo answered to the huntsman's horn we found a babe left in the swathes forlorn eighty a little sorrowful deserted thing begot of love and yet no love begetting guiltless of shame and yet for shame to ring and too soon banished from a mother's petting to churlish nurture and the wide world's fretting for alien pity and unnatural care alas to see how the cold dew kept wetting his childish coats and dabbled all his hair like gossamers across his forehead fair eighty one his pretty pouting mouth witless of speech lay halfway open like a rose-lipped shell and his young cheek was softer than a peach whereon his tears for roundness could not dwell but quickly rolled themselves to pearls and fell some on the grass and some against his hand or haply wandered to the dimpled well which love beside his mouth had sweetly planned yet not for tears but mirth and smilings bland eighty two pity it was to see those frequent tears falling regardless from his friendless eyes there was such beauty in those twin blue spheres as any mother's heart might leap to prize blue were they like the zenith of the skies softened betwixt two clouds both clear and mild just touched with thought and yet not over wise they showed the gentle spirit of a child not yet by care or any craft defiled eighty three pity it was to see the ardent sun scorching his helpless limbs it shone so warm for kindly shade or shelter he had none nor mother's gentle breast come fair or storm meanwhile i bade my pitying mates transform like grasshoppers and then with shrilly cries all round the infant noisily we swarm haply some passing rustic to advise whilst providential heaven our care espies eighty four and sends full soon a tender-hearted hind who wondering at our loud unusual note strays curiously aside and so doth find the orphan child laid in the grass remote and laps the foundling in his russet coat who thence was nurtured in his kindly cot but how he prospered let proud london quote how wise how rich and how renowned he got and chief of all her citizens i wot end of section forty six The Plea of the Midsummer Fairies, three by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Eighty-five. Witness his goodly vessels on the Thames, whose holds were fraught with costly merchandise, jewels from Ind and pearls for courtly dames, and gorgeous silks that Samarkand supplies. Witness that royal bourse he bade arise, the mart of merchants from the east and west, whose slender summit, pointing to the skies, still bears in token of his grateful breast the tender grasshopper, his chosen crest. 86. The tender grasshopper, his chosen crest, that all the summer, with a tuneful wing, makes merry chirpings in its grassy nest, inspirited with dew to leap and sing. So let us also live, eternal king partakers of the green and pleasant earth pity it is to slay the meanest thing that like a moat shines in the smile of mirth enough there is of joy's decrease and dearth eighty seven enough of pleasure and delight and beauty perished and gone and hasting to decay enough to sadden even thee whose duty or spite it is to havoc and to slay too many a lovely race raised quite away hath left large gaps in life and human loving here then begin thy cruel war to stay and spare fresh sighs and tears and groans reproving thy desolating hand for our removing eighty eight now here i heard a shrill and sudden cry and looking up i saw the antique puck grappling with time who clutched him like a fly victim of his own sport the jester's luck he whilst his fellows grieved poor white had stuck his freakish gourds upon the ancient's brow and now his ear and now his beard would pluck whereas the angry churl had snatched him now crying thou impish mischief who art thou eighty nine 
alas quoth puck a little random elf born in the sport of nature like a weed for simple sweet enjoyment of myself but for no other purpose worth or need and yet withal of a most happy breed and there is robin goodfellow besides my partner dear in many a prankish deed to make dame laughter hold her jolly sides like merry mummers twain on holy tides ninety tis we that bob the angler's idle cork till e'en the patient man breathes half a curse we steal the morsel from the gossip's fork and curdling looks with secret straws disperse or stop the sneezing chanter at mid-verse and when an infant's beauty prospers ill we change some mothers say the child at nurse but any graver purpose to fulfil we have not wit enough and scarce the will ninety one we never let the canker melancholy to gather on our faces like a rust but glass our features with some change of folly taking life's fabled miseries on trust but only sorrowing when sorrow must we ruminate no sage's solemn cud but own ourselves a pinch of lively dust to frisk upon a wind whereas the flood of tears would turn us into heavy mud ninety two beshrew those sad interpreters of nature who glows her lively universal law as if she had not formed our cheerful feature to be so tickled with the slightest straw so let them vex their mumbling mouths and draw the corners downward like a watery moon and deal in gusty sighs and rainy floor we will not woo foul weather all too soon or nurse november on the lap of june ninety three for ours are winging sprites like any bird that shun all stagnant settlements of grief and even in our rest our hearts are stirred like insects settled on a dancing leaf this is our small philosophy in brief which thus to teach hath set me all agape but dost thou relish it o hoary chief unclasp thy crooked fingers from my nape and i will show thee many a pleasant scrape ninety four then saturn thus shaking his crooked blade o'erhead which made aloft a lightning flash in all the fairies eyes dismally frayed his ensuing voice came like the thunder crash meanwhile the bolt shatters some pine or ash thou feeble wanton foolish fickle thing whom nought can frighten sadden or abash to hope my solemn countenance to ring to idiot smiles but i will prune thy wing ninety five lo this most awful handle of my scythe stood once a maypole with a flowery crown which rustics danced around and maidens blithe to wanton pipings but i plucked it down and robed the may queen in a churchyard gown turning her buds to rosemary and rue and all their merry minstrelsy did drown and laid each lusty leaper in the dew so thou shalt fare and every jovial crew ninety six here he lets go the struggling imp to clutch his mortal engine with each grisly hand which frights the elfin progeny so much they huddle in a heap and trembling stand all round titania like the queen bee's band with sighs and tears and very shrieks of woe meanwhile some moving argument i planned to make the stern shade merciful when lo he drops his fatal scythe without a blow ninety seven for just at need a timely apparition steps in between to bear the awful brunt making him change his horrible position to marvel at this comer brave and blunt that dares time's irresistible affront whose strokes have scarred even the gods of old whereas this seemed a mortal at mere hunt for conies lighted by the moonshine cold or stalker of stray deer stealthy and bold ninety eight who turning to the small assembled phase doffs to the lily queen his courteous cap and holds her beauty for a while in gaze with bright eyes kindling at this pleasant hap and thence upon the fair moon's silver map as if in question of this magic chance laid like a dream upon the green earth's lap and then upon old saturn turns askance exclaiming with a glad and kindly glance ninety nine oh these be fancy's revellers by night stealthy companions of the downy moth diana's motes that flit in her pale light shunners of sunbeams in diurnal sloth these be the feasters on night's silver cloth the gnat with shrilly trump is their convener forth from their flowery chambers nothing loath 
with lulling tunes to charm the air serener or dance upon the grass to make it greener one hundred these be the pretty genii of the flowers daintily fed with honey and pure dew midsummer's phantoms in her dreaming hours king oberon and all his merry crew the darling puppets of romance's view fairies and sprites and goblin elves we call them famous for patronage of lovers true no harm they act neither shall harm befall them so do not thus with crabbed frowns appall them one hundred and one oh what a cry was saturn's then it made the fairies crake what care i for their pranks however they may lovers choose to aid or dance their roundelays on flowery banks long must they dance before they earn my thanks so step aside to some far safer spot whilst with my hungry scythe i mow their ranks and leave them in the sun like weeds to rot and with the next day's sun to be forgot one hundred and two anon he raised afresh his weapon keen but still the gracious shade disarmed his aim stepping with brave alacrity between and made his sore arm powerless and tame his be perpetual glory for the shame of hoary saturn in that grand defeat but i must tell how here titania came with all her kneeling lieges to entreat his kindly succour in sad tones but sweet one hundred and three saying thou seest a wretched queen before thee the fading power of a failing land who for a kingdom kneeleth to implore thee now menaced by this tyrant's spoiling hand no one but thee can hopefully withstand that crooked blade he longeth so to lift i pray thee blind him with his own vile sand which only times all ruins by its drift or prune his eagle wings that are so swift one hundred and four or take him by that sole and grizzled tuft that hangs upon his bald and barren crown and we will sing to see him so rebuffed and lend our little mites to pull him down and make brave sport of his malicious frown for all his boastful mockery o'er men for thou wast born i know for this renown by my most magical and inward ken that readeth even at fate's forestalling pen One hundred and five nay by the golden lustre of thine eye and by thy brow's most fair and ample span thought's glorious palace framed for fancies high and by thy cheek thus passionately won i know the signs of an immortal man nature's chief darling and illustrious mate destined to foil old death's oblivious plan and shine untarnished by the fogs of fate time's famous rival till the final date one hundred and six or shield us then from this usurping time and we will visit thee in moonlight dreams and teach thee tunes to wed unto thy rhyme and dance about thee in all midnight gleams giving thee glimpses of our magic schemes such as no mortal's eye hath ever seen and for thy love to us in our extremes will ever keep thy chaplet fresh and green such as no poet's wreath hath ever been One hundred and seven and we'll distill thee aromatic dews to charm thy sense when there shall be no flowers and flavoured syrups in thy drinks infuse and teach the nightingale to haunt thy bowers and with our games divert thy weariest hours with all that elfin wits can e'er devise and this churl dead there'll be no hasting hours to rob thee of thy joys as now joy flies here she was stopped by saturn's furious cries One hundred and eight whom therefore the kind shade rebukes anew saying thou haggard sin go forth and scoop thy hollow coffin in some churchyard yew or make the autumnal flowers turn pale and droop or fell the bearded corn till gleaners stoop under fat sheaves or blast the piney grove but here thou shalt not harm this pretty group whose lives are not so frail and feebly wove but least on nature's loveliness and love One hundred and nine tis these that free the small entangled fly caught in the venomed spider's crafty snare these be the petty surgeons that apply the healing balsams to the wounded hair bedded in bloody fern no creatures care these be providers for the orphan brood whose tender mother hath been slain in air quitting with gaping bill her darling's food hard by the verge of her domestic wood One hundred and ten tis these befriend the timid trembling stag when with a bursting heart beset with fears he feels his saving speed begin to flag for then they quench the fatal taint with tears and prompt fresh shifts in his alarmed ears so piteously they view all bloody morts 
or if the gunner with his arms appears like noisy pies and jays with harsh reports they warn the wild fowl of his deadly sports 111 for these are kindly ministers of nature to soothe all covert hurts and dumb distress pretty they be and very small of stature for mercy still consorts with littleness wherefore the sum of good is still the less and mischief grossest in this world of wrong so do these charitable dwarfs redress the tenfold ravages of giants strong to whom great malice and great might belong one hundred and twelve likewise to them are poets much beholden for secret favours in the midnight glooms brave spencer quaffed out of their goblets golden and saw their tables spread of prompt mushrooms and heard their horns of honeysuckle blooms sounding upon the air most soothing soft like humming bees busy about the brooms and glanced this fair queen's witchery full oft and in her magic wane soared far aloft one hundred and thirteen nay i myself though mortal once was nursed by fairy gossips friendly at my birth and in my childish ear glib mab rehearsed her breezy travels round our planet's girth telling me wonders of the moon and earth my grammary at her grave lap i conned where puck hath been convened to make me mirth i have had from queen titania tokens fond and toyed with oberon's permitted wand One hundred and fourteen with figs and plums and persian dates they fed me and delicate cates after my sunset meal and took me by my childish hand and led me by craggy rocks crested with keeps of steel whose awful bases deep dark woods conceal staining some dead lake with their verdant dyes and when the west sparkled at phoebus's wheel with fairy euphrasy they purged mine eyes to let me see their cities in the skies One hundred and fifteen twas they first schooled my young imagination to take its flights like any new-fledged bird and showed the span of winged meditation stretched wider than things grossly seen or heard with sweet swift aerial how i soared and stirred the fragrant blooms of spiritual bowers twas they endeared what i have still preferred nature's blessed attributes and balmy powers her hills and vales and brooks sweet birds and flowers One hundred and sixteen wherefore with all true loyalty and duty will i regard them in my honouring rhyme with love for love and homages to beauty and magic thoughts gathered in night's cool clime with studious verse trancing the dragon time strong as old merlin's necromantic spells so these dear monarchs of the summer's prime shall live unstartled by his dreadful yells till shrill larks warn them to their flowery cells One hundred and seventeen look how a poisoned man turns livid black drugged with a cup of deadly hellebore that sets his horrid features all at rack so seemed these words into the ear to pour of ghastly satin answering with a roar of mortal pain and spite and utmost rage wherewith his grisly arm he raised once more and bade the clustered sinews all engage as if at one fell stroke to wreck an age One hundred and eighteen whereas the blade flashed on the dinted ground down through his steadfast foe yet made no scar on that immortal shade or death-like wound but time was long benumbed and stood ajar and then with baffled rage took flight afar to weep his hurt in some cimmerian gloom or meaner fames like mine to mock and mar or sharp his scythe for royal strokes of doom whetting its edge on some old caesar's tomb One hundred and nineteen howbeit he vanished in the forest shade distantly heard as if some grumbling pard and like nymph echo to a sound decayed meanwhile the fays clustered the gracious bard the darling centre of their dear regard besides of sundry dancers on the green never was mortal man so brightly starred or won such pretty homages i ween nod to him elves cries the melodious queen One hundred and twenty nod to him elves and flutter round about him and quite enclose him with your pretty crowd and touch him lovingly for that without him the silkworm now had spun our dreary shroud but he hath all dispersed death's tearful cloud and time's dread effigy scared quite away bow to him then as though to me ye bowed and his dear wishes prosper and obey wherever love and wit can find a way One hundred and twenty-one 
noined him with fairy dews of magic savours shaken from orient buds still pearly wet roses and spicy pinks and of all favours plant in his walks the purple violet and meadow sweet under the hedges set to mingle breaths with dainty eglantine and honeysuckle sweet nor yet forget some pastoral flowery chaplets to entwine to vie the thoughts about his brow benign one hundred and twenty two let no wild things astonish him or fear him but tell them all how mild he is of heart till e'en the timid hares go frankly near him and eke the dapple does yet never start nor shall their fawns into the thickets dart nor wrens forsake their nests among the leaves nor speckled thrushes flutter far apart but bid the sacred swallow haunt his eaves to guard his roof from lightning and from thieves one hundred and twenty three or when he goes the nimble squirrel's visitor let the brown hermit bring his hoarded nuts for tell him this is nature's kind inquisitor though man keeps cautious doors that conscience shuts for conscious wrong all curious quest rebuts nor yet shall bees uncase their jealous stings however he may watch their straw-built huts so let him learn the crafts of all small things which he will hint most aptly when he sings One hundred and twenty four here she leaves off and with a graceful hand waves thrice three splendid circles round his head which though deserted by the radiant wand wears still the glory which her waving shed such as erst crowned the old apostle's head to show the thoughts there harboured were divine and on immortal contemplations fed goodly it was to see that glory shine around a brow so lofty and benign one hundred and twenty five goodly it was to see the elfin brood contend for kisses of his gentle hand that had their mortal enemy withstood and stayed their lives fast ebbing with the sand long while this strife engaged the pretty band but now bold chanticleer from farm to farm challenged the dawn creeping o'er eastern land and well the fairies knew that shrill alarm which sounds the knell of every elfish charm one hundred and twenty six and soon the rolling mist that gan arise from plashy mead and undiscovered stream earth's morning incense to the early skies crept o'er the failing landscape of my dream soon faded then the phantom of my theme a shapeless shade that fancy disavowed and shrank to nothing in the mystic stream then flew titania and her little crowd like flocking linnets vanished in a cloud end of section forty seven end of poem Hero and Leander, one by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Hero and Leander to S. T. Coleridge. It is not with a hope my feeble praise can add one moment's honour to thy own that with thy mighty name I grace these lays. I seek to glorify myself alone, for that some precious favour thou hast shown to my endeavour in a bygone time, and by this token I would have it known thou art my friend and friendly to my rhyme it is my dear ambition now to climb still higher in thy thought if my bold pen may thrust on contemplations more sublime but i am thirsty for thy praise for when we gain applauses from the great in name we seem to be partakers of their fame one o bards of old what sorrows have ye sung and tragic stories chronicled in stone sad philomel restored her ravished tongue and transformed niobe in dumbness shown sweet sappho on her love forever calls and hero on the drowned leander falls two was it that spectacles of sadder plights should make our blisses relish the more high then all fair dames and maidens and true knights whose flourished fortunes prosper in love's eye weep here unto a tale of ancient grief traced from the course of an old bas-relief three there stands abydos here is sestos steep hard by the gusty margin of the sea where sprinkling waves continually do leap and that is where those famous lovers be a builded gloom shot up into the grey as if the first tall watch-tower of the day four lo how the lark soars upward and is gone turning a spirit as he nears the sky his voice is heard though body there is none and rain like music scatters from on high 
but love would follow with a falcon spite to pluck the minstrel from his dewy height five for love hath framed a ditty of regrets tuned to the hollow sobbings on the shore a vexing sense that with like music frets and chimes this dismal burthen o'er and o'er saying leander's joys are past and spent like stars extinguished in the firmament six for ere the golden crevices of morn let in those regal luxuries of light which all the variable east adorn and hang rich fringes on the skirts of night leander weaning from sweet hero's side must leave a widow where he found a bride seven hark how the billows beat upon the sand like pawing steeds impatient of delay meanwhile their rider lingering on the land dallies with love and holds farewell at bay a too short span how tedious slow is grief but parting renders time both sad and brief eight alas he sighed that this first glimpsing light which makes the wide world tenderly appear should be the burning signal for my flight from all the world's best image which is here whose very shadow in my fond compare shines far more bright than beauty's self elsewhere nine their cheeks are white as blossoms of the dark whose leaves close up and show the outward pale and those fair mirrors where their joys did spark all dim and tarnished with a dreary veil no more to kindle till the night's return like stars replenished at joy's golden urn Ten. Even thus they creep into the spectral grey that cramps the landscape in its narrow brim, as when two shadows by old Letha stray, he clasping her and she entwining him, like trees wind parted that embrace anon. True love so often goes before tis gone. Eleven, for what rich merchant but will pause in fear to trust his wealth to the unsafe abyss? so hero dotes upon her treasure here and sums the loss with many an anxious kiss whilst her fond eyes grow dizzy in her head fear aggravating fear with shows of dread twelve she thinks how many have been sunk and drowned and spies their snow-white bones below the deep then calls huge congregated monsters round and plants a rock wherever he would leap anon she dwells on a fantastic dream which she interprets of that fatal stream thirteen saying that honeyed fly i saw was thee which lighted on a water-lily's cup when lo the flower enamoured of my bee closed on him suddenly and locked him up and he was smothered in her drenching dew therefore this day thy drowning i shall rue fourteen but next remembering her virgin fame she clips him in her arms and bids him go but seeing him break loose repents her shame and plucks him back upon her bosom's snow and tears unfix her iced resolve again as steadfast frosts are thawed by showers of rain fifteen oh for a type of parting love to love is like the fond attraction of two spheres which needs a godlike effort to remove and then sink down their sunny atmospheres in rain and darkness on each ruined heart nor yet their melodies will sound apart sixteen so brave leander sunders from his bride the wrenching pang disparts his soul in twain half stays with her half goes towards the tide and life must ache until they join again now wouldst thy know the wideness of the wound meet every step he takes upon the ground seventeen and for the agony and bosom throw let it be measured by the wide vast air for that is infinite and so is woe since parted lovers breathe it everywhere look how it heaves leander's labouring chest panting at poise upon a rocky crest eighteen from which he leaps into the scooping brine that shocks his bosom with a double chill because all hours till the slow sun's decline that cold divorcer will be twixt them still wherefore he likens it to styx's foul tide where life grows death upon the other side nineteen then sadly he confronts his twofold toil against rude waves and an unwilling mind wishing alas with the stout rower's toil that like a rower he might gaze behind and watch that lonely statue he hath left on her bleak summit weeping and bereft 
twenty yet turning oft he sees her troubled locks pursue him still the furthest that they may her marble arms that overstretch the rocks and her pale passioned hands that seem to pray in dumb petition to the gods above love prays devoutly when it prays for love twenty one then with deep sighs he blows away the wave that hangs superfluous tears upon his cheek and bans his labour like a hopeless slave that chained in hostile galley faint and weak plies on despairing through the restless foam thoughtful of his lost love and far off home twenty two the drowsy mist before him chill and dank like a dull lethargy o'er leans the sea when he rose on against the utter blank steering as if to dim eternity like love's frail ghost departing with the dawn a failing shadow in the twilight drawn twenty three and soon is gone or nothing but a faint and failing image in the eye of thought that mocks his model with an after paint and stains an atom like the shape she sought then with her earnest vows she hopes to fee the old and hoary majesty of sea twenty four o king of waves and brother of high jove preserve my sumless venture there afloat a woman's heart and its whole wealth of love are all embarked upon that little boat nay but two loves two lives a double fate a perilous voyage for so dear a freight twenty five if impious mariners be stained with crime shake not in awful rage thy hoary locks lay by thy storms until another time lest my frail bark be dashed against the rocks o oh, rather smooth thy deeps that he may fly like love himself upon a seeming sky twenty six let all thy herded monsters sleep beneath nor gore him with crooked tusks or wreathed horns let no fierce sharks destroy him with their teeth nor spinefish wound him with their venomed thorns but if he faint and timely succour lack let ruthful dolphins rest him on their back twenty seven let no false dimpling whirlpools suck him in nor slimy quicksands smother his sweet breath let no jagged corals tear his tender skin nor mountain billows bury him in death and with that thought forestalling her own fears she drowned his painted image in her tears twenty eight by this the climbing sun with rest repaired looked through the gold embrasures of the sky and asked the drowsy world how she had fared the drowsy world shone brightened in reply and smiling off her fogs his slanting beam spied young leander in the middle stream twenty nine his face was pallid but the hectic morn had hung a lying crimson on his cheeks and slanderous sparkles in his eyes forlorn so death lies ambushed in consumptive streaks but inward grief was writhing o'er its task as heart-sick jesters weep behind the mask thirty he thought of hero and the lost delight her last embracings and the space between he thought of hero and the future night her speechless rapture and enamoured mien when lo before him scarce two galleys space his thoughts confronted with another face thirty one her aspect's like a moon divinely fair but makes the midnight darker that it lies on tis so beclouded with her coal-black hair that densely skirts her luminous horizon making her doubly fair thus darkly set as marble lies advantaged upon jet thirty two she's all too bright too argent and too pale to be a woman but a woman's double reflected on the wave so faint and frail she tops the billows like an air-blown bubble or dim creation of a morning dream fair as the wave-bleached lily of the stream thirty three the very rumour strikes his seeing dead great beauty like great fear first stuns the sense he knows not if her lips be blue or red nor of her eyes can give true evidence like murder's witness swooning in the court his sight falls senseless by its own report thirty four anon resuming it declares her eyes are tint with asia like two crystal wells that drink the blue complexion of the skies or pearls out peeping from their silvery shells her polished brow it is an ample plain to lodge vast contemplations of the main thirty five her lips might corals seem but corals near stray through her hair like blossoms on a bower 
and o'er the weaker red still domineer and make it pale by tribute to more power her rounded cheeks are of still paler hue touched by the bloom of water tender blue thirty six thus he beholds her rocking on the water under the glossy umbrage of her hair like pearly amphitrite's fairest daughter naiad or nereid or siren fair mislodging music in her pitiless breast a nightingale within a falcon's nest thirty seven they say there be such maidens in the deep charming poor mariners that all too near by mortal lullabies fall dead asleep as drowsy men are poisoned through the ear therefore leander's fears begin to urge this snowy swan is coming to sing his dirge thirty eight at which he falls into a deadly chill and strains his eyes upon her lips apart fearing each breath to feel that prelude shrill pierced through his marrow like a breath-blown dart shot sudden from an indian's hollow cane with mortal venom fraught and fiery pain thirty nine here then poor wretch how he begins to crowd a thousand thoughts within a pulse's space there seemed so brief a pause of life allowed his mind stretched universal to embrace the whole wide world in an extreme farewell a moment's musing but an age to tell forty for there stood hero widowed at a glance the foreseen sum of many a tedious fact pale cheeks dim eyes and withered countenance a wasted ruin that no wasting lacked time's tragic consequence ere time began a world of sorrow in a teardrop's span forty one a moment's thinking is an hour in words an hour of words is little for some woes too little breathing a long life affords for love to paint itself by perfect shows then let his love and grief unwronged lie dumb whilst fear and that it fears together come forty two as when the crew hard by some jutty cape struck pale and panicked by the billows roar lay by all timely measures of escape and let their bark go driving on the shore so frayed leander drifting to his wreck gazing on scylla falls upon her neck forty three for he hath all forgot the swimmer's art the rower's cunning and the pilot's skill letting his arms fall down in languid part swayed by the waves and nothing by his will till soon he jars against that glossy skin solid like glass though seemingly as thin forty four lo how she startles at the warning shock and straightway girds him to her radiant breast more like his safe smooth harbour than his rock poor wretch he is so faint and toil oppressed he cannot loose him from his grappling foe whether for love or hate she lets not go forty five his eyes are blinded with the sleety brine his ears are deafened with the wildering noise he asks the purpose of her fell design but foamy waves choke up his struggling voice under the ponderous sea his body dips and hero's name dies bubbling on his lips End of section 48. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hero and Leander, two, by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. 46. Look how a man is lowered to his grave, a yearning hollow in the green earth's lap. So he is sunk into the yawning wave the plunging sea fills up the watery gap anon he is all gone and nothing seen but likeness of green turf and hillocks green forty seven and where he swam the constant sun lies sleeping over the verdant plain that makes his bed and all the noisy waves go freshly leaping like gamesome boys over the churchyard dead the light in vain keeps looking for his face now screaming sea-fowl settle in his place Forty eight. Yet weep and watch for him, though all in vain. Ye moaning billows, seek him as ye wander. Ye gazing sunbeams, look for him again. Ye winds, grow hoarse with asking for Leander. Ye did but spare him for more cruel rape. Sea storm and ruin in a female shape. Forty nine. She says tis love hath bribed her to this deed. The glancing of his eyes did so bewitch her o bootless theft unprofitable mead love's treasury is sacked but she no richer 
the sparkles of his eyes are cold and dead and all his golden looks are turned to lead fifty she holds the casket but her simple hand hath spilled its dearest jewel by the way she hath life's empty garment at command but her own death lies covert in the prey as if a thief should steal a tainted vest some dead man's spoil and sicken of his pest fifty one now she compels him to her deeps below hiding his face beneath her plenteous hair which jealously she shakes all round her brow for dread of envy though no eyes are there but seals and all brute tenants of the deep which heedless through the wave their journeys keep fifty two downward and still downward through the dusky green she bore him murmuring with joyous haste in too rash ignorance as he had been born to the texture of that watery waste that which she breathed and sighed the emerald wave how could her pleasant home become his grave fifty three down and still downward through the dusky green she bore her treasure with a face too nigh to mark how life was altered in its mien or how the light grew torpid in his eye or how his pearly breath unprisoned there flew up to join the universal air fifty four she could not miss the throbbings of his heart whilst her own pulse so wantoned in its joy she could not guess he struggled to depart and when he strove no more the hapless boy she read his mortal stillness for content feeling no fear where only love was meant fifty five soon she alights upon her ocean floor and straight unyokes her arms from her fair prize then on his lovely face begins to pour as if to glut her soul her hungry eyes have grown so jealous of her arms delight it seems she hath no other sense but sight fifty six but oh sad marvel oh most bitter strange what dismal magic makes his cheek so pale why will he not embrace why not exchange her kindly kisses wherefore not exhale some odorous message from life's ruby gates where she his first sweet embassy awaits fifty seven her eyes poor watchers fixed upon his looks are grappled with a wonder near to grief as one who pours on undeciphered books strains vain surmise and dodges with belief so she keeps gazing with a mazy thought framing a thousand doubts that end in naught fifty eight too stern inscription for a page so young the dark translation of his look was death but death written in an alien tongue and learning was not by to give it breath so one deep woe sleeps buried in its seal which time untimely hasteth to reveal fifty nine meanwhile she sits unconscious of her hap nursing death's marble effigy which there with heavy head lies pillowed in her lap and elbows all unhinged his sleeking hair creeps o'er her knees and settles where his hand leans with lax fingers crooked against the sand sixty and there lies spread in many an oozy trail like glossy weeds hung from a chalky base that shows no whiter than his brow is pale so soon the wintry death had bleached his face into cold marble with blue chilly shades showing wherein the freezy blood pervades sixty one and o'er his steadfast cheek a furrowed pain hath set and stiffened like a storm in ice showing by drooping lines the deadly strain of mortal anguish yet you might gaze twice ere death it seemed and not his cousin's sleep that through those creviced lids did underpeep sixty two but all that tender bloom about his eyes is death's own violets which is utmost right it is to scatter when the red rose dies for blue is chilly and akin to white also he leaves some tinges on his lips which he hath kissed with such cold frosty nips sixty three surely quoth she he sleeps the senseless thing oppressed and faint with toiling in the stream therefore she will not mar his rest but sing so low her tune shall mingle with his dream meanwhile her lily fingers task to twine his uncrisped locks uncurling in the brine sixty four o lovely boy thus she attuned her voice welcome thrice welcome to a sea maid's home my love mate thou shalt be and true heart's choice how have i longed such a twin self should come a lonely thing till this sweet chance befell my heart kept sighing like a hollow shell sixty five 
here thou shalt live beneath this secret dome an ocean bower defended by the shade of quiet waters a cool emerald gloom to lap thee all about nay be not frayed those are but shady fishes that sail by like antic clouds across my liquid sky sixty six look how the sunbeam burns upon their scales and shows rich glimpses of their tyrian skins they flash small lightnings from their vigorous tails and winking stars are kindled at their fins these shall divert thee in thy weariest mood and seek thy hand for gamesomeness and food sixty seven lo those green pretty leaves with tassel bells my flowerets those that never pine for drouth myself did plant them in the dappled shells that drink the wave with such a rosy mouth pearls wouldst thou have beside crystals to shine i had such treasures once now they are thine sixty eight now lay thine ear against this golden sand and thou shalt hear the music of the sea those hollow tunes it plays against the land is not a rich and wondrous melody i have lain hours and fancied in its tone i heard the languages of ages gone sixty nine i too can sing when it shall please thy choice and breathe soft tunes through a melodious shell though heretofore i have but set my voice to some long sighs grief harmonized to tell how desolate i fared but this sweet change will add new notes of gladness to my range seventy or bid me speak and i will tell thee tales which i have framed out of the noise of waves ere now i have communed with senseless gales and held vain colloquies with barren caves but i could talk to thee whole days and days only to word my love a thousand ways seventy one but if thy lips will bless me with their speech then ope sweet oracles and i'll be mute i was born ignorant for thee to teach nay all love's law to thy dear looks impute then ope thine eyes fair teachers by whose light i saw to give away my heart aright seventy two but cold and deaf the sullen creature lies over her knees and with concealing clay like hoarding avarice locks up his eyes and leaves her world impoverished of day then at his cruel lips she bends to plead but there the door is closed against her need seventy three surely he sleeps so her false wits infer alas poor sluggard ne'er to wake again surely he sleeps yet without any stir that might denote a vision in his brain or if he does not sleep he feigns too long twice she hath reached the ending of her song seventy four therefore tis time she tells him to uncover those radiant jesters and disperse her fears whereby her april face is shaded over like rainy clouds just ripe for showering tears nay if he will not wake so poor she gets herself must open those locked-up cabinets seventy five with that she stoops above his brow and bids her busy hands forsake his tangled hair and tenderly lift up those coffer lids that she may gaze upon the jewels there like babes that pluck an early bud apart to know the dainty colour of its heart seventy six now picture one soft creeping to a bed who slowly parts the fringe hung canopies and then starts back to find the sleeper dead so she looks in on his uncovered eyes and seeing all within so drear and dark her own bright soul dies in her like a spark seventy seven backward she falls like a pale prophetess under the swoon of holy divination and what had all surpassed her simple guess she now resolves in this dark revelation death's very mystery oblivious death long sleep deep night and an entranced breath seventy eight yet life though wounded sore not wholly slain merely obscured and not extinguished lies her breath that stood at ebb soon flows again heaving her hollow breast with heavy sighs and light comes in and kindles up the gloom to light her spirit from its transient tomb seventy nine then like the sun awakened at new dawn with pale bewildered face she peers about and spies blurred images obscurely drawn uncertain shadows in a haze of doubt but her true grief grows shapely by degrees a perished creature lying on her knees eighty and now she knows how that old murther prays whose quarry on her lap lies newly slain how he roams all abroad and grimly slays like a lean tiger in love's own domain 
parting fond mates and oft in flowery lawns bereaves mild mothers of their milky fawns eighty one o too dear knowledge o pernicious earning foul curse engraven upon beauty's page even now the sorrow of that deadly learning ploughs up her brow like an untimely age and on her cheek stamps verdict of death's truth by canker blights upon the bud of youth eighty two for as unwholesome winds decay the leaf so her cheek's rose is perished by her sighs and withers in the sickly breath of grief whilst unacquainted rheum bedims her eyes tears virgin tears the first that ever leapt from those young lids now plentifully wept eighty three whence being shed the liquid crystalline drops straightway down refusing to partake in gross admixture with the baser brine but shrinks and hardens into pearls opaque hereafter to be worn on arms and ears so one maid's trophy is another's tears eighty four o foul arch shadow thou old cloud of night thus in her frenzy she began to wail thou blank oblivion blotter out of light life's ruthless murderer and dear love's bale why hast thou left thy havoc incomplete leaving me here and slaying the more sweet eighty five lo what a lovely ruin thou hast made alas alas thou hast no eye to see and blindly slewest him in misguided shade would i had lent my doting sense to thee but now i turn to thee a willing mark thine arrows miss me in the aimless dark eighty six o doubly cruel twice misdoing spite but i will guide thee with my helping eyes or walk the wide world through devoid of sight yet thou shalt know me by my many sighs nay then thou shouldst have spared my roses false death and known love's flower by smelling his sweet breath eighty seven or when thy furious rage was round him dealing love should have grown from touching of his skin but like cold marble thou art all unfeeling and hast no ruddy springs of warmth within and being but a shape of freezing bone thy touching only turned my love to stone eighty eight and here alas he lies across my knees with cheeks still colder than the stilly wave the light beneath his eyelids seems to freeze here then since love is dead and lacks a grave o oh, come and dig it in my sad heart's core that wound will bring a balsam for its sore eighty nine for art thou not asleep where sense of ill lies stingless like a sense benumbed with cold healing all hurts only with sleep's good will so shall i slumber and perchance behold my living love in dreams o oh, happy night that lets me company his banished sprite ninety o poppy death sweet poisoner of sleep where shall i seek for thee oblivious drug that i may steep thee in my drink and creep out of life's coil look idle how i hug thy dainty image in this strict embrace and kiss this clay-cold model of thy face end of section forty nine this recording is in the public domain Hero and Leander, three, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org, by Peter Tucker. Ninety-one. Put out, put out these sun-consuming lamps, I do but read my sorrows by their shine. O oh, come and quench them with thy oozy damps, and let my darkness intermix with thine. Since love is blinded, wherefore should I see? Now love is death, death will be love to me. Ninety-two away away this vain complaining breath it does but stir the troubles that i weep let it be hushed and quieted sweet death the wind must settle ere the wave can sleep since love is silent i would fain be mute o oh, death be gracious to my dying suit ninety three thus far she pleads but pleading nought avails her for death her sullen burthen deigns no heed then with dumb craving arms since darkness fails her she prays to heaven's fair light as if her need inspired her there were gods to pity pain or end it but she lifts her arms in vain ninety four poor gilded grief by subtle light by this with mazy gold creeps through her watery mine and diving downward through the green abyss lights up her palace with an amber shine 
there falling on her arms the crystal skin reveals the ruby tide that fares within ninety five look how the fulsome beam would hang a glory on her dark hair but the dark hairs repel it look how the perjured glow suborns a story on her pale lips but lips refuse to tell it grief will not swerve from grief however told on coral lips or charactered in gold ninety six or else thou maid safe anchored on love's neck listing the hapless doom of young leander thou wouldst not shed a tear for that old wreck sitting secure where no wild surges wander whereas the woe moves on with tragic pace and shows its sad reflection in thy face ninety seven thus having travelled on and tracked the tale like the due course of an old bas-relief where tragedy pursues her progress pale brood here a while upon that sea maid's grief and take a deeper imprint from the frieze of that young fate with death upon her knees ninety eight then whilst the melancholy muse withal resumes her music in a sadder tone meanwhile the sunbeam strikes upon the wall conceive that lovely siren to live on even as hope whispered the promethean light would kindle up the dead leander's sprite ninety nine tis light she says that feeds the glittering stars and those were stars set in his heavenly brow but this salt cloud this cold sea vapour mars their radiant breathing and obscures them now therefore i'll lay him in the clear blue air and see how these dull orbs will kindle there a hundred swiftly as dolphins glide or swifter yet with dead leander in her fond arms fold she cleaves the meshes of that radiant net the sun hath twined above of liquid gold nor slacks till on the margin of the land she lays his body on the glowing sand hundred and one there like a pearly waif just past the reach of foamy billows he lies cast just then some listless fishers straying down the beach spy out this wonder thence the curious men low crouching creep into a thicket break and watch her doings till their rude hearts ache hundred and two first she begins to chafe him till she faints then falls upon his mouth with kisses many and sometimes pauses in her own complaints to list his breathing but there is not any then looks into his eyes where no light dwells light makes no pictures in such muddy wells hundred and three the hot sun parches his discovered eyes the hot sun beats on his discoloured limbs the sand is oozy whereupon he lies soiling his fairness then away she swims meaning to gather him a daintier bed plucking the cool fresh weeds brown green and red hundred and four but simple witted thief while she dives under another robs her of her amorous theft the ambushed fishermen creep forth to plunder and steal the unwatched treasure she has left only his void impression dints the sands leander is purloined by stealthy hands hundred and five lo how she shudders off the beaded wave like grief all over tears and senseless falls his void imprint seems hollowed for her grave then rising on her knees looks round and calls on hero hero having learned this name of his last breath she calls him by the same hundred and six then with her frantic hands she rends her hairs and casts them forth sad keepsakes to the wind as if in plucking those she plucked her cares but grief lies deeper and remains behind like a barbed arrow rankling in her brain turning her very thoughts to throbs of pain hundred and seven anon her tangled locks are left alone and down upon the sand she meekly sits hard by the foam as humble as a stone like an enchanted maid beside her wits that ponders with a look serene and tragic stunned by the mighty mystery of magic hundred and eight or think of ariadne's utter trance crazed by the flight of that disloyal traitor who left her gazing on the green expanse that swallowed up his track yet this would mate her even in the cloudy summit of her woe when o'er the far sea brim she saw him go hundred and nine for even so she bows and bends her gaze o'er the eternal waste as if to sum its waves by weary thousands all her days dismally doomed meanwhile the billows come and coldly dabble with her quiet feet like any bleaching stones they weren't to greet 
110. And thence into her lap have boldly sprung, Washing her weedy tresses to and fro, That round her crouching knees have darkly hung. But she sits careless of waves ebb and flow, Like a lone beacon on a desert coast, Showing where all her hope was wrecked and lost. 111. Yet whether in the sea or vaulted sky, She knoweth not her lover's abrupt resort, So like a shape of dreams he left her eye, Winking with doubt. Meanwhile the churl's report Has thronged the beach with many a curious face That peeps upon her from its hiding place. 112. And here a head, and there a brow half seen, Dodges behind a rock. Here on his hands a mariner his crumpled cheeks doth lean, Over a rugged crest. Another stands, holding his harmful arrow at the head, Still checked by human caution and strange dread. 113. One stops his ears, another close beholder Whispers unto the next his grave surmise. This crouches down, and just above his shoulder A woman's pity saddens in her eyes, And prompts her to befriend that lonely grief with all sweet helps of sisterly relief. 114. And down the sunny beach she paces slowly, with many doubtful pauses by the way. Grief hath an influence so hushed and holy, making her twice attempt ere she can lay her hand upon that sea maid's shoulder white, which makes her startle up in wild affright. 115. And like a seal she leaps into the wave that drowns the shrill remainder of her scream, and on the sea fills up the watery cave and seals her exit with a foamy seam, leaving those baffled gazers on the beach, turning in uncouth wonder each to each. 116. Some watch, some call, some see her head emerge, wherever a brown weed falls through the foam. Some point to white eruptions of the surge, but she is vanished to her shady home under the deep, inscrutable, and there weeps in a midnight made of her own hair. 117. Now here the sighing winds, before unheard, forth from their cloudy caves begin to blow, till all the surface of the deep is stirred, like to the panting grief it hides below, and heaven is covered with a stormy rack, soiling the waters with its inky black. 118. The screaming fowl resigns her finny prey, and labours shoreward with a bending wing, rowing against the wind her toilsome way. Meanwhile the curling billows chafe and fling their dewy frost still further on the stones that answer to the wind with hollow groans. 119. And here and there a fisher's far-off bark flies with the sun's last glimpse upon its sail, like a bright flame amid the water's dark, watched with the hope and fear of maidens pale and anxious mothers that upturn their brows, freighting the gusty wind with frequent vows. 120. For that the horrid deep has no sure path to guide love safe into his homely haven. And lo, the storm grows blacker in its wrath, or the dark billow brooding like a raven, that bodes of death and widows sorrowing under the dusky covert of his wing. 121. And so day ended, but no vesper spark hung forth its heavenly sign, but sheets of flame played round the savage features of the dark, making night horrible. That night there came a weeping maiden to high Sestos steep, and tore her hair and gazed upon the deep. 122. And waved aloft her bright and ruddy torch, whose flame the boastful wind so rudely fanned, that oft it would recoil and basely scorch the tender covert of her sheltering hand which yet, for love's dear sake, disdained retire, and like a glorying martyr braved the fire. 123. For that was love's own sign and beacon guide across the Hellespont's wide weary space, wherein he nightly struggled with the tide. Look what a red it forges on her face, as if she blushed at holding such a light, even in the unseen presence of the night. 124. Whereas her tragic cheek is truly pale, and colder than the rude and ruffian air that howls into her ear a horrid tale of storm and wreck, and uttermost despair, saying, Leander floats amid the surge, and those are dismal waves that sing his dirge. 125. And hark, a grieving voice, trembling and faint, blends with the hollow sobbings of the sea, like the sad music of a siren's plaint, but shriller than Leander's voice should be unless the wintry death had changed its tone, wherefore she thinks she hears his spirit moan. 126. 
for now upon each brief and breathless pause made by the raging winds it plainly calls on hero hero whereupon she draws close to the dizzy brink that ne'er appall so brave and constant spirit to recoil however the wild billows toss and toil hundred and twenty seven oh dost thou live under the deep deep sea i thought such love as thine could never die if thou hast gained an immortality from the kind pitying sea god so will i and this false cruel tide that used to sever our hearts shall be our common home for ever hundred and twenty eight there we will sit and sport upon one billow and sing our ocean ditties all the day and lie together on the same green pillow that curls above us with its dewy spray and ever in one presence live and dwell like two twin pearls within the self-same shell 129 one moment then upon the dizzy verge she stands with face upturned against the sky a moment more upon the foamy surge she gazes with a calm despairing eye feeling that awful pause of blood and breath which life endures when it confronts with death 130 then from the giddy steep she madly springs grasping her maiden robes that vainly kept panting abroad like unavailing wings to save her from her death the sea maid wept and in a crystal cave her course enshrined no meaner sepulchre should hero find end of poem end of section fifty this librivox recording is in the public domain Ballad by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Spring, it is cheery, winter is dreary, green leaves hang, but the brown must fly, when he's forsaken, withered and shaken, what can an old man do but die? love will not clip him maids will not lip him maud and marion pass him by youth it is sunny age has no honey what can an old man do but die june it was jolly oh for its folly a dancing leg and a laughing eye youth may be silly wisdom is chilly what can an old man do but die friends they are scanty beggars are plenty if he has followers i know why gold's in his clutches buying him crutches what can an old man do but die end of poem this recording is in the public domain autumn by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by bruce kachuk the autumn skies are flushed with gold and fair and bright the rivers run these are but streams of winter cold and painted mists that quench the sun in secret boughs no sweet birds sing in secret boughs no bird can shroud these are but leaves that take to wing and wintry winds that pipe so loud tis not trees shade but cloudy glooms that on the cheerless valleys fall the flowers are in their grassy tombs and tears of dew are on them all end of poem this recording is in the public domain ballad by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by bruce kachuk sigh on sad heart for love's eclipse 
and beauty's fairest queen though tis not for my peasant lips to soil her name between a king might lay his sceptre down but i am poor and naught the brow should wear a golden crown that wears her in its thought the diamonds glancing in her hair whose sudden beams surprise might bid such humble hopes beware the glancing of her eyes yet looking once i looked too long and if my love is sin death follows on the heels of wrong and kills the crime within her dress seemed wove of lily leaves it was so pure and fine o oh, lofty wares and lowly weaves but hodden gray is mine and homely hose must step apart where gartered princes stand but may he wear my love at heart that wins her lily hand alas there's far from russet frieze to silks and satin gowns but i doubt if god made like degrees in courtly hearts and clowns my father wronged a maiden's mirth and brought her cheeks to blame and all that's lordly of my birth is my reproach and shame tis vain to weep tis vain to sigh tis vain this idle speech for where her happy pearls do lie my tears may never reach yet when i'm gone e'en lofty pride may say of what has been his love was nobly born and died though all the rest was mean my speech is rude but speech is weak such love as mine to tell yet had i words i dare not speak so lady fare thee well i will not wish thy better state was one of low degree but i must weep that partial fate made such a churl of me End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Exile by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. The swallow with summer will wing o'er the seas. The wind that I sigh to will visit thy trees the ship that it hastens thy ports will contain but me i must never see england again there's many that weep there but one weeps alone for the tears that are falling so far from her own so far from thy own love we know not our pain if death is between us or only the main when the white cloud reclines on the verge of the sea i fancy the white cliffs and dream upon thee but the cloud spreads its wings to the blue heaven and flies we never shall meet love except in the skies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Two, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Welcome, dear heart, and a most kind good morrow. The day is gloomy, but our looks shall shine. Flowers I have none to give thee, but I borrow their sweetness in a verse to speak for thine. Here are red roses 
gathered at thy cheeks the white were all too happy to look white for love the rose for faith the lily speaks it withers in false hands but here tis bright dost love sweet hyacinth its scented leaf curls manifold all love's delights blow double tis said this floweret is inscribed with grief but let that hint of a forgotten trouble i plucked the primrose at night's dewy noon like hope it showed its blossoms in the night twas like endymion watching for the moon and here are sunflowers amorous of light these golden buttercups are april's seal the daisy stars her constellations be these grew so lowly i was forced to kneel therefore i pluck no daisies but for thee here's daisies for the morn primrose for gloom pansies and roses for the noontide hours a white once made a dial of their bloom so may thy life be measured out by flowers end of poem this recording is in the public domain ode to melancholy by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk come let us set our careful breasts like philomel against the thorn to aggravate the inward grief that makes her accents so forlorn the world has many cruel points whereby our bosoms have been torn and there are dainty themes of grief in sadness to outlast the morn true honour's dearth affection's death neglectful pride and cankering scorn with all the piteous tales that tears have watered since the world was born the world it is a wilderness where tears are hung on every tree for thus my gloomy fantasy makes all things weep with me come let us sit and watch the sky and fancy clouds where no clouds be grief is enough to blot the eye and make heaven black with misery why should birds sing such merry notes unless they were more blessed than we no sorrow ever chokes their throats except sweet nightingale for she was born to pain our hearts the more with her sad melody why shines the sun except that he makes gloomy nooks for grief to hide and pensive shades for melancholy when all the earth is bright beside let clay wear smiles and green grass wave mirth shall not win us back again whilst man is made of his own grave and fairest clouds but gilded rain i saw my mother in her shroud her cheek was cold and very pale and ever since i've looked on all as creatures doomed to fail why do buds hope except to die ay let us watch the roses wither and think of our love's cheeks and oh how quickly time doth fly to bring death's winter hither minutes hours days and weeks months years and ages shrink to naught an age past is but a thought ay let us think of him a while that with a coffin for a boat rose daily o'er the stygian moat and for our table choose a tomb 
there's dark enough in any skull to charge with black a raven plume and for the saddest funeral thoughts a winding sheet hath ample room where death with his keen pointed style hath writ the common doom how wide the yew tree spreads its gloom and o'er the dead lets fall its dew as if in tears it wept for them the many human families that sleep around its stem how cold the dead have made these stones with natural drops kept ever wet lo here the best the worst the world doth now remember or forget are in one common ruin hurled and love and hate are calmly met the loveliest eyes that ever shone the fairest hands and locks of jet is not enough to vex our souls and fill our eyes that we have set our love upon a rose's leaf our hearts upon a violet blue eyes red cheeks are frailer yet and sometimes at their swift decay beforehand we must fret the roses bud and bloom again but love may haunt the grave of love and watch the mould in vain o oh, clasp me sweet whilst thou art mine and do not take my tears amiss for tears must flow to wash away a thought that shows so stern as this forgive if some while i forget in woe to come the present bliss as frighted proserpine let fall her flowers at the sight of dees even so the dark and bright will kiss the sunniest things throw sternest shade and there is even a happiness that makes the heart afraid now let us with a spell invoke the full-orbed moon to grieve our eyes not bright not bright but with a cloud lapped all about her let her rise all pale and dim as if from rest the ghost of the late buried sun had crept into the skies the moon she is the source of sighs the very face to make us sad if but to think in other times the same calm quiet look she had as if the world held nothing base of vile and mean of fierce and bad the same fair light that shone in streams the fairy lamp that charmed the lad for so it is with spent delights she taunts men's brains and makes them mad all things are touched with melancholy born of the secret soul's mistrust to feel her fair ethereal wings weighed down with vile degraded dust even the bright extremes of joy bring on conclusions of disgust like the sweet blossoms of the may whose fragrance ends in must oh give her then her tribute just her sighs and tears and musings holy there is no music in the life that sounds with idiot laughter solely there's not a string attuned to mirth but has its chord in melancholy end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet to my wife by thomas hood 
Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. The curse of Adam, the old curse of all. Though I inherit in this feverish life of worldly toil, vain wishes and hard strife, and fruitless thought in care's eternal thrall, yet more sweet honey than of bitter gall, I taste through thee, my Eve, my sweet wife. Then what was man's lost paradise, how rife of bliss, since love is with him in his fall, such as our own pure passion still might frame of this fair earth and its delightful bowers, if no fell sorrow like the serpent came to trail its venom o'er the sweetest flowers. But oh, as many and such tears are ours as only should be shed for guilt and shame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet on Receiving a Gift by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Look how the golden ocean shines above its pebbly stones and magnifies their girth. So does the bright and blessed light of love its own things glorify and raise their worth. As weeds seem flowers beneath the flattering brine, and stones like gems, and gems as gems indeed, even so our tokens shine, nay, they outshine pebbles and pearls, and gems and coral weed. For where be ocean waves but half so clear, so calmly constant, and so kindly warm? as love's most mild and glowing atmosphere that hath no dregs to be upturned by storm thus sweet thy gracious gifts are gifts of price and more than gold to doting avarice end of poem this recording is in the public domain Two Sonnets by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. One, by every sweet tradition of true hearts, graven by time in love with his own lore, by all old martyrdoms and antique smarts, wherein love died to be alive the more. Yea, by the sad impression on the shore, Left by the drowned Leander, To endear that coast forever, Where the billows roar, Moaneth for pity in the poet's ear. By hero's faith and the foreboding tear That quenched her brand's last twinkle in its fall, By Sappho's leap, and the low rustling fear that sighed around her flight. I swear by all, the world shall find such pattern in my act, as if love's great examples still were lacked. 2. Love, dearest lady, such as I would speak, lives not within the humour of the eye, not being but an outward fantasy that skims the surface of a tinted cheek, else it would wane with beauty and grow weak, as if the rose made summer, and so lie amongst the perishable things that die, unlike the love which I would give and seek, whose health is of no hue, to feel decay with cheeks decay that have a rosy prime. 
love is its own great loveliness alway and takes new luster from the touch of time its bow owns no december and no may but bears its blossom into winter's clime end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dream of Eugene Aram by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Dream of Eugene Aram T'was in the prime of summertime, an evening calm and cool, And four-and-twenty happy boys came bounding out of school. There were some that ran and some that leapt, like troutlets in a pool. Away they sped, with games and minds and souls untouched by sin, to a level mead they came, and there they drave the wickets in. Pleasantly shone the setting sun over the town of Lynn. Like sportive deer they coursed about and shouted as they ran, turning to mirth all things of earth as only boyhood can. But the usher sat remote from all, a melancholy man. His hat was off, his vest apart, to catch heaven's blessed breeze, for a burning thought was in his brow, and his bosom ill at ease. So he leant his head on his hands and read the book between his knees. Leaf after leaf he turned it o'er, nor ever glanced aside, for the peace of his soul he read the book in the golden eventide. Much study had made him very lean, and pale and leaden-eyed. At last he shut the ponderous tomb, with a fast and fervent grasp, he strained the dusky covers closed and fixed the brazen hasp. O oh God, could I so close my mind and clasp it with a clasp? Then leaping on his feet upright, some moody turns he took, now up the mead, then down the mead, and past a shady nook, and lo, he saw a little boy that pored upon a book. My gentle lad, what is it you read, romance or fairy fable? Or is it some historic page, or kings and crowns and stable? The young boy gave an upward glance. It is the death of Abel. The usher took six hasty strides, as smit with sudden pain. Six hasty strides beyond the place, then slowly back again. And down he sat beside the lad, and talked with him of Cain. And long since then, of bloody men, whose deeds tradition saves, of lonely folk cut off unseen and hid in sudden graves, of horrid stabs in groves forlorn, and murders done in caves, and how the sprites of injured men shriek upward from the sod, I how the ghostly hand will point to show the burial clod, and unknown facts of guilty acts are seen in dreams from God. He told how murderers work the earth beneath the curse of Cain, with crimson clouds before their eyes and flames about their brain, for blood has left upon their souls its everlasting stain. And well, quoth he, I know for truth their pangs must be extreme. Woe, woe, utter bull woe, who spills life's sacred stream. For why, methought last night I wrought, a murder in a dream. One that had never done me wrong, a feeble man and old, I led him to a lonely field. The moon shone clear and cold. Now here, said I, this man shall die, and I will have his gold. Two sudden blows with a ragged stick and one with a heavy stone. One hurried gash with a hasty knife, and then the deed was done. There was nothing left at my foot but lifeless flesh and bone. Nothing but lifeless flesh and bone that could not do me ill, and yet I feared him all the more for lying there so still. There was a manhood in his look that murder could not kill. And lo, the universal air seemed lit with ghastly flame. Ten thousand, thousand dreadful eyes were looking down in blame. I took the dead man by his hand and called upon his name. Oh God, it made me quake to see such sense within the slain. But when I touched the lifeless clay, the blood gushed out amain. 
for every clot a burning spot was scorched in my brain. My head was like an ardent coal, my heart as solid ice, my wretched, wretched soul I knew was at the devil's price. A dozen times I groaned the dead and never groaned but twice. And now from forth the frowning sky, from the heaven's topmost height, I heard a voice, the awful voice of the blood-avenging sprite. Thou guilty man, take up thy dead and hide it from my sight. I took the dreary body up and cast it in a stream. A sluggish water, black as ink, the depth was so extreme. My gentle boy, remember this, is nothing but a dream. Down went the course with a hollow plunge, and vanished in the pool. Anon I cleansed my bloody hands and washed my forehead cool, and sat among the urchins young that evening in the school. O oh, heaven, to think of their white souls and mine so black and grim, I could not share in childish prayer, nor join in evening hymn. Like a devil of the pit I seemed, mid holy cherubim, and peace went with them, one and all, and each calm pillow spread. But guilt was my grim chamberlain that lighted me to bed, and drew my midnight curtains round with fingers bloody red. All night I lay in agony, in anguish dark and deep. My fevered eyes I dare not close, but stared aghast at sleep. For sin had rendered unto her the keys of hell to keep. All night I lay in agony, from weary chime to chime, with one besetting horrid hint that racked me all the time, a mighty yearning like the first fierce impulse unto crime. One stern, tyrannic thought that made all others thoughts its slave, stronger and stronger every pulse did that temptation crave, still urging me to go and see the dead man in his grave. Heavily I rose up as soon as light was in the sky, and sought the black accursed pool with a wild misgiving eye, and I saw the dead in the river bed, for the faithless stream was dry. Merrily rose the lark and shook the dewdrops from its wing, but I never marked its morning flight, I never heard it sing, for I was stooping once again, under the horrid thing. With breathless speed, like a soul in chase, I took him up and ran. There was no time to dig a grave before the day began. In a lonesome wood, with heaps of leaves, I hid the murdered man. And all that day I read in school, but my thought was otherwhere. As soon as the midday task was done, in secret I was there, and a mighty wind had swept the leaves and still the course was bare. Then down I cast me on my face, and first began to weep, for I knew my secret then was out, that earth refused to keep. Or land, or sea, though he should be ten thousand fathoms deep. So wills the fierce avenging sprite, till blood for blood atones, I though he's buried in a cave, and trodden down with stones, and years have rotted off his flesh, the world shall see his bones. O oh God, that horrid, horrid dream, besets me now awake. Again, again, with dizzy brain, the human life I take, and my red right hand grows raging hot like Cranmer's at the stake. And still, no peace for the restless clay will wave or mould allow. The horrid thing pursues my soul, it stands before me now. The fearful boy looked up and saw huge drops upon his brow. That very night, while gentle sleep, the urchin eyelids kissed, two stern-faced men set out from Lynn through the cold and heavy mist, and Eugene Aram walked between with jives upon his wrist. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet for the 14th of February by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Sonnet for the 14th of February 
No popular respect will I omit to do the honor on this happy day, when every loyal lover tasks his wit, his simple truth in studious rhymes to pay, and to his mistress dear his hopes convey. Rather thou knowest I would still outrun all calendars with loves, whose date alway thy bright eyes govern better than the sun. For with thy favor was my life begun, and still I reckon on from smiles to smiles, and not by summers, for I thrive on none but those thy cheerful countenance complies. Oh, if it be to choose and call thee mine, love, thou art every day my valentine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Deathbed by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 4th of December, 2016, Kent We watched her breathing through the night Her breathing soft and low As in her breast the wave of life Kept heaving to and fro so silently we seemed to speak, so slowly moved about, as we had lent her half our powers to eke her living out. Our very hopes belied our fears, our fears, our hopes belied. We thought her dying when she slept, and sleeping when she died. For when the morn came dim and sad, and chill with early showers, her quiet eyelids closed, she had another morn than ours. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Anticipation by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Anticipation Coming events cast their shadow before I had a vision in the summer light Sorrow was in it and my inward sight Ached with sad images, the touch of tears Gushed down my cheeks, the figured woes of years Casting the shadows across sunny hours Oh, there was nothing sorrowful and flowers Wooing the glances of an April sun Or apple blossoms opening one by one their crimson bosoms, all the twittered words, and warbled sentences of merry birds, all the small glitter and the humming wings of golden flies and many coloured things. Oh, these were nothing sad, nor to see her sitting beneath the comfortable stir of early leaves, casting the playful grace of moving shadows in so fair a face, nor in her brow serene, nor in the love of her mild eyes drinking the light above, with a long thirst, nor in her gentle smile, nor in her hand that shone blood red the while. She raised it in the sun, all these were dear, to heart and eye, but an invisible fear shook in the trees and chilled upon the air. And if one spot was laughing brightest there, my soul most sank and darkened in despair, as if the shadows of a curtain room haunted me in the sun, as if the bloom of early flowerets had no sweets for me, nor apple blossoms any blush to see, as if the hour had brought too bright a day, and little birds were all too gay, too gay, as if the beauty of that lovely one were all a fable, full before the sun, stood death and cast a shadow long before, like a dark pall enshrouding her o'er, oh, oh, till eyes and lips and smiles were all no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Child Embracing His Mother by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway Love thy mother, little one, Kiss and clasp her neck again, Hereafter she may have a son, Will kiss and clasp her neck in vain, Love thy mother, little one. Gaze upon her living eyes, and mirror back her love for thee. Hereafter thou may shudder sighs To meet them when they cannot see. 
gaze upon her living eyes. Press her lips the while they glow with love that they have often told. Hereafter thou mayst press in woe and kiss them till thine old are cold. Press her lips the while they glow. O oh, revere her raven hair, although it be not silver grey, to early death, led on by care, may snatch save one dear lock away. O oh, revere her raven hair. Pray for her at even morn, that heaven may long the stroke defer, for thou mayst live in the hour forlorn, when thou wilt ask to die with her. Pray for her at eve and morn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stanzas from Tinley Hall by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway Still glides the gentle streamlet on with shifting current new and strange. The water that was here is gone, but those green shadows do not change. Serene or ruffled by the storm, on present waves as on the past, the mirrored grave retains its form, the selfsame trees the semblance cast. The hue each fleeting globule wears, that drop bequeaths it to the next one picture still the surface bears to illustrate the murmured text so love however time may flow fresh hours pursuing those that flee one constant image still shall show my tide of life is true to thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sonnet to Ocean by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Shall I rebuke thee, Ocean, my old love, That once in rage with the wild winds at strife Thou darest menace my unit of a life, Sending my clay below, my soul above, Whilst roared thy waves like lions when they rove by night, and bound upon their prey by stealth. Yet didst thou ne'er restore my fainting health? Didst thou ne'er murmur gently like the dove? Nay, dost thou not against my own dear shore full break, last link between my land and me? My absent friends talk in thy very roar, in thy waves beat their kindly pulse I see, and if I must not see my England more, Next to her soil my grave be found in thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two. Composed at Rotterdam. By Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org. By Drew Conway. I gaze upon a city, a city new and strange. Down many a watery vista my fancy takes a range. From side to side I saunter and wonder where I am. And can you be in England and I at Rotterdam? Before me lie dark waters in broad canals and deep, whereon the silver moonbeams sleep restless in their sleep. A sort of vulgar Venice. Reminds me where I am. Yes, yes, you are in England, and I am at Rotterdam. Tall houses with quaint gables, where frequent windows shine, and keys that lead to bridges, and trees in formal line, and masts of spicy vessels from western Suriname, all tell me you're in England. But I'm in Rotterdam. Those sailors, how outlandish, the face and form of each, 
They deal in foreign gestures and use a foreign speech. A tongue not learned near Isis or studied by the cam declares that you're in England and I'm at Rotterdam. And now across a market, my doubtful way I trace, where stands a solemn statue, the genius of the place. And to the great Erasmus I offer my salam, who tells me you're in England, but I'm at Rotterdam. The coffee room is open, I mingle in its crowd. The dominoes are noisy, the hookahs raise a cloud. The flavour none of Fearon's that mingles with my dram reminds me you're in England and I'm at Rotterdam. Then here it goes a bumper, the toast it shall be mine. In Shinedam or in Sherry, Turkey or Hock or Rhine. It well deserves the brightest where sunbeam ever swam. The girl I love in England I drink at Rotterdam. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. On seeing my wife and two children sleeping in the same chamber. And has the earth lost its so spacious round, The sky its blue circumference above, That in this little chamber there is found Both earth and heaven, my universe of love, All that my God can give me or remove. Here sleeping save myself, in mimic death, sweet that in this small compass I behove, to live their living and to breathe their breath, almost I wish that, with one common sigh, we might resign all mundane care and strife, and seek together that transcendent sky, where father, mother, children, husband, wife, together pant in everlasting life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stanzas by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly Assigned by Hood's son to the year 1835, but apparently only on conjecture. Is there a bitter pang for love removed? O oh God, the dead love doth not cost more tears than the alive, the loving, the beloved, not yet, not yet beyond all hopes and fears, would I were laid under the shade of the calm grave and the long grass of years. That love might die with sorrow, I am sorrow, and she that loves me tenderest doth press most poison from my cruel lips and borrow only new anguish from the old caress. O oh, this world's grief hath no relief in being wrung from a great happiness. Would I had never filled thine eyes with love, for love is only tears. Would I had never breathed such a curse-like blessing as we prove. Now, if farewell could bless thee, I would sever, would I were laid under the shade of the cold tomb and the long grass forever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to Ray Wilson, Esquire By Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Gloria Cave. May 2018 to the editor of the Athenaeum. My dear sir, the following ode was written anticipating the tone of some strictures on my writings by the gentleman to whom it is addressed. I have not seen his book, but I know by hearsay that some of my verses are characterized as profaneness and ribaldry, 
citing in proof the description of a certain sow from whose jaw a cabbage sprout, quote, protruded as the dove so staunch for peace supports an olive branch, close quote. If the printed works of my censor had not prepared me for any misapplication of types, I should have been surprised by this misapprehension of one of the commonest emblems. In some cases, the dove unquestionably stands for the divine spirit, but the same bird is also a lay representative of the peace of this world, and as such has figured time out of mind in allegorical pictures. The sense in which it was used by me is plain from the context. At least it would be plain to anyone but a fisher for faults, predisposed to carp at some things to dab at others into flounder in all. But I am possibly in error. It is the female swine, perhaps, that is profaned in the eyes of the oriental tourist. Men find strange ways of marking their intolerance, and the spirit is certainly strong enough in Mr. W.'s works to set up a creature as sacred in sheer opposition to the Muslim, with whom she is a beast of abomination. It would only be going the whole sow. I am, dear sir, yours very truly, Thomas Hood. Quote, Close, close your eyes with holy dread, And weave a circle round him thrice, For he on honeydew hath fed, And drunk the milk of paradise. Close quote. Coleridge. Quote, It's very hard them kind of men won't let a body be. Close quote. Old Ballad. A wanderer, Wilson from my native land, remote array from godliness and thee, where rolls between us the eternal sea, beside some furlongs of a foreign sand, beyond the broadest scotch of London wall, beyond the loudest saint that has a call. Across the wavy waste between us stretched, a friendly missive warms me of a stricture wherein my likeness you have darkly etched, and though I have not seen the shadow sketched, thus I remark prophetic on the picture. I guess the features, in a line to paint their moral ugliness, I'm not a saint. Not one of those self-constituted saints, quacks, not physicians, in the cure of souls, censors who sniff out mortal taints and call the devil over his own coals, those pseudo-privy counsellors of God, who write down judgments with a pen hard-nibbed, ushers of Beelzebub's black rod, commending sinners not to ice thick-ribbed, but endless flames to scorch them up like flax yet sure of heaven themselves, as if they'd cribbed the impression of St. Peter's keys in wax. Of such a character no single trace exists, I know, in my fictitious face. There wants a certain cast about the eye, a certain lifting of the nose's tip, a certain curling of the nether lip, in scorn of all that is beneath the sky. In brief, it is an aspect deleterious, a face decidedly not serious, a face profane that would not do at all to make a face at Exeter Hall. That hall where bigots rent and cant and pray and laud each other face to face till every farthing candle ray conceives itself a great gas light of grace. Well, be the graceless liniments confessed. I do enjoy this bounteous, bounteous earth and dote upon a jest within the limits of becoming mirth. No solemn sanctimonious face I pull, nor think I'm pious when I'm only bilious, nor study in my sanctum supercilious to frame a Sabbath bill or forge a bull. I pray for grace, repent each sinful act, peruse but underneath the rose my Bible, and love my neighbor far too well, in fact, to call and twit him with a godly tract that's turned by application to a libel. My heart ferments not with a bigot's leaven, all creeds I view with toleration thorough, and have a horror of regarding heaven as anybody's rotten burrow. What else? No part I take in party fray, with troops from Billingsgate slang wanging tartars, I fear no pope, 
and let great Ernest play at fox and goose with foxes martyrs. I own I laugh at other righteous men. I own I shake my sides at ranters, and treat Shem Abram's saints with wicked banters. I even own that there are times, but then it's when I've got my wine, I say D canters. I've no ambition to enact the spy on fellow souls, a spiritual pry. Tis said that people ought to guard their noses who thrust them into matters none of theirs. And though no delicacy discomposes your saint, yet I consider faith and prayers amongst the privatest of men's affairs. I do not hash the gospel in my books, and thus upon the public mind intrude it. As if I thought, like at a hating cook's, no food was fit to eat till I had chewed it. On Bible stilts, I don't affect a stock, nor lard with scripture my familiar talk, for man may pious texts repeat, and yet religion have no inward seat. Tis not so plain as the old hill of Howth. A man has got his belly full of meat because he talks with victuals in his mouth. Mere verbiage. It is not worth a carrot. Why, Socrates or Plato, where's the odds? Once taught a jay to supplicate the gods and made a polytheist of a parrot. A mere professor, spite of all his cant, is not a whit better than a mantis, an insect, of what clime I can't determine, that lifts its paws, most parson-like, and thence, by simple savages, through sheer pretense, is reckoned quite a saint amongst the vermin. But where's the reverence, or where the news? To ride on one's religion through the lobby, whether a stalking horse or hobby, to show its pious paces to the house. I honestly confess that I would hinder the Scottish members' legislative rigs, that spiritual pinder who looks on erring souls as strain pigs, that must be lashed by law wherever found, and driven to church as to the parish pound. I do confess, without reserve or wheedle, I view that groveling idea as one worthy some parish clerk's ambitious son, a charity boy who longs to be a beetle. On such a vital topic, sure, tis odd how much a man can differ from his neighbor. One wishes worship freely given to God. Another wants to make it statute labor. The broad distinction in a line to draw as means to lead us to the skies above, you say, Sir Andrew and his love of law, and I, the Savior with his law of love. Spontaneously to God should tend the soul, like the magnetic needle to the pole. But what were that intrinsic virtue worth, suppose some fellow with more zeal than knowledge fresh from St. Andrew's College should nail the conscious needle to the north? I do confess that I abhor and shrink from schemes with a religious willy-nilly that frown upon St. Giles' sins but blink the peccadilloes of all Piccadilly. My soul revolts at such a bare hypocrisy, and will not, dare not, fancy in accord the Lord of hosts with an exclusive Lord of this world's aristocracy. It will not own a notion so unholy as thinking that the rich by easy trips may go to heaven, whereas the poor and lowly must work their passage as they do in ships. One place there is, beneath the burial sod where all mankind are equalized by death. Another place there is, the fane of God where all are equal who draw living breath. Juggle who will elsewhere with his own soul, playing the Judas with a temporal dole. He who can come beneath that awful cope in the dread presence of a maker just, who meets to every pinch of human dust, one even measure of immortal hope. He who can stand within that holy door with soul unbowed by that pure spirit level and frame unequal laws for rich and poor might sit for hell and represent the devil. Such are the solemn sentiments, O Ray, in your last journey work, 
Perchance you ravage seeming, but in more courtly terms to say, I'm but a heedless, creedless, godless savage. A very guy deserving fire and faggots, a scoffer always on the grin, and sadly given to the mortal sin of liking maw worms less than merry maggots. The humble records of my life to search, I have not herded with mere pagan beasts, but sometimes I have sat at good men's feasts, and I have been where bells have knolled to church. Dear bells, how sweet the sounds of village bells, when on the undulating air they swim, now loud as welcomes, faint now as farewells, and trembling all about the breezy dells as fluttered by the wings of cherubim. Meanwhile the bees are chanting a low hymn, and lost to sight the ecstatic lark above sings like a soul beatified of love, with now and then the coo of the wild pigeon. O oh, pagans, heathens, infidels, and doubters! If such sweet sounds can't woo you to religion, will the harsh voices of church cads and touters? A man may cry, church, church, at every word, with no more piety than other people. A daw's not reckoned a religious bird because it keeps a coin from a steeple. The temple is a good, a holy place, but quacking only gives it an ill savor. While saintly mountebanks the porch disgrace, and bring religion's self into disfavor. Behold yon servitor of God and mammon, who, binding up his Bible with his ledger, blends gospel texts with trading gammon, a black-legged saint, a spiritual hedger, who backs his rigid Sabbath, so to speak, against the wicked remnant of the weak a saving bet against his sinful bias. Rogue that I am, he whispers to himself. I lie, I cheat, do anything for pelf. But who on earth can say, I am not pious? In proof how over-righteousness reacts, accept an anecdote well based on facts. One Sunday morning, at the day don't fret, in riding with a friend to Ponder's End outside the stage, we happened to commend a certain mansion that we saw to let. I cried our coachman, with our talk to grapple. You're right. No house along the road comes nigh it. T'was built by the same man as built yon chapel, and master wanted once to buy it. But the other drive the bargain much too hard. He axed, surely, a sum prodigious. But being so particular religious... Why, that, you see, put master on his guard. Church is a little heaven below. I have been there and still would go. Yet I am none of those who think it odd a man can pray unbidden from the cassock, and, passing by the customary hassock, kneel down remote upon the simple sod, and sue in forma pauperis to God. As for the rest, intolerant to none, whatever shape the pious rite may bear, even the poor pagan's homage to the sun, I would not harshly scorn, lest even there I spurn some elements of Christian prayer, and aim, though erring, at a world ayant, acknowledgment of good, of man's futility, a sense of need and weakness, and indeed that very thing so many Christians want, Humility. Such unto papists, Jews, or turban Turks, such is my spirit, I don't mean my wraith. Such, may it please you, is my humble faith. I know full well you do not like my works. I have not sought tis true the holy land, as full of texts as Cuddy Hedridge's mother, the Bible in one hand and my own commonplace book in the other. But you have been to Palestine. Alas, some minds improve by travel, others, rather, resemble copper wire or brass, which gets the narrower by going farther. Worthless are all such pilgrimages. Very. If palmers at the holy tomb contrive the human heats and rancor to revive that at the sepulchre they ought to bury, a sorry sight it is to rest the eye on, to see a Christian creature graze at Zion, 
then homeward of the saintly pasture full, rush bellowing and breathing fire and smoke. At crippled papistry to butt and poke, exactly as a skittish Scottish bull hunts an old woman in a scarlet cloak. Why leave a serious, moral, pious home? Scotland, renowned for sanctity of old, far distant Catholics to rate and scold for doing as the Romans do at Rome. With such a bristling spirit, wherefore quit the land of cakes for any land of wafers, about the graceless images to flit and buzz and chafe importunate as chafers, longing to carve the carvers to scotch collops. People who hold such absolute opinions should stay at home in Protestant dominions, not travel like male Mrs. Trollops. Gifted with noble tendency to climb, yet weak at the same time, faith is a kind of parasitic plant that grasps the nearest stem with tendril rings. And as the climate and the soil may grant, so is the sort of tree to which it clings. Consider then before, like Hurlothrombo, you aim your club at any creed on earth that by the simple accident of birth you might have been high priest to mumbo-jumbo. For me, through heathen ignorance perchance, not having knelt in Palestine, I feel none of that griffinish excess of zeal. Some travelers would blaze with here in France. Dolls I can see in virgin-like array, nor for a scuffle with the idols hanker like crazy Quixote at the puppet's play. If their offense be rank, should mine be ranker? Mild light and by degrees should be the plan to cure the dark and erring mind. But who would rush at a benighted man and give him two black eyes for being blind? Suppose the tender but luxuriant hop around a cankered stem should twine. What Kentish boor would tear away the prop so roughly as to wound, nay, kill the bine? The images, tis true, are strangely dressed, with gods and toys extremely out of season. The carving nothing of the very best, the whole repugnant to the eye of reason. Shocking to taste, and to fine arts a treason. Yet, ne'er or look in bigotry of sect one truly Catholic, one common form, at which unchecked all Christian hearts may kindle or keep warm. Say, was it to my spirit's gain or loss one bright and balmy morning, as I went from Liege's lovely environs to Ghent, if hard by the wayside I found a cross, that made me breathe a prayer upon the spot, while nature of herself, as if to trace the emblem's use, had trailed around its base the blue significant forget-me-not. Methought the claims of charity to urge more forcibly, along with faith and hope, the pious choice had pitched upon the verge of a delicious slope, giving the eye much variegated scope. Look round, it whispered, on that prospect rare, those vales so verdant and those hills so blue. Enjoy the sunny world so fresh and fair, but... How the simple legend pierced me through. Priez pour les malheureuses. With sweet, kind natures, as in honeyed cells, religion lives and feels herself at home. But only on a formal visit dwells where wasps instead of bees have formed the comb. Shun pride, O oh Ray, whatever sort beside you take in lieu, shun spiritual pride. A pride there is of rank, a pride of birth, a pride of learning, and a pride of purse, a London pride in short. There be on earth a host of prides, some better and some worse. But of all prides, since Lucifer's attaint, the proudest swells a self-elected saint. To picture that cold pride so harsh and hard, fancy a peacock in a poultry yard. Behold him in conceited circle sail, strutting and dancing, and now planted stiff, in all his pomp of pageantry, as if he felt the eyes of Europe on his tail. As for the humble breed retained by man, he scorns the whole domestic clan. He bows, he bridles, he wheels, he sidles, at last, with stately dodgings, in a corner he pens a simple russet hen to scorn her full in the blaze of his resplendent fan. 
Look here, he cries, to give him words. Thou feathered clay, thou scum of birds, flirting the rustling plumage in her eyes. Look here, thou vile predestined sinner, doomed to be roasted for a dinner. Behold those lovely variegated dyes. These are the rainbow colors of the skies that heaven has shed upon me con amore, a bird of paradise, a pretty story. I am that saintly fowl, thou paltry chick. Look at my crown of glory, thou dingy, dirty, drabbled, draggled jill. And off goes Partlet, wriggling from a kick, with bleeding scalp laid open by his bill. That little simile exactly paints how sinners are despised by saints. By saints, the hypocrites that ope heaven's door, obsequious to the sinful man of riches. But put the wicked, naked, bare-legged poor in parish stocks instead of breeches. The saints, the bigots that in public spout spread phosphorus of zeal on scraps of fustian, and go like walking lucifers about mere living bundles of combustion. The saints, the aping fanatics that talk all cant and rant, and rhapsodies high-flown that bid you balk a Sunday walk, and shun God's work as you should shun your own. The saints, the formalists, the extra-pious, who think the mortal husk can save the soul by trundling with a mere mechanic bias to church just like a lignum vitae bowl. The saints... The Pharisees, whose beetle stands beside a stern coercive kirk, a piece of human mason work, calling all sermons contraband in that great temple that's not made with hands. Thrice blessed, rather, is the man with whom the gracious prodigality of nature, the balm, the bliss, the beauty, and the bloom, the bounteous providence in every feature, recall the good creator to his creature, making all earth a thing, all heaven its dome. To his tuned spirit the wild heather bells ring Sabbath knells. The jubilate of the soaring lark is chant of clerk, for choir the thrush and the gregarious linnet. The sod's a cushion for his pious want, and consecrated by the heaven within it, the sky-blue pool a font. Each cloud-capped mountain is a holy altar, an organ breathes in every grove, and the full hearts a psalter, rich in deep hymns of gratitude and love. Sufficiently by stern necessitarians, poor nature, with her face begrimed by dust, is stoked, coked, smoked, and almost choked. But must religion have its own utilitarians labeled with evangelical phylacteries to make the road to heaven a railway trust and churches? That's the naked fact. Mere factories? Oh, simply open wide the temple door and let the solemn, swelling organ greet with voluntaries meet the willing advent of the rich and poor. And while to God the loud hosannas soar with rich vibrations from the vocal throng, from quiet shades, that to the woods belong, and brooks with music of their own, voices may come to swell the choral song with notes of praise they learned in musings lone. How strange it is while, on all vital questions that occupy the house and public mind, We always meet with some humane suggestions of gentle measures of a healing kind, instead of harsh severity and vigor. The saint alone his preference retains for bills of penalties and pains and marks his narrow code with legal rigor. Why shun, as worthless of affiliation, what men of all political persuasion extol, and even use upon occasion that Christian principle, conciliation? But possibly the men who make such fuss with Sunday pippins and old trots infirm attach some other meaning to the term, as thus. One market morning, in my usual rambles, 
passing along Whitechapel's ancient shambles. Where meat was hung in many a joint and quarter, I had to halt a while, like other folks, to let a killing butcher coax a score of lambs and fatted sheep to slaughter. A sturdy man he looked to fill an ox, bull-fronted ruddy with a formal streak of well-greased hair down either cheek, as if he deed dash deed some other flocks beside those woolly-headed stubborn blocks that stood before him in vexatious huddle. Poor little lambs with bleeding weathers grouped, while now and then a thirsty creature stooped and meekly snuffed but did not taste the puddle. Fierce barked the dog, and many a blow was dealt, that loin and chump and scrag and saddle felt, yet still that fatal step they all declined it and shunned the tainted door as if they smelled onions, mint sauce, and lemon juice behind it. At last there came a pause of brutal force. The cur was silent, for his jaws were full of tangled locks of terry wool. The man had whooped and hallowed till dead horse. The time was ripe for mild expostulation, and thus it stammered from a stander by. Zounds! My good fellow! It quite makes me! Why, it really! My dear fellow! Do just try conciliation! Stringing his nerves like flint, the sturdy butcher seized upon the hint. At least he seized upon the foremost weather and hugged and lugged and tugged him neck and crop, just Nolan's volens through the open shop. If tails come off, he didn't care a feather. Then walking to the door and smiling grim, he rubbed his forehead and his sleeve together. There, I have conciliated him. Again, good-humouredly to end our quarrel, good humour should prevail. I'll fit you with a tale whereto is tidy moral. Once on a time a certain English lass was seized with symptoms of such deep decline. Cough, hectic flushes, every evil sign, that as their want is at such desperate pass, the doctors gave her over to an ass. Accordingly, the grisly shade to bilk each morn the patient quaffed a frothy bowl of asinine new milk, robbing a shaggy suckling of a foal which got proportionably spare and skinny. Meanwhile, the neighbors cried, Poor Mary Ann, she can't get over it, she never can. When, lo, to prove each prophet was a ninny, the one that died was the poor wet nurse, Jenny. To aggravate the case, there were but two grown donkeys in the place, and most unluckily for Eve's sick daughter, the other long-eared creature was a male, who never in his life had given a pail of milk or even chalk and water. No matter. At the usual hour of eight, down trots a donkey to the wicket gate, with Mr. Simon Gubbins on his back. Your servant, miss. A warry spring-like day. Bad time for hasses, though. Good luck, good luck. Jenny be dead, miss, but I brought ye Jack. He doesn't give no milk, but he can bray. So runs the story. And in vain self-glory, some saints would sneer at Gubbins for his blindness. But what the better are their pious saws to ailing souls than dry hee-haws without the milk of human kindness? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To My Daughter on Her Birthday by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway Dear Fanny, nine long years ago, while yet the morning sun was low, and rosy with the eastern glow, the landscape smiled. Whilst lowed the newly wakened herds, sweet as the early song of birds, I heard those first delightful words, thou hast a child. Along with that uprising dew, tis glistened in my eyes, though few, to hail the dawning quite as new to me as time. It was not sorrow, not annoy, but like the happy maid, though coy, with grief light welcomed even joy, forestalls its prime. So mayst thou live, dear, many years, 
in all the bliss that life endears, not without smiles, nor yet from tears, too strictly kept. When first thy infant littleness, I folded in my fond caress, the greatest proof of happiness was this, I wept. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Miss Kielmansegg and Her Precious Leg A Golden Legend 1. By Thomas Hood What is here? Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold. Timon of Athens Her Pedigree 1. To trace the Kilmanseg pedigree to the very root of the family tree were a task as rash as ridiculous. Through antediluvian mists as thick as London fog such a line to pick were enough, in truth, to puzzle old Nick, not to name Sir Harris Nicholas. 2. It wouldn't require much verbal strain to trace the Kilman, perchance, to Cain, but waiving all such digressions, suffice it according to family lore a patriarch kilmanseg lived of yore who was famed for his great possessions three tradition said he feathered his nest through an agricultural interest in the golden age of farming when golden eggs were laid by the geese and collegian sheep wore a golden fleece and golden pippins the sterling kind of hesperus now so hard to find made horticulture quite charming Four. a lord of land on his own estate he lived at a very lively rate but his income would bear carousing such acres he had of pastures and heath with herbage so rich from the ore beneath the very ewes and lambkins teeth were turned into gold by browsing five he gave without any extra thrift a flock of sheep for a birthday gift to each son of his loins or daughter and his debts, if debts he had, at will he liquidated by giving each bill a dip in Pactolian water. 6. T'was said that even his pigs of lead, by crossing with some by Midas bread, made a perfect mine of his piggery. And as for cattle, one yearling bull was worth all Smithfield market full of the golden bulls of Pope Gregory. 7. The high-bred horses within his stud, like human creatures of birth and blood, had their golden cups and flagons. And as for the common husbandry nags, their noses were tied in money-bags when they stopped with the carts and wagons. 8. Moreover, he had a golden ass, sometimes at stall and sometimes at grass, that was worth his own weight in money, and a golden hive on a golden bank, where golden bees by alchemical prank gathered gold instead of honey. 9. Gold, and gold, and gold without end, he had gold to lay by, and gold to spend, gold to give, and gold to lend, and reversions of gold in futuro. In wealth the family revelled and rolled, himself and wife and sons so bold, and his daughters sang to their harps of gold, O bella eta dell'oro. 10. Such was the tale of the Kilmanseg kin, in golden text on a vellum skin, though certain people would wink and grin, and declare the whole story a parable. That the ancestor rich was one Jacob Grimes, who held a long lease in prosperous times of acres, pasture and arable. 11. That as money makes money, his golden bees were the five per cents, or which you please, when his cash was more than plenty that the golden cups were racing affairs, and his daughters, who sang Italian airs, had their golden harps of Clementi. 12. That the golden ass or golden bull was English John, with his pockets full, then at war by land and water, while beef and mutton and other meat were almost as dear as money to eat, and farmers reaped golden harvests of wheat at the Lord knows what per quarter. 13. What different dooms our birthdays bring? For instance, one little mannequin thing survives to wear many a wrinkle, while death forbids another to wake, and a son that it took nine moons to make expires without even a twinkle. 14. 
into this world we come like ships launched from the docks and stocks and slips for fortune fair or fatal and one little craft is cast away in its very first trip in babicom bay while another rides safe at port natal fifteen what different lots our stars accord this babe to be hailed and wooed as a lord and that to be shunned like a leper one to the world's wine honey and corn another like colchester native born to its vinegar only and pepper sixteen one is littered under a roof neither wind nor waterproof that's the prose of love in a cottage a puny naked shivering wretch the whole of whose birthright would not fetch though robins himself drew up the sketch the bid of a mess of pottage seventeen born of fortunatus's kin another comes tenderly ushered in to a prospect all bright and burnished no tenant he for life's back slums he comes to the world as a gentleman comes to a lodging ready furnished eighteen and the other sex the tender the fair what wide reverses of fate are there whilst margaret charmed by the bulbul rare in a garden of ghoul reposes poor peggy hawks nosegays from street to street till think of that who find life so sweet she hates the smell of roses nineteen not so with the infant kilmanseg she was not born to steal or beg or gather cresses in ditches to plait the straw or bind the shoe or sit all day to hem and sew as females must and not a few to fill their insides with stitches twenty she was not doomed for bread to eat to be put to her hands as well as her feet or carry home linen from mangles or heavy-hearted and weary-limbed to dance on a rope in a jacket trimmed with as many blows as spangles twenty one she was one of those who by fortune's boon are born as they say with a silver spoon in her mouth not a wooden ladle to speak according to poets wont plutus as sponsor stood at her font and midas rocked the cradle twenty two at her first debut she found her head on a pillow of down in a downy bed with a damask canopy over for although by the vulgar popular saw all mothers are said to be in the straw some children are born in clover twenty three her very first draught of vital air it was not the common chameleon fare of plebeian lungs and noses no her earliest sniff of this world was a whiff of the genuine otto of roses twenty four when she saw the light it was no mere ray of that light so common so every day that the sun each morning launches but six wax tapers dazzled her eyes from a thing a gooseberry bush for size with a golden stem and branches twenty five she was born exactly at half past two as witnessed a timepiece in ormolu that stood on a marble table showing at once the time of day and a team of gildings running away as fast as they were able with a golden god with a golden star and a golden spear in a golden car according to grecian fable twenty six like other babes at her birth she cried which made a sensation far and wide i for twenty miles around her for though to the ear it was nothing more than an infant's squall it was really the roar of a fifty thousand pounder it shook the next air in his library chair and made him cry confound her twenty seven of signs and omens there was no dearth any more than at owen glendower's birth or the advent of other great people two bullocks dropped dead as if knocked on the head and barrels of stout and ale ran about and the village bells such a peal rang out that they cracked the village steeple twenty eight in no time at all like mushroom spawn tables sprang up all over the lawn not furnished scantily or shabbily but on scale as vast as that huge repast with its loads and cargoes of drink and batagos at the birth of the babe in rabelais twenty nine hundreds of men were turned into beasts like the guests at circe's horrible feasts by the magic of ale and cider and each country lass and each country lad began to caper and dance like mad and even some old ones appeared to have had a bite from the naples spider 
thirty then as night came on it had scared king john who considered such signs not risible to have seen the maroons and the whirling moons and the serpents of flame and wheels of the same that according to some were whizzable thirty one o happy hope of the kilmanseggs thrice happy in head and body and legs that her parents had such full pockets for had she been born of want and thrift for care and nursing all adrift it's ten to one she had had to make shift with rickets instead of rockets thirty two and how was the precious baby dressed in a robe of the east with lace of the west like one of croesus's issue her best bibs were made of rich gold brocade and the others of silver tissue thirty three and when the baby inclined to nap she was lulled on a grodenaple lap by a nurse in a modish paris cap of notions so exalted she drank nothing lower than curaçao maraschino or pink noyau and on principle never malted thirty four from a golden boat with a golden spoon the babe was fed night morning and noon and although the tale seems fabulous tis said her tops and bottoms were gilt like the oats in that stable-yard palace built for the horse of heliogabalus thirty five and when she took to squall and kick for pain will ring and pins will prick e'en the wealthiest nabob's daughter they gave her no vulgar dolby or gin but a liquor with leaf of gold therein videlicet danzig water thirty six in short she was born and bred and nursed and dressed in the best from the very first to please the genteelest censor and then as soon as strength would allow was vaccinated as babes are now with virus tain from the best bred cow of lord althorpe's now earl spencer her christening thirty seven though shakespeare asks us what's in a name as if cognomens were much the same there's really a very great scope in it a name why wasn't there dr dodd that servant at once of mammon and god who found four thousand pounds and odd a prison a cart and a rope in it thirty eight a name if the party had a choice what mortal would be a bug by choice as a hog a grub or a chub rejoice or any such nauseous blazon not to mention many a vulgar name that would make a door plate blush for shame if door plates were not so brazen thirty nine a name it has more than nominal worth and belongs to good or bad luck at birth as dames of a certain degree know in spite of his pages hat and hose his pages jacket and buttons in rows bob only sounds like a page in prose till turned into rupertino forty now to christen the infant kilmanseg for days and days it was quite a plague to hunt the list in the lexicon and scores were tried like coin by the ring ere names were found just the proper thing for a minor rich as a mexican forty one then cards were sent the presents to beg of all the kin of kilmanseg white yellow and brown relations brothers wardens of city halls and uncles rich as three golden balls from taking pledges of nations forty two nephews whom fortune seemed to bewitch rising in life like rockets nieces whose dowries knew no hitch aunts as certain of dying rich as candles in golden sockets cousins german and cousins sons all thriving and opulent some had tons of kentish hops in their pockets forty three for money had stuck to the race through life as it did to the bushel when cash so rife posed ali baba's brother's wife and down to the cousins and coslings the fortunate brood of the kilmanseggs as if they had come out of golden eggs were all as wealthy as goslings forty four it would fill a court gazette to name what east and west end people came to the right of christianity the lofty lord and the titled dame all diamonds plumes and urbanity his lordship the mayor with his golden chain and two gold sticks and the sheriff's twain nine foreign counts and other great men with their orders and stars to help m or n to renounce all pomp and vanity forty five to paint the maternal kilmanseg the pen of an eastern poet would beg and need an elaborate sonnet 
how she sparkled with gems whenever she stirred and her head niddled noddled at every word and seemed so happy a paradise bird had nidificated upon it forty six and sir jacob the father strutted and bowed and smiled to himself and laughed aloud to think of his heiress and daughter and then in his pockets he made a grope and then in the fullness of joy and hope seemed washing his hands with invisible soap in imperceptible water forty seven he had rolled in money like pigs in mud till it seemed to have entered into his blood by some occult projection and his cheeks instead of a healthy hue as yellow as any guinea grew making the common phrase seem true about a rich complexion forty eight and now came the nurse and during a pause her dead leaf satin would fitly cause a very autumnal rustle so full of figure so full of fuss as she carried about the babe to bus she seemed to be nothing but bustle forty nine a wealthy nabob was godpapa and an indian begum was godmamma whose jewels a queen might covet and the priest was a vicar and dean withal of that temple we see with a golden ball and a golden cross above it fifty the font was a bowl of american gold won by raleigh in days of old in spite of spanish bravado and the book of prayer was so overrun with gilt devices it shone in the sun like a copy a presentation one of humboldt's el dorada fifty one gold and gold and nothing but gold the same auriferous shine behold wherever the eye could settle on the walls the sideboard the ceiling sky on the gorgeous footmen standing by in coats to delight a miner's eye with seams of the precious metal fifty two gold and gold and besides the gold the very robe of the infant told a tale of wealth in every fold it lapped her like a vapour so fine so thin the mind at a loss could compare it to nothing except a cross of cobweb with banknote paper fifty three then her pearls twas a perfect sight forsooth to see them like the dew of her youth in such a plentiful sprinkle meanwhile the vicar read through the form and gave her another not over warm that made her little eyes twinkle fifty four then the babe was crossed and blessed amain but instead of the kate or anne or jane which the humbler female endorses instead of one name as some people prefix kilmanseg went at the tails of six like a carriage of state with its horses fifty five oh then the kisses she got and hugs the golden mugs and the golden jugs that lent fresh rays to the midges the golden knives and the golden spoons the gems that sparkled like fairy boons it was one of the kilmanseg's own saloons but looked like rundle and bridges fifty six gold and gold the new and the old the company ate and drank from gold they revelled they sang and were merry and one of the gold sticks rose from his chair and toasted the lass with the golden hair in a bumper of golden sherry fifty seven gold still gold it rained on the nurse who unlike danae was none the worse there was nothing but guineas glistening fifty were given to dr james for calling the little baby names and for saying amen the clerk had ten and that was the end of the christening end of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain miss kilmanseg and her precious leg a golden legend two by thomas hood her childhood fifty eight our youth our childhood that spring of springs tis surely one of the blessedest things that nature ever intended when the rich are wealthy beyond their wealth and the poor are rich in spirits and health and all with their lots contented fifty nine there's little felim he sings like a thrush in the self-same pair of patchwork plush with the self-same empty pockets that tempted his daddy so often to cut his throat or jump in the water butt but what cares felim an empty nut would sooner bring tears to their sockets sixty give him a collar without a skirt that's the irish linen for shirt and a slice of bread with a taste of dirt that's poverty's irish butter 
and what does he lack to make him blessed some oyster shells or a sparrow's nest a candle end and a gutter sixty one but to leave the happy felim alone gnawing perchance a marrowless bone for which no dog would quarrel turn we to little miss kilmansegg cutting her first little toothy peg with a fifty guinea coral a peg upon which about poor and rich reflection might hang a moral sixty two born in wealth and wealthily nursed capped papped napped and lapped from the first on the knees of prodigality her childhood was one eternal round of the game of going on tickler's ground picking up gold in reality sixty three with extempore carts she never played or the odds and ends of a tinker's trade or little dirt pies and puddings made like children happy and squalid the very puppet she had to pet like a bait for the nix my dolly set was a dolly of gold and solid sixty four gold and gold twas the burden still to gain the heiress's early good will there was much corruption and bribery the yearly cost of her golden toys would have given half london's charity boys and charity girls the annual joys of a holiday dinner at highbury sixty five bonbons she ate from the gilt cornet and gilded queens on st bartlemy's day till her fancy was tinged by her presence and first a goldfinch excited her wish then a spherical bowl with its golden fish and then two golden pheasants sixty six nay once she squalled and screamed like wild and it shows how the bias we give to a child is a thing most weighty and solemn but whence was wonder or blame to spring if little miss k after such a swing made a dust for the flaming gilded thing on the top of the fish street column her education sixty seven according to metaphysical creed to the earliest books that children read for much good or much bad they are debtors but before with their a b c they start there are things in morals as well as art that play a very important part impressions before the letters sixty eight dame education begins the pile mayhap in the graceful corinthian style but alas for the elevation if the lady's maid or gossip the nurse with a load of rubbish or something worse have made a rotten foundation sixty nine even thus with little miss kilmansegg before she learned her e for egg ere her governess came or her masters teachers of quite a different kind had crammed her beforehand and put her mind in a go-cart on golden casters seventy long before her a b and c they had taught her by heart her l s d and as how she was born a great heiress and as sure as london is built of bricks my lord would ask her the day to fix to ride in a fine gilt coach and six like her worship the lady mayoress seventy one instead of stories from edgeworth's page the true golden law for our golden age or lessons from barbold and trimmer teaching the worth of virtue and health all that she knew was the virtue of wealth provided by vulgar nursery stealth with a book of leaf gold for a primer seventy two the very metal of merit they told and praised her for being as good as gold till she grew as a peacock haughty of money they talked the whole day round and weighed dessert like grapes by the pound till she had an idea from the very sound that people with naught were naughty seventy three they praised poor children with nothing at all lord how you twaddle and waddle and squall like common bred geese and ganders what sad little bad little figures you make to the rich miss k whose plainest seed cake was stuffed with corianders seventy four they praised her falls as well as her walk flatterers made cream cheese of chalk they praised how they praised her very small talk as if it fell from the solon or the girl who at each pretty phrase let drop a ruby comma or pearl full stop or an emerald semicolon seventy five they praised her spirit and now and then the nurse brought her own little nevy ben to play with the future mayoress 
and when he got raps and taps and slaps scratches and pinches snips and snaps as if from a tigress or bearess they told him how lords would court that hand and always gave him to understand while he rubbed poor soul his carroty pole that his hair had been pulled by a hairess seventy six such were the lessons from maid and nurse a governess helped to make still worse giving an appetite so perverse fresh diet whereon to batten beginning with a b c to hold like a royal playbill printed in gold on a square of pearl white satin seventy seven the books to teach the verbs and nouns and those about countries cities and towns instead of their sober drabs and browns were in crimson silk with gilt edges her butler and enfield and entick in short her early lessons of every sort looked like souvenirs keepsakes and pledges seventy eight old johnson shone out in as fine array as he did one night when he went to the play chambaud like a bow of king charles's day lindley murray in like conditions each weary unwelcome irksome task appeared in a fancy dress and a mask if you wish for similar copies ask for howell and james's editions seventy nine novels she read to amuse her mind but always the affluent matchmaking kind that ends with promessi sposi and a father-in-law so wealthy and grand he could give checkmate to coots in the strand so along with a ring and posy he endows the bride with golconda off-hand and gives the groom potosi eighty plays she perused but she liked the best those comedy gentlefolks always possessed of fortunes so truly romantic of money so ready that right or wrong it always is ready to go for a song throwing it going it pitching it strong they ought to have purses as green and long as the cucumber called the gigantic eighty one then eastern tales she loved for the sake of the purse of oriental make and the thousand pieces they put in it but pastoral scenes on her heart fell cold for nature with her had lost its hold no field but the field of the cloth of gold would ever have caught her foot in it eighty two what more she learnt to sing and dance to sit on a horse although he should prance and to speak a french not spoken in france any more than at babel's building and she painted shells and flowers and turks but her great delight was in fancy works that are done with gold or gilding eighty three gold still gold the bright and the dead with golden beads and gold lace and gold thread she worked in gold as if for her bread the metal had so undermined her gold ran in her thoughts and filled her brain she was golden-headed as peter's cane with which he walked behind her end of section seventy three this recording is in the public domain Miss Kilmanseg and Her Precious Leg A Golden Legend Three by Thomas Hood Her Accident eighty four The horse that carried Miss Kilmanseg and a better nether lifted leg was a very rich bay called Banker, a horse of a breed and a metal so rare by bullion out of an ingot mare that for action the best of figures and air it made many good judges hanker. 85. And when she took a ride in the park, equestrian lord or pedestrian clerk was thrown in an amorous fever to see the heiress how well she sat with her groom behind her, Bob or Nat, in green, half smothered with gold, and a hat with more gold lace than beaver. 86. And then when Banker obtained a pat to see how he arched his neck at that, he snorted with pride and pleasure like the steed in the fable so lofty and grand who gave the poor ass to understand that he didn't carry a bag of sand but a burden of golden treasure eighty seven a load of treasure alas alas had her horse been fed upon english grass and sheltered in yorkshire spinneys had he scoured the sand with the desert ass or where the american whinnies but a hunter from Erin's turf and gorse, a regular thoroughbred Irish horse, why, he ran away, as a matter of course, with a girl worth her weight in guineas. 88. 
mayhap tis the trick of such pampered nags to shy at the sight of a beggar in rags but away like the bolt of a rabbit away went the horse in the madness of fright and away went the horsewoman mocking the sight was yonder blue flash a flash of blue light or only the skirt of her habit eighty nine away she flies with the groom behind it looks like a race of the kalmuck kind when hymen himself is the starter and the maid rides first in the four-footed strife riding striding as if for her life while the lover rides after to catch him a wife although it's catching a tartar ninety but the groom has lost his glittering hat though he does not sigh and pull up for that alas his horse is a tit for tat to sell to a very low bidder his wind is ruined his shoulder is sprung things though a horse be handsome and young a purchaser will consider ninety one but still flies the heiress through stones and dust oh for a fall if she must on the gentle lap of flora but still thank heaven she clings to her seat away away she could ride a dead heat with the dead who ride so fast and fleet in the ballad of leonora ninety two away she gallops it's awful work it's faster than turpin's ride to york on bess that notable clipper she has circled the ring she crosses the park mazeppa although he was stripped so stark mazeppa couldn't outstrip her ninety three the fields seem running away with the folks the elms are having a race for the oaks at a pace that all jockeys disparages all all is racing the serpentine seems rushing past like the arrowy rhine the houses have got on a railway line and are off like the first-class carriages ninety four she'll lose her life she is losing her breath a cruel chase she is chasing death as female shriekings forewarn her and now as gratis as blood of guelph she clears that gate which has cleared itself since then at hyde park corner ninety five alas for the hope of the kilmanseggs for her head her brains her body and legs her life's not worth a copper willy-nilly in piccadilly a hundred hearts turn sick and chilly a hundred voices cry stop her and one old gentleman stares and stands shakes his head and lifts his hands and says how very improper ninety six on and on what a perilous run the iron rails seem all mingling in one to shut out the green park scenery and now the cellar its dangers reveals she shudders she shrieks she's doomed she feels to be torn by powers of horses and wheels like a spinner by steam machinery ninety seven sick with horror she shuts her eyes but the very stones seem uttering cries as they did to that persian daughter when she climbed up the steep vociferous hill her little silver flagon to fill with the magical golden water ninety eight batter her shatter her throw and scatter her shouts each stony-hearted chatterer dash at the heavy dover spill her kill her tear and tatter her smash her crash her the stones didn't flatter her kick her brains out let her blood spatter her roll on her over and over ninety nine for so she gathered the awful sense of the street in its past unmacadamized tense as the wild horse overran it his four heels making the clatter of six like a devil's tattoo played with iron sticks on a kettle drum of granite a hundred on still on she's dazzled with hints of oranges ribbons and colored prints a kaleidoscope jumble of shapes and tints and human faces all flashing bright and brief as the sparks from the flints that the desperate hoof keeps dashing a hundred and one on and on still frightfully fast dover street bond street all are past but yes no yes they're down at last the furies and fates have found them down they go with sparkle and crash like a bark that's struck by the lightning flash there's a shriek and a sob and the dense dark mob like a billow closes around them a hundred and two she breathes she don't she'll recover she won't she's stirring she's living by nemesis gold still gold on counter and shelf golden dishes as plenty as delf 
miss kilmanseg's coming again to herself on an opulent goldsmith's premises a hundred and three gold fine gold both yellow and red beaten and molten polished and dead to see the gold with profusion spread in all forms of its manufacture but what avails gold to miss kilmanseg when the femoral bone of her dexter leg has met with a compound fracture a hundred and four gold may soothe adversity's smart nay help to bind up a broken heart but to try it on any other part were as certain a disappointment as if one should rub the dish and plate taken out of a staffordshire crate in the hope of a golden service of state with singleton's golden ointment hundred and five as the twig is bent the trees inclined is an adage often recalled to mind referring to juvenile bias and never so well is the verity seen as when to the weak warped side we lean when life's tempests and hurricanes try us a hundred and six even thus with miss k and her broken limb by a very very remarkable whim she showed her early tuition while the buds of character came into blow with a certain tinge that served to show the nursery culture long ago as the graft is known by fruition 107 for the king's physician who nursed the case his verdict gave with an awful face and three others concurred to egg it that the patient to give old death the slip like the pope instead of a personal trip must send her leg as a legate 108 the limb was doomed it couldn't be saved and like other people the patient behaved nay bravely that cruel parting braved which makes some persons so falter they rather would part without a groan with the flesh of their flesh and bone of their bone they obtained at st george's altar a hundred and nine but when it came to fitting the stump with the proxy limb then flatly and plump she spoke in the spirit olden she couldn't she shouldn't she wouldn't have wood nor a leg of cork if she never stood and she swore an oath or something as good the proxy limb should be golden 110 a wooden leg what a sort of peg for your common jockeys and jennies no no her mother might worry and plague weep go down on her knees and beg but nothing would move miss kilmanseg she could she would have a golden leg if it cost ten thousand guineas a hundred and eleven would indeed in forest or park with its sylvan honours and feudal bark is an aristocratic article but split and sawn and hacked about town serving all needs of pauper or clown trod on staggered on would cut down is vulgar fibre and particle a hundred and twelve and cork when the noble cork tree shades a lovely group of castilian maids tis a thing for a song or sonnet but cork as it stops the bottle of gin or bungs the beer the small beer in it pierced her heart like a corking pin to think of standing upon it a hundred and thirteen a leg of gold solid gold throughout nothing else whether slim or stout should ever support her god willing she must she could she would have her whim her father she turned a deaf ear to him he might kill her she didn't mind killing he was welcome to cut off her other limb he might cut her all off with a shilling 114 all other promised gifts were in vain golden girdle or golden chain she writhed with impatience more than pain and uttered pshaws and pishes but a leg of gold as she lay in bed it danced before her it ran in her head it jumped with her dearest wishes a hundred and fifteen gold 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 oh let it be gold a sleeper awake that tale she told and when she grew delirious till her parents resolved to grant her wish if they melted down plate and goblet and dish the case was getting so serious a hundred and sixteen so a leg was made in a comely mould of gold fine virgin glittering gold as solid as man could make it solid in foot and calf and shank a prodigious sum of money it sank in fact twas a branch of the family bank and no easy matter to break it 
117. All sterling metal, not half and half, the goldsmith's mark was stamped on the calf, t'was pure as from Mexican barter. And to make it more costly, just over the knee, where another ligature used to be, was a circle of jewels, worth shillings to see, a new fangled badge of the garter. 118. Twas a splendid, brilliant, beautiful leg, fit for the court of Scanderbeg, that precious leg of Miss Kilmanseg. For thanks to parental bounty, secure from mortification's touch, she stood on a member that cost as much as a member for all the county. Her fame. 119. To gratify stern ambition's whims, what hundreds and thousands of precious limbs on a field of battle we scatter. Severed by sword or bullet or saw, off they go, all bleeding and raw. But the public seems to get the lock jaw, so little is said on the matter. 120. Legs, the tightest that ever were seen, the tightest, the lightest that danced on the green, cutting capers to sweet kitty clover. Shattered, scattered, cut and bowled down, off they go, worse off for renown, a line in the times or a talk about town, than the leg that a fly runs over. 121. But the precious leg of Miss Kilmanseg, that gowden, goulden, golden leg, was the theme of all conversation. Had it been a pillar of church and state, or a prop to support the whole dead weight, it could not have furnished more debate to the heads and tails of the nation. 122. East and west, and north and south, though useless for either hunger or drought, the leg was in everybody's mouth, to use a poetical figure. Rumour, in taking her ravenous swim, saw and seized on the tempting limb, like a shark on the leg of a nigger. 123. Willful murder fell very dead. Debates in the house were hardly read. In vain the police reports were fed with Irish riots and rumpuses. The leg, the leg, was the great event. Through every circle in life it went, like the leg of a pair of compasses. 124. The last new novel seemed tame and flat. The leg, a novelty newer than that, had tripped up the heels of fiction. It burked the very essays of Burke, and alas, how wealth over wit plays the Turk, as a regular piece of goldsmith's work got the better of goldsmith's diction. 125. A leg of gold, what, of solid gold, cried rich and poor, and young and old, and master and miss and madam was the talk of change the alley the bank and with men of scientific rank it made as much stir as the fossil shank of a lizard coeval with adam 126 of course with greenwich and chelsea elves men who had lost a limb themselves its interest did not dwindle but bill and ben and jack and tom could hardly have spun more yarns therefrom if the leg had been a spindle 127 Meanwhile, the story went to and fro, till gathering like the ball of snow, by the time it got to stratford le Beau, through exaggeration's touches, the heiress and hope of the Kilmanseggs was propped on two fine golden legs, and a pair of golden crutches. 128. Never had leg so great a run, t'was the go and the kick thrown into one, the mode, the new thing under the sun, the rage, the fancy, the passion bonnets were named and hats were worn a la golden leg instead of leghorn and stockings and shoes of golden hues took the lead in the walks of fashion 129 the golden leg had a vast career it was sung and danced and to show how near low folly to lofty approaches down to society's very dregs the bells of wapping wore kilmanseggs and St. Giles's bows sported golden legs in their pinchbeck pins and brooches. End of section 74 This recording is in the public domain. Miss Kilmanseg and her precious leg, a golden legend. 4. By Thomas Hood her first step 
130. Supposing the trunk and limbs of man shared on the allegorical plan by the passions that mark humanity, whichever might claim the head or heart, the stomach or any other part, the legs would be seized by vanity. 131. There's Bardus, a six-foot column of fop, a lighthouse without any light atop, whose height would attract beholders, if he had not lost some inches clear by looking down at his cosimere, ogling the limbs he holds so dear, till he got a stoop in his shoulders. 132. Talk of art, of science, or books, and down go the everlasting looks to his rural beauties so wedded try him wherever you will you find his mind in his legs and his legs in his mind all prongs and folly in short a kind of fork that is fiddle-headed 133 what wonder then if miss kilmanseg with a splendid brilliant beautiful leg fit for the court of scanderbeg disdained to hide it like joan or meg in petticoats stuffed or quilted not she it was her convalescent whim to dazzle the world with her precious limb nay to go a little high kilted hundred and thirty four so cards were sent for that sort of mob where tartars and africans hob and knob and the cherokee talks of his cab and cob to polish or lapland lovers cards like that hieroglyphical call to a geographical fancy ball on the recent post office covers 135. For if lion hunters, and great ones too, would mob a savage from Latakou, or squeeze for a glimpse of Prince Lebou, that unfortunate sandwich scion, hundreds of first rate people, no doubt, would gladly, madly rush to a rout that promised a golden lion. Her fancy ball. 136. Of all the spirits of evil fame that hurt the soul or injure the frame and poison what's honest and hearty, there's none more needs a Matthew to preach a cooling anti-phlogistic speech to praise and enforce a temperate course than the evil spirit of party. 137. Go to the House of Commons or Lords, and they seem to be busy with simple words in their popular sense or pedantic but alas with their cheers and sneers and jeers they're really busy whatever appears putting peas in each other's ears to drive their enemies frantic hundred and thirty eight thus tories like to worry the whigs who treat them in turn like schwalbach pigs giving them lashes thrashes and digs with their writhing and pain delighted but after all that's said and more the malice and spite of party are poor to the malice and spite of a party next door to a party not invited hundred and thirty nine on with the cap and out with the light weariness bids the world good night at least for the usual season but hark a clatter of horses heels and sleep and silence are broken on wheels like wilful murder and treason hundred and forty Another crash, and the carriage goes. Again poor weariness seeks the repose that nature demands imperious. But Echo takes up the burden now, with a rattling chorus of row de dow dow till silence herself seems making a row, like a Quaker gone delirious. 141. Tis night, a winter night, and the stars are shining like Winken venus and mars are rolling along in their golden cars through the sky's serene expansion but vainly the stars dispense their rays venus and mars are lost in the blaze of the kilmanseg's luminous mansion 142 up jumps fear in a terrible fright his bedchamber windows look so bright with light all the square is glutted up he jumps like a soul from the pan and a tremor sickens his inward man for he feels as only a gentleman can who thinks he's being gutted forty three again fear settles all snug and warm but only to dream of a dreadful storm from autumn's sulphurous locker but the only electrical body that falls wears a negative coat and positive smalls and draws the peel that so appalls from the kilmanseg's brazen knocker hundred and forty four Tis curiosity's benefit night, and perchance tis the English second sight, but whatever it be, so be it. 
as the friends and guests of miss kilmanseg crowd in to look at her golden leg as many more mob round the door to see them going to see it 145 in they go in jackets and cloaks plumes and bonnets turbans and toques as if to a congress of nations greeks and malays with daggers and dirks spaniards jews chinese and turks like some original foreign works but mostly like bad translations hundred and forty six in they go and to work like a pack juan moses and shakabak tom and jerry and springheeled jack for some of low fancy are lovers skirting zigzagging casting about here and there and in and out with a crush and a rush for a full-bodied rout in one of the stiffest of covers hundred and forty seven in they went and hunted about open-mouthed like chub and trout and some with the upper lip thrust out like that fish for routing a barbell while sir jacob stood to welcome the crowd and rubbed his hands and smiled aloud and bowed and bowed and bowed and bowed like a man who is sawing marble 148 for princes were there and noble peers dukes descended from norman spears earls that dated from early years and lords in vast variety besides the gentry both new and old for people who stand on legs of gold are sure to stand well with society. 149. But where, 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 with one accord, cried Moses and Mufti, Jack and my lord, Wang Fong and Il Bondokani, when slow and heavy and dead as a dump, they heard a foot begin to stump, thump, lump, lump, thump, like the spectre in Don Giovanni. 150. And lo, the heiress Miss Kilmanseg with her splendid, brilliant, beautiful leg in the garb of a goddess olden, like chaste Diana going to hunt with a golden spear, which of course was blunt, and a tunic looped up to a gem in front to show the leg that was golden. 151. Gold, still gold, her crescent behold, that should be silver, but would be gold and her robe's auriferous spangles her golden stomacher how she would melt her golden quiver and golden belt where a golden bugle dangles hundred and fifty two and her jewelled garter oh sin oh shame let pride and vanity bear the blame that bring such blots on female fame but to be a true recorder besides its thin transparent stuff the tunic was looped quite high enough to give a glimpse of the order 153 but what have sin or shame to do with a golden leg and a stout one too away with all prudery's panics that the precious metal by thick and thin will cover square acres of land or sin is a fact made plain again and again in morals as well as mechanics 154 a few indeed of her proper sex who seemed to feel her foot on their necks and feared their charms would meet with checks from so rare and splendid a blazon a few cried fie and forward and bold and said of the leg it might be gold but to them it looked like brazen 155 twas hard they hinted for flesh and blood virtue and beauty and all that's good to strike to mere dross their top gallants but what were beauty or virtue or worth gentle manners or gentle birth nay what the most talented head on earth to a leg worth fifty talents hundred and fifty six but the men sang quite another hymn of glory and praise to the precious limb age sordid age admired the whim and its indecorum pardoned while half of the young ay more than half bowed down and worshipped the golden calf like the jews when their hearts were hardened 157 a golden leg what fancies it fired what golden wishes and hopes inspired to give but a mere abridgment what a leg to leg bale embarrassments surf what a leg for a leg to take on the turf what a leg for a marching regiment 158 a golden leg whatever love sings twas worth a bushel of plain gold rings with which the romantic wheedles 
twas worth all the legs in stockings and socks twas a leg that might be put in the stocks in b not the parish beadles 159 and lady k nid nodded her head lapped in a turban fancy bread just like a love apple huge and red some mussel womanish mystery but whatever she meant to represent she talked like the muse of history 160 she told how the filial leg was lost and then how much the gold one cost with its weight to a trojan fraction and how it took off and how it put on and called on devil duke and don mahomet moses and prester john to notice its beautiful action 161 and then of the leg she went in quest and led it where the light was best and made it lay itself up to rest in postures for painters studies it cost more tricks and trouble by half than it takes to exhibit a six-legged calf to a booth full of country cuddies 162 nor yet did the heiress herself omit the arts that help to make a hit and preserve a prominent station she talked and laughed far more than her share and took a part in rich and rare were the gems she wore and the gems were there like a song with an illustration 163 she even stood up with the count of france to dance alas the measures we dance when vanity plays the piper vanity vanity apt to betray and lead all sorts of legs astray wood or metal or human clay since satan first played the viper 164 but first she doffed her hunting gear and favoured tom tug with her golden spear to row with down the river a bonds had her golden bow to hold a hermit her belt and bugle of gold and an abbot her golden quiver 165 and then a space was cleared on the floor and she walked the minuet de la cour with all the pomp of a pompadour but although she began andante conceive the faces of all the rout when she finished off with a whirligig bout and the precious legs stuck stiffly out like the leg of a figurante 156 so the courtly dance was goldenly done and golden opinions of course it won from all different sorts of people chiming ding-dong with flattering phrase in one vociferous peal of praise like the peal that rings on royal days from loyalty's parish steeple 167 and yet had the leg been one of those that danced for bread in flesh-coloured hose with rosina's pastor a bevy the jeers it had met the shouts the scoff the cutting advice to take itself off for sounding but half so heavy 168 had it been a leg like those perchance that teach little girls and boys to dance to set pousset recede and advance with the steps and figures most proper had it hopped for a weekly or quarterly sum how little of praise or grist would have come to a mill with such a hopper 169 but the leg was none of those limbs forlorn bartering capers and hops for corn that meet with public hisses and scorn or the morning journal denounces had it pleased to caper from morning till dusk there was all the music of money musk in its ponderous bangs and bounces 170 but hark as slow as the strokes of a pump lump thump thump lump as the giant of castle otranto might stump to a lower room from an upper down she goes with a noisy dint for taking the crimson turban's hint a noble lord at the head of the mint is leading the leg to supper 171 but the supper alas must rest untold with its blaze of light and its glitter of gold for to paint that scene of glamour it would need the great enchanter's charm who waves over palace and cot and farm an arm like the gold beater's golden arm that wields a golden hammer 172 he only he could fitly state the massive service of golden plate with the proper phrase and expansion the rare selection of foreign wines the alps of ice and mountains of pines the punch in oceans and sugary shrines the temple of taste from gunter's designs in short all that wealth with a feast combines in a splendid family mansion 173 
suffice it each masked outlandish guest ate and drank of the very best according to critical connors and then they pledged the hostess and host but the golden leg was the standing toast and as somebody swore walked off with more than its share of the hips and honours a hundred and seventy four miss kilmanseg full glasses i beg miss kilmanseg and her precious leg and away went the bottle careering wine in bumpers and shouts in peals till the clown didn't know his head from his heels the mussulman's eyes danced to some reels and the quaker was hoarse from cheering end of section seventy five this recording is in the public domain miss kelmanseg and her precious leg five by thomas hood her dream hundred and seventy five miss kelmanseg took off her leg and laid it down like a cribbage peg for the rout was done and the riot the square was hushed not a sound was heard the sky was grey and no creature stirred except one little precocious bird that chirped and then was quiet hundred and seventy six so still without so still within it had been a sin to drop a pin so intense is silence after a din it seemed like death's rehearsal to stir the air no eddy came and the taper burnt with as still a flame as to flicker had been a burning shame in a calm so universal hundred and seventy seven the time for sleep had come at last and there was the bed so soft so vast quite a field of bedfordshire clover softer cooler and calmer no doubt from the piece of work just ravelled out for one of the pleasures of having a rout is the pleasure of having it over hundred and seventy eight no sordid pallet or truckle mean of straw and rug and tatters unclean but a splendid gilded carved machine that was fit for a royal chamber on the top was a gorgeous golden wreath and the damask curtains hung beneath like clouds of crimson and amber hundred and seventy nine curtains held up by two little plump things with golden bodies and golden wings mere fins for such solidities two cupids in short of the regular sort but the housemaid calls them cupidities hundred and eighty no patchwork quilt all seams and scars but velvet powdered with golden stars a fit mantle for night commanders and the pillow as white as snow undimmed and as cool as the pool that the breeze has skimmed was cased in the finest cambric and trimmed with the costliest lace of flanders 181 and the bed of the ida's softest down twas a place to revel to smother to drown in a bliss inferred by the poet for if ignorance be indeed a bliss what blessed ignorance equals this to sleep and not to know it 182 o bed o bed delicious bed that heaven upon earth to the weary head but a place that to name would be ill-bred to the head with a wakeful trouble is held by such a different lease to one a place of comfort and peace all stuffed with the down of stubble geese to another with only the stubble 183 to one a perfect halcyon nest all calm and balm and quiet and rest and soft as the fur of the coney to another so restless for body and head that the bed seems borrowed from nettle bed and the pillow from stratford the stony hundred and eighty four to the happy a first-class carriage of ease to the land of nod or where you please but alas for the watchers and weepers who turn and turn and turn again but turn and turn and turn in vain with an anxious brain and thoughts in a train that does not run upon sleepers hundred and eighty five wide awake as the mousing owl night-hawk or other nocturnal fowl but more profitless vigils keeping wide awake in the dark they stare filling with phantoms the vacant air as if that crook-backed tyrant care had plotted to kill them sleeping hundred and eighty six and oh when the blessed diurnal light is quenched by the providential night to render our slumber more certain pity pity the wretches that weep 
for they must be wretched who cannot sleep when god himself draws the curtain 187 the careful betty the pillow beats and airs the blankets and smooths the sheets and gives the mattress a shaking but vainly betty performs her part if a ruffled head and a rumpled heart as well as the couch want making 188 there's morbid all bile and verjuice and nerves where other people would make preserves he turns his fruits into pickles jealous envious and fretful by day at night to his own sharp fancies a prey he lies like a hedgehog rolled up the wrong way tormenting himself with his prickles 189 but a child that bids the world good night in downright earnest and cuts it quite a cherub no art can copy tis a perfect picture to see him lie as if he had supped on a dormouse pie an ancient classical dish by the by with a sauce of syrup of poppy 190 oh bed 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 delicious bed that heaven upon earth to the weary head whether lofty or low its condition but instead of putting our plagues on shelves in our blankets how often we toss ourselves or are tossed by such allegorical elves as pride hate greed and ambition 191 the independent miss kilmanseg took off her independent leg and laid it beneath her pillow and then on the bed her frame she cast the time for repose had come at last but long long after the storm is past rolls the turbid turbulent billow 192 no part she had in vulgar cares that belong to common household affairs nocturnal annoyances such as theirs who lie with a shrewd surmising that while they are couchant a bitter cup their bread and butter are getting up and the coals confound them are rising 193 no fear she had her sleep to postpone like the crippled widow who weeps alone and cannot make a doze her own for the dread that may hap on the morrow the true and christian reading to balk a broker will take up her bed and walk by way of curing her sorrow 194 no cause like these she had to bewail but the breath of applause had blown a gale and winds from that quarter seldom fail to cause some human commotion but whenever such breezes coincide with the very spring tide of human pride there's no such swell on the ocean 195 peace and ease and slumber lost she turned and rolled and tumbled and tossed with a tumult that would not settle a common case indeed with such as have too little or think too much of the precious and glittering metal 196 gold she saw at her golden foot the peer whose tree had an olden root the proud the great the learned to boot the handsome the gay and the witty the man of science of arms of art the man who deals but at pleasure's mart and the man who deals in the city 197 gold still gold and true to the mould in the very scheme of her dream it told for by magical transmutation from her leg through her body it seemed to go till gold above and gold below she was gold all gold from her little gold toe to her organ of veneration 198 and still she retained through fancy's art the golden bow and the golden dart with which she had played a goddess's part in her recent glorification and still like one of the self-same brood on a plinth of the self-same metal she stood for the whole world's adoration 199 and hymns and incense around her rolled from golden harps and censers of gold for fancy in dreams is as uncontrolled as a horse without a bridle what wonder then from all checks exempt if inspired by the golden leg she dreamt she was turned to a golden idol her courtship 200 when leaving eden's happy land the grieving angel led by the hand our banished father and mother forgotten amid their awful doom the tears the fears and the future's gloom on each brow was a wreath of paradise bloom that our parents had twined for each other 201 
it was only while sitting like figures of stone for the grieving angel had skyward flown as they sat those two in the world alone with disconsolate hearts nigh cloven that scenting the gust of happier hours they looked around for the precious flowers and lo a last relic of eden's dear bowers the chaplet that love had woven 202 and still when a pair of lovers meet there's a sweetness in air unearthly sweet that savours still of that happy retreat where eve by adam was courted whilst the joyous thrush and the gentle dove wooed their mates in the bowers above and the serpent as yet only sported 203 who hath not felt that breath in the air a perfume and freshness strange and rare a warmth in the light and a bliss everywhere when young hearts yearn together all sweets below and all sunny above oh there's nothing in life like making love save making hay in fine weather 204 who hath not found amongst his flowers a blossom too bright for this world of ours like a rose among snows of sweden but to turn again to miss kilmanseg where must love have gone to beg if such a thing as a golden leg had put its foot in eden 205 and yet to tell the rigid truth her favour was sought by age and youth for the prey will find a prowler she was followed flattered courted addressed wooed and cooed and wheedled and pressed by suitors from north south east and west like that heiress in song tibi fowler 206 but alas alas for the woman's fate who has from a mob to choose a mate tis a strange and painful mystery but the more the eggs the worse the hatch the more the fish the worse the catch the more the sparks the worse the match is a fact in woman's history 207 give her between a brace to pick and mayhap with luck to help the trick she will take the faustus and leave the old nick but her future bliss to baffle amongst a score let her have a voice and she'll have as little cause to rejoice as if she had won the man of her choice in a matrimonial raffle 208 thus even thus with the heiress and hope fulfilling the adage of too much rope with so ample a competition she chose the least worthy of all the group just as the vulture makes a stoop and singles out from the herd or troop the beast of the worst condition 209 a foreign count who came in cog not under a cloud but under a fog in a calais packet's fore cabin to charm some lady british born with his eyes as black as the fruit of the thorn and his hooky nose and his beard half shorn like a half converted rabbin 210 and because the sex confess a charm in the man who has slashed a head or arm or has been a throat's undoing he was dressed like one of the glorious trade at least when glory is off parade with a stock and a frock well trimmed with braid and frogs that went a wooing 211 moreover as counts are apt to do on the left hand side of his dark surtout at one of those holes that buttons go through to be a precise recorder a ribbon he wore or rather a scrap about an inch of ribbon mayhap that one of his rivals a whimsical chap described as his retail order 212 and then and much it helped his chance he could sing and play first fiddle and dance perform charades and proverbs of france act the tender and do the cruel for amongst his other killing parts he had broken a brace of female hearts and murdered three men in duel 213 savage at heart and false of tongue subtle with age and smooth to the young like a snake in his coiling and curling such was the count to give him a niche who came to court that heiress rich and knelt at her foot one needn't say which besieging her castle of sterling 214 with prayers and vows he opened his trench and plied her with english spanish and french in phrases the most sentimental and quoted poems in high and low dutch with now and then an italian touch till she yielded without resisting much to homage so continental 215 
and then the sordid bargain to close with a miniature sketch of his hooky nose and his dear dark eyes as black as sloes and his beard and whiskers as black as those the lady's consent he requited and instead of the lock that lovers beg the count received from miss kilmanseg a model in small of her precious leg and so the couple were plighted 216 but oh the love that gold must crown better better the love of the clown who admires his lass in her sunday gown as if all the fairies had dressed her whose brain to no crooked thought gives birth except that he never will part on earth with his true love's crooked tester 217 alas for the love that's linked with gold better better a thousand times told more honest happy and laudable the downright loving of pretty sis who wipes her lips though there's nothing amiss and takes a kiss and gives a kiss in which her heart is audible 218 pretty sis so smiling and bright who loves as she labours with all her might and without any sordid leaven who blushes as red as whores and hips down to her very fingertips for roger's blue ribbons to her like strips cut out of the azure of heaven End of section 76. This recording is in the public domain.